everyone. Um, welcome to the Charlotte City Council September 8th meeting. Um, this is the meeting where we um, have that we designate for us to hear from the staff and each other ideas, concepts, suggestions, um, and actions that we should be taking. So um, we generally would have this meeting um, with our council committee report outs. But because of the pandemic, we have other things that we are going to um, discuss tonight. And primarily, those are going to be um, a, um, a continued report from the city manager on the COVID's response and recovery update. We're also going to hear some information from the staff around some of the work that we're doing on violence pre prevention. In addition to that, we're going to have a guest um, come in and talk to us about violence interruption and the information that we need to have to continue to look at the ways that we can perhaps use alternative methods to address violence going on in our neighborhoods. Um, we're going to hear about um, our, our bus lane pilot program um, as well as we're going to talk about the three corridors that we have in the city. Um, that we call Opportunity Corridors, Beatty's Ford Road, West Boulevard, and Sugar Creek North Tryon. Um, so in addition to the council committees, we will have a closed session at the end of this meeting. So just be ready for that as, um, as the staff. So with that, um, I'm going to ask the manager, I'm gonna turn this over to the manager and he will lead us in our first discussion around COVID response and recovery. So thank you, Mayor and members of council. It's good to be back with you again. So tonight we'll start off with our COVID-19 response and recovery update. And based on input that I've received from the mayor and council members, we're going to divide this up into three uh, phases. Uh, the first one, we'll have uh, Chief Graham and his staff to speak a bit about being in phase 2.5 and what does that mean? There have been some questions about enforcement, and we have um, Chief Estes here tonight to, to talk about that. And then, as a follow-up from the last time that we were together, we have uh, Sean Heath, who is going to talk a bit about how we have allocated the uh, CARES funds, as well as how some of these funds interact with other funds that are from the county and the, the foundation for the Carolinas. Sean started with us in uh, July, and he's been our go-to person for anything that's dealing with uh, CARES. So I appreciate all the work that uh, Kelly has been doing, as well as Ryan. It's uh, good to have somebody on staff that that's their, their top job. And that's everything from how do we bring our employees back, all of our employees back to a, a safe environment all the way to how do we make sure that we have um, accurately and adequately spent the $154.5 million that was allocated to the city. Just a little bit about Sean. Uh, he spent 20 years with Duke Energy. And at that, during that time, he's had leadership roles such as the Chief of Staff, the Chief Sustainability Officer, and the President of the Duke Energy Foundation. He started his career at Arthur Anderson as a financial auditor, and he's been involved in our community he also serves on the Charlotte Mecklenburg Community Foundation and Child Care Resources. Uh, he's graduated from uh, Virginia Tech, and I will tell you uh, that he is the first person that I've met that's worked with me who was born in Alaska. So we have ex expand, <laughs> expanded our, our, our reach. And he has done a great job of recruiting because he has bought, brought both of his parents and his in-laws moved to the Charlotte region. So we're thrilled to have uh, Sean, who will end the uh, presentation today. But I'd like to start it off with uh, Chief Graham. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, First and foremost, it's wonderful to see everybody together because I know we've gone through months of having to do Zoom calls and everything else. Uh, we'll talk about tonight, we're going to talk about where we are. So the governor and the governor's office created a phase 2.5 because we're not quite ready to go to phase three. 
uh, but they wanted to get us off of two and uh, move us into something that was a little bit easier for everybody to begin getting back to society and, and how things were supposed to be. So uh, tonight we're talking about coronavirus and recommendation. I guess Mr. Jones's, we'll go back. So Governor Cooper did move us 2.5 effective on September 4th uh, to October 2nd currently at 5 p.m. And as everybody has heard by now, uh, they're constantly looking at the data, as are we in Mecklenburg County. And uh, if we can move to uh, phase three, they will certainly do that. Major changes in phase 2.5 are gyms can operate now at 30% capacity. Uh, museums can operate at 50% capacity. Playgrounds are now open. Increase, uh, increases indoor capacity from 10 to 25 people and outdoor capacity from 25 to 50. Uh, churches are exempt from this, so churches are exempt. What remains in 2.5 restaurants can operate at 50% capacity and bars remain closed. Where are we today? And so this was as of this morning and, and every time we have a weekend, the data is not great, right? So we're not getting great numbers on our returns. Of course, people are taking time off and that's a national trend. So I never really look at Saturday, Sunday, or sometimes even Monday, but we look at Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and really Tuesday afternoon, the data starts to come in. So for us, because yesterday was a holiday, we'll really look at tomorrow through Friday to see where we are. But as of today, or as of this morning, we had 26,526 cases in Mecklenburg County. And we'll go through the data in just a second, the, the graphs from the state. But we also, unfortunately, have 322 deaths. So we continue to see deaths from uh, COVID-19 in our community, and we do not know when this will end. And so the, the troubling part is, and if you haven't seen in the news, we are highly concerned about when COVID-19 intersects with the cold and flu season. So what happens when those two collide? Congregate care sites remain a concern. We were working on two of them this morning. There remain 34 congregate living sites, where they changed the name to congregate living sites, that are in outbreak status. Outbreak status is defined as two or more cases in that site. We have a very good task force of emergency management, county public health, and medic that visits these outbreak sites and works through their problems and concerns with staffing and PPE, and they're doing that every day out in our community. So we're very proud of that initiative. This is the uh, daily percent positive laboratory COVID-19 tests in North Carolina or in Mecklenburg County. And as you can see, we've dropped down to 5.7%. That is a good trend. That is what we like to see in, in Mecklenburg County. And that's from a high of all the way up back in July 10th of 13.5. We are still testing as many people as we can in our community but remember, unless, unless people willingly come to be tested, we, we can't inflate those numbers. So we can't just grab people off the street and test them. But we're testing everybody that we can, and we have an adequate number of tests out in the community. Gibby Harris and, of course, the entire emergency management team, the entire team working on this, have done a great job, but also the state and our federal partners have done a great job of ensuring we have tests available here in Mecklenburg County. Medical trends. So the daily COVID-19 cases reported by Mecklenburg County Public Health by date have actually gone down. So we're down to 124 from a high of 419. Now this, this will vary daily. And of course we are keeping an eye on that, but the trend overall is getting better for Mecklenburg County. <clears throat> Our daily hospital census of patients with laboratory confirmed COVID-19 this is an important one because last week we were up to 160 cases in our hospitals. So remember what I said, when the two collide, colds and flus and COVID-19. So we have 160 folks in our hospitals currently with COVID-19, but then we will start to add patients with the flu. And so that is where the concern lies. As of just a couple minutes ago, we were down to 129 cases currently in the hospital. Local compliance, and so this is an important slide for everybody to understand. There have been two times when Mecklenburg County did something over and above what the state was requesting. One was the stay at home order, and the second one was the uh, alcohol uh, exemption and the bar, uh, the bar restrictions. Currently, we have reverted back 
to the state's mandate. So there are no unique restrictions in Mecklenburg County that are only, only, are only for us. We are currently parallel with the state of North Carolina. So the existing joint proclamation from all eight governments, and that's the six towns, the city of Charlotte and the county, expired, written, written to be in effect concurrently with phase two. So when we went to 2.5, we fell out of that. The community must comply with the governor's order and no further action is required by the mayor or the council at this time. All right, and I will now turn it over to my good friend, Deputy Chief Jeff Estes. Thanks, Why? It's good to be here this evening. We uh, just a couple of things here that uh, I'd like to discuss uh, surrounding the enforcement of COVID. I think we all recognize and realize that under the governor's order, um, state, uh, but moreover, um, local law enforcement is uh, the responsible entity with the enforcement of the COVID mandates. Without going into the details uh, of it, I think we have our. our our balance has been to try to understand that this is a, uh, a public health pandemic. Um, this is not a criminal law type uh, of ordinance that we're uh, enforcing, though it is backed up uh, by statutes to, to the, which could be such under under the law uh, as a as a misdemeanor. Uh, so we have tried very hard to make sure that we um, enforced it based on an education model first as best we could. Uh, anything more than that, we, uh, we try to um, select the outliers, the f folks who we believe were intentionally uh, misusing or, or um, not complying with the order. Uh, so just for your awareness, some of the, some of the factors um, that we've had to, to contend with is that we've had, had to balance our COVID uh, since March, our COVID enforcement. Uh, with uh, uh, you're all aware of the violent crime rate that we've seen and trying to keep a lid on that, keeping our community safe and work with our community partners to make sure that people are as safe as, as they possibly can be. Um, we have had uh, some civil unrest here. Uh, we've had a few conversations about it ourselves in this very room. And I think you can understand the, the draw from the uh, officer perspective uh, as part of this, um, uh, our responsibilities. And then last, carrying on the regular day-to-day -day operations we have with our, our investigations and our public safety role and the whole gamut of all our responsibilities with that. Uh, just to say that uh, we've been fairly busy. Uh, we have not let this uh, fall by the wayside. Um, we have uh, some folks that now, since the alcohol prohibitions came into effect, that we have been able to put specifically towards this uh, effort. Um, phase 2.5 clarified a few things for us. Um, the first is, is that uh, we believe it clarified what an actual restaurant was versus an eating establishment versus a lunch stand versus a, we had all types of uh, confusion regarding who served food and who could open prior to 11. It also outlined the uh, ABC Commission's role, which governor gave wide latitude and authority for the ABC Commission to respond to uh, complaints uh, and to, to um, modify alcohol uh, regulations accordingly to meet the spirit of the order. Um, the good news is, is that the, the cleanest part of the whole uh, alcohol prohibition is at 11 o'clock, uh, there is no more on-site consumption for alcohol. And that's, uh, that's widely, has been widely adhered to. Now, I will say that there are a lot of enterprising folks out there, and we have seen once the 11 o'clock um, order took place, we've seen a lot of uh, old school liquor houses popping up uh, that we've shut down. And then a lot of these, I don't know if you saw, there's a, uh, some Airbnb issues and some other places that have popped up where some violence and alcohol sales are, are associated. We Just this week, we shut down five such large gatherings and, um, and liquor houses who were operating um, without regulations. Some of them we were able just to get off of uh, just open social media where the people are just advertising. Anybody that wants to come can come. Uh, so I'm not sure um, the wisdom of those folks, but we, we came uh, and shut them down. So um, this is where we are. We stand currently where we are um, looking forward to, I'll say phase three in the next part of the, uh, of the COVID enforcement. Um, the last part I'll say is we've had very good um, 
um, cooperation between our other law enforcement partners in the county and also from the, uh, the ABC uh, local folks and the ALE from the state's office uh, for the alcohol sales uh, prohibition. And I think of Sean, I think. Sean, yes. Welcome, Sean. We, I, I was thinking we'd just come back and ask all at the end. Is that okay? Let's get through everything. Maybe Sean will answer your question. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sean Heath. Thank you, Manager Jones, for that generous introduction that I heard as I was walking in. Appreciate that. So next slide, please. We could advance one more. Oh, thanks, another. You want to advance? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. So this slide should look familiar to everyone. You've seen this at a few council meetings. But just as a bit of a reminder, this is a big picture snapshot of the CARES funding that's come to the city of Charlotte over the past few months. And the CARES funding, of course, has many funding branches. And each of those branches has a different rule book in terms of eligible expenditures and also the time frame when those expenditures are reported. Tonight, our focus will be on the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is the blue pie chart, which we've talked a little bit about over the past few months. Most of the focus tonight will be on the community support wedge. But before we leave this slide, I did want to reinforce uh, a particular point from the August 10th Council meeting that Manager Jones and Budget Director Bergman made, which is as it relates to the city operations component of the city's CRF, there's a particular emphasis on employee safety and productivity. So a major subcomponent in this area relates to facility upgrades, uh, HVAC enhancements, which will enhance air quality, various touchless devices, which will all else equal, reduce the risk of infection in the workplace, and then also a fair amount of work related to upfitting the workspaces themselves to enable social distancing. So that's a particular point of emphasis. That work is up and running uh, under general services leadership. A second area in this particular category is IT. So you can imagine the new normal in terms of teleworking. There's a lot of work in the IT area to position the city to really prosper in a teleworking environment going forward. As of a few weeks ago, I believe we had roughly 2,000 employees that are still in a remote work environment. Now eventually we'll start to migrate back to normal, uh, but it'll be a new normal. So we'll have the IT infrastructure in place to support that type of a work environment. So we were curious about what other cities are doing. And if you think about the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which the federal government put in place, that was, of course, $150 billion of relief that was spread across states and local governments in the U.S. So the U.S. Treasury Department requested that all receiving entities provide some accounting for how money had been spent through June, June 30th. And I would underscore June 30th, and, and the big caveat here, of course, is that that was very, very early in the program with the CARES Act passing in late March. Charlotte and all of our peer cities, of course, uh, were hard at work in April and, and into May, standing up programs. So you only really get a very early glimpse of what cities are doing when you're looking at the data through the end of June 30th. But nevertheless, the data was available. We wanted to have a sense for what others were up to. We looked at 14 peer cities in particular, it's the standard list of 14 that we often review in, in any sort of benchmarking analysis, just to give you a flavor. Atlanta, Memphis, Fort Worth, San Diego, Seattle would be some examples of entities in that, in that peer group. And a few, I guess the punchline here really is the questions we were asking ourselves were, what types of things are other cities positioning themselves to spend money on, one? And how does our burn rate compare to other cities as well? The first question really wasn't that informative because it was so early in the programming. What we found, just like in Charlotte, where the initial emphasis over the first few months was primarily on city operations, for example, salaries for first responders, that was the predominant spend category for the peer cities as well. Intuitively, it makes sense. You know, a lot of the external facing programs that, we're that we've been standing up related to business support and housing support, it takes time to get those running. It takes time to get dollars out the door. That's what we found, that's what we found, and that's what other cities 
have found as well. In terms of the burn rate, the question that's often asked is, are our cities spending this money quickly enough in order to position themselves to exhaust their funding by December 30th? Coming out of the gates, we had 12% of our allocation that was spent by June 30th, and that also just so happens to be right at the medium for the peer cities that we looked at. Half were above and half, half were below. So we'll see a significant change in this, obviously, as we get into the second quarter of the CARES funding, both in terms of the investment categories that will start to ramp up, and then also, of course, the burn rate will need to increase in order to get to the full $154 million by the end of the year. Okay, so a little bit more specific to Charlotte. This is really just intended to be a visual depiction of some more detailed information that was shared with Council a couple of weeks ago. One question that gets asked is, when you stack up the investment categories that we have in our community support bucket, so back to that original blue pie chart, the community support bucket is $76.5 million. This lays out each of those investment categories. Each of these component pieces will will look familiar to you. Of course, survive and thrive and aggregate are $50 million. Housing support at this point is 20 if you include the amount that's remaining for allocation. And what we've done in each instance for the investment categories with the color coding here is anything in green means it's been both allocated and dispersed. If it's in yellow, it's been allocated but not yet dispersed. And then there are a couple items here in orange or light orange that are remaining for allocation. So just to cherry pick one or two items on this slide to give you an example, access to capital is of course one program that you're very familiar with, $30 million being put in support of the small business community. As of the end of August, there was $16.8 million associated with that program out the door. Um, and the, we were oversubscribed for that, which I suppose is, is a good place to be in. So the team will obviously be working over the weeks ahead in order to get that particular program across the goal line. When, when I was reflecting on the slide earlier today, I couldn't help but think with the bar charts and the numbers, it, it's easy to get lost in that. It's, it's very impersonal. But every single one of these programs is designed to help people in Charlotte. So, you know, if you think about the access to capital, there's already roughly 1,500 businesses in Charlotte that have been positively impacted by that, and that number will grow in the weeks ahead. If you look at the housing support piece that Pamela Weidman and her team are advancing, there's already a thousand families in Charlotte that have benefited from rental and mortgage relief, and that number will continue to grow. The Youth and Opportunity Centers collaboration with the YMCA over the summer, that had a positive impact on thousands of kids and teenagers in the city. Bridging the digital divide is an effort that we're very excited about, of course, and now we're moving from the feasibility phase more into implementation mode. You'll hear more about that in the weeks ahead, but we're very excited about the opportunity there to connect with thousands of Charlatans with a particular emphasis on the Opportunity Corridor as an opportunity to provide Wi-Fi both in multifamily communities as well as in public sites. Arts and artists, we're still working through some of the details, but it's exciting to think about the potential to support both arts organizations and artists themselves. So everything on this slide is really intended to focus on positive community impact. When you compare us to other cities, uh, I think Charlotte should take pride in the way that it's approaching this. You know, you know what, what a shame it would be to not spend all of the money. And, and the city staff understands that the assignment is to spend all of the money. Uh, but, but what a shame it would be to not spend it wisely, not spend it smartly. And that's where I think Tracy Dodson's team and Pamela Weidman's team deserve a lot of credit for creative programming, very strategic, intentional approach to what they're doing. It's not just cutting checks. It's cutting checks and trying to do it in a way where, we'll get, where we will get a good return on investment. So more to come on this one, but clearly the mission is to turn all the bars into green by December 30th. So stepping back a bit to more of a broader perspective. We're, of course, not in this alone. There, there's an ecosystem in Charlotte that's working around a number of these issues. This is not intended to capture the entire ecosystem, but clearly some of the key players. We understand our piece in this puzzle. We've talked about the 76 and a half million. Mecklenburg County received its own uh, coronavirus relief funding. 
and albeit a smaller amount, they're, they're doing meaningful things with their allocation in terms of 50, roughly $15 million that they've set aside for community-facing investments. And then, of course, we have the COVID-19 response fund, which was stood up very early in the COVID crisis, in part with generous contributions from the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County and many other uh, private sector donors as well. So just to underscore again, this is not intended to be the entire ecosystem. The state of North Carolina has done and is doing things that are community facing associated with COVID relief. The local nonprofit sector more broadly is doing things focused on COVID relief. But this is really intended to be staging for the next slide, which was just an attempt to take the city of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, and the COVID-19 response fund and lay out where we've spent money and where we have programming that's planned. So if, if you were to look at particular bars on this chart and you were to peel back the onion, you would see that there are certain areas where Charlotte is, is playing in a big way. And in fact, we're, you know, we're the only, only game in town on some of these. So small business support, uh, the $39 million reflected in that first bar, that's predominantly almost exclusively all of Charlotte. In other areas here, for instance, housing, shelter, and financial assistance, that's very much a collaborative approach where Charlotte includes 10 million of that bar, which is the amount that it's already been allocated to PAM's organization. But the COVID-19 Response Fund in Mecklenburg County are doing meaningful things themselves in that particular space. And then if you were to look at food security, for example, that would be an area where the city of Charlotte has chosen not to, to be in that particular swim lane, but Mecklenburg County and the COVID-19 Response Fund have done that. So I think where this gets interesting, and of course it's a challenge because it's a judgment call. If you were to ask 10 different people where money should be devoted in these community priority areas, you might get 10 different answers. But with resources being scarce and, and the needs being many, uh, judgment calls need to be made. As the city, the county, the COVID-19 response fund and other players in this ecosystem evaluate, what's the highest and best use of the what I would call the remaining funds, that's where I think this can be helpful because we've all kept a little bit of powder dry. The city has a little bit of unallocated discretionary money, still have the contingency to be thoughtful about. The county has a little bit of available resources and the COVID-19 response fund has a few million dollars that are still on the sidelines at this point as well. So we may all choose to do things in particular swim lanes as we move into the fourth quarter, but it sure would be beneficial if we go about it in a very intentional way um, and, and at least have you know, a sense of perspective on how we can collectively have the greatest impact on this community. I can cover this slide, Manager Jones, or if you'd like me to hand the baton to you, I could do that. I'll jump in. Uh, uh, great job, Sean. And, um, you know, for the mayor and council, we thought it would be good tonight to show um, all the different pots of money that are out there because as Sean mentioned earlier, um, we are becoming much more intentional um, with our discussions with the county and with the Foundation for the Carolinas and the United Way about this fourth quarter and how we could best um, collaborate because there are some outstanding issues and these outstanding issues were uh, raised the last time that uh, we were together and uh, I will just go to what we are reviewing, which is ongoing support for um, housing and homelessness, additional support for public Wi-Fi, uh, utility and rent, uh, employee assistance with daycare and youth athletic uh, activities. The one that I'd like to put on the table tonight, and, and I do want to take one step back before I go into the additional support considerations. Uh, one of the issues that um, has come up from time to time has been the premium pay for our um, operational uh, employees who um, have been out there every day and really working hard for us. And we have tied that initially to getting into phase three. As we uh, go into these phases, 2.5, 2.75, 3.0, we, we just I just believe it's better for us to continue the premium pay for those employees throughout the end of the calendar year. Um, depending on if you look at this from a total budget standpoint or just a general fund budget standpoint, the reimbursement is somewhere between 73 and 78 percent. So I, I just feel one is the right thing to do and I feel comfortable 
with continuing to um, have the premium pay until December 30th, which is consistent with the, the CARES Act, Act funds. Um, and then we move over to that, because I wanted to talk about that before we go into this next piece. One of the things that um, we've talked about for a while has been uh, the public support for Wi-Fi. And our uh, CIO, uh, Renee, and her team have really worked well with taking that $1.5 million that you set aside so that we could go into our corridors of opportunity and provide um, public Wi-Fi. But there's also an issue that's occurring right now, and I think you read about it, and those are the 16,000 students that do not have internet access uh, who are uh, working remotely in terms of school. And we have a, a great opportunity now. It seems like for those 16,000 um, devices that are out there, uh, it would cost about $4 million in order to provide that support for the rest of the school year. And I think it maybe will get you even into the next summer. Uh, my understanding is the um, Charlotte Mecklen Mecklenburg uh, School Foundation is going to um, provide $2 million towards that gap. The business community is willing to come in with another million. And what I strongly recommend to the council tonight is with that $2 million of FEMA reimbursed funds. We had three million last time. You've set aside a million for um, arts and artists. Um, we still have two million left that's unallocated. Um, to be able to participate in that, I believe that that would be the trigger that could get this thing going. So again, on the list of those ongoing issues, I would um, strongly recommend to get the approval to move forward with up to a million dollars for public Wi-Fi. Again, if the devices aren't all deployed, we would be using CARES money to get the monthly payment for those devices through the end of the year. So um, I do not believe it would go over a million. I think it's actually close to $900,000, but it would only be associated with the number of devices that are deployed. So off the list, that is what I would recommend to the mayor and council uh, tonight. And I think that Maybe one last slide. Oh, yes, I'll just, and the, and the last slide is that, um, as Sean had mentioned earlier, there are still uh, those unallocated dollars that are um, to be discussed. The council back in, I believe, April, we talked about having a, um, a retreat or an expanded strategy session in October so that one, we could give you more up-to-date information as it relates to sales tax and collections and where we think we would end the, the um, fiscal year 2020, as well as a bit of an update for FY uh, 2021. But during that time period, I would recommend this opportunity to talk about what Sean mentioned earlier, that 14.5 million in contingency, as well as the remain, remaining FEMA funds or anything else that has not been uh, allocated or disperse. So with that, Mayor, I turn it back over to you. Okay, I, we've got some questions on the presentation. I thought it would be good to take questions and then we can follow up with a motion. And I had Mr. Eggleston, I'm sorry, the first thing I should do is I failed to ask council members to introduce themselves. And I really apologize for that. Um, Mr. Baker, will you start with the introductions for today's meeting, please? Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Tark District 6. James Mitchell at large. Larkin Eggleston, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Craig's District 7. Marcus Jones, City Manager. Bylaws Mayor. Julie Eisel, Mayor Tem, and at large. Renee Johnson, District 4. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Dimple Ajmer, at large. Good evening, Matt Newton, District 5. I'm so accustomed to seeing everyone on the screen, but we have one person on the screen tonight to be introduced. Braxton Winston at large. Thank you very much. And again, my apologies. I, I guess we have one just... more with us at the table. Huh? We have one more person to introduce themselves. Oh, who else did we not get around the table? Uh, oh, our clerk. I'm sorry. No worries. I know you guys are nice to see me. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stephanie Bell, Deputy City Clerk. Thank you so very much for standing in for um, Stephanie. Stephanie, so. Um, 
So my apologies, and um, let us know that we're going to um, get back into what I would know, whatever the new normal is, and, and I'll have that process ready to go. I had um, Mr. Eggleston followed by Ms. Watlington um, for questions on the overall presentation, and I have I had Mr. Driggs, and then we'll have Mr. Driggs, and then Mr. Mitchell, Ms. Eisel. Why don't I just go? Um, I'm not quite sure if I should just go around the table. I'm for Deputy um, Chief Estes. Okay, so why don't we go ahead? Why don't we do um, Chief you, Chief Estes, not Chief Graham, Chief Estes questions right now. Mr. I'm, Larkin? Mine is Mr. super Eggleston. specific, and he's probably already anticipating it. Just um, thank you for the presentation. I'm hoping that what you said at the end of one of those slides earlier uh, about the shift to 2.5 and the clarification around some of the ways that we were differentiating certain types of businesses has been clarified. I know I'd spoke, spoken with you and Chief Jennings on multiple occasions a few weeks ago about one of the only things I think that was frustrating our local small businesses more than the inability to be open or be successful right now was the inability to even know exactly what the rules were and where they fell within them. So I think the, the best thing we can do, we don't entirely control what the rules are, but we, I think our, we do have an obligation, I believe, to make sure that we're on the same page with the other agencies we work with, make sure that we are consistent with them and what the rules are and how we're going to enforce them. And I'm hoping uh, you can tell me that after the meeting that I know took place a week or two ago between all those agencies, particularly around um, the hospitality industry, that we do feel like we're on the same page with them and restaurants are not going to be restaurants and other businesses, but certainly I heard a lot from restaurants that they were getting conflicting interpretations and being told one thing by one agency and another, uh, another thing by another. So I'm hoping that that has been rectified. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I was the purpose of the meetings is, is to make sure that uh, we were quote unquote on the same sheet of music to be, you know, quite frankly, um, what what you had happen is there, there it wasn't as much people being on the same sheet of music or not. It was that uh, some agencies were a little more forward in enforcement than others. So some weren't in really enforcing at all. Some weren't, you know, but needless to say, we uh, we had a meeting, got a good understanding. Then we got 2.5, which took out some of the language that was creating some of the inconsistencies in for you mentioned what's a restaurant. You would think that'd be straightforward, but believe me, take a look at the uh, at the alcohol rule, and you'll see that it's not that clear. To answer your question succinctly, yes, I believe we're on the same sheet of music. Um, they're they're uh, doling out the uh, places to inspect on a on a weekly basis, and I really feel much better about where we are. Our, our state has a history of murky laws around um, the hospitality industry, so it's not surprising that it's confusing. I, I don't know if there's an opportunity, and if and I think maybe there should be for our corporate communications folks to help put together, and again, this might be different for different types of businesses in our community, but um, putting together really easily digestible infographics and things that explain now that we're in a new phase, what those rules are and make clear what the enforcement will be. Uh, because again, when certain businesses in our community a couple of weeks ago felt 100% confident that they could be open and they were certainly doing things the right way in terms of safety precautions, and then to have various agencies coming in and telling them they shouldn't be open caused a lot of confusion and was, for some of them, even more of a hardship than if they'd have just been closed in the first place. So um, I hope we can help our enforcement arms like CMPD by using our communication arms to message a consistent message that we know other agencies are on board with. Um, so that we don't have that confusion in 2.5 that we had in phase two. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. I think it would be appropriate for the ABC folks to draft and write so that we are not creating language that they wouldn't use, but we could and certainly ask them to do that and then post it. I think that's a great idea. I think, without speaking out of turn, I think they either have or are working on that very thing. I'll, I'll check. Um, after the meeting here. They being ABC or they being? Uh, yeah, the ABC, the, the, our local ABC. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, are there other questions for Chief Estes? 
All right, thank you. And so I'll go to Ms. Watlington. Ms. Watlington, you had a question for? Uh, the city manager. City manager. I just wanted to understand, I hear your recommendation about the discretionary funds, and I want to make sure I am understanding what this means then in the context of next steps, where it says determine the best use of the remaining discretionary two million. Are you recommending that one of those million be allocated? Gotcha. Yes. Yes. Well, um, is there anything, well, of course there is. What are some of the other things then that for that final one million or they might be competing against the recommendation? So thank you, uh, Councilmember Watlington. And I love the way that uh, Sean displayed it, that there are going to be issues around utilities. There are going to be issues around not just, you know, um, the private utilities, but also our own water utilities, still rent, mortgage, I believe. Um, I had a conversation with a, a council member today about even um, some of the music venues. So, but if we are able to look at this, which we started a couple of weeks ago, um, with the county, with the foundation, with the United Way, and there may be some opportunities for us to focus on one area, where some um, others may focus on others. So, so again, I'm using what was provided for me last time we were together, and if there are some more things that council wants to add to the list, this is what we're analyzing right now. The biggest thing for us, which I'm taking off of, of the list, is the employee assistance with daycare. And uh, for the most part, we're doing that because we believe there is a CMS solution. And um, so as those solutions come up, we begin to take some of the things off the list. Thank you. All right. Um, are there in, um, and then I had this uh, follow, um, Mr. Driggs? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, clarification on slide 12. <clears throat> One, just as a clarification, I think it's related to the last question. You refer to FEMA funds and using $1 million of those funds. Is that different from the $2 million of discretionary up here? Uh, no, Mr. Driggs, it's, it's not. And I should have figured out that you would do this. Um, so, <laughs> so, yes, for everybody, because we were able to use FEMA funds to reimburse us for some of the expenditures, it freed up some additional CARES funds. Right, so, I, I understood that, yeah. but I'm just saying, okay, do we have that two million plus another three, or is that two million the discretionary money that we have? That's the two million, that's the discretionary that we so have. So you're proposing to use half of that yes, sir. for the uh, Wi-Fi? Yes. Okay, just to be clear about that. Um, you've got up there 29.2 million in allocated and not dispersed business support. Are we confident that all of that capacity will be needed by year end? Or is there any chance that we would want to go back and if another priority arose, revisit the question? Do we have an irrevocable commitment so, as to that, that money? So, so Mr. Driggs, um, what? So I'm not going to look at uh, Councilman Mitchell right now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the best way to say this is the business support survive is oversubscribed. So we don't believe that there's going to be an issue getting that 30 million out. The business support thrive, and I see Tracy at the doorway in case I'm messing this, this up. There are some elements of that that are related to workforce development. And those dollars have not gone out the door right now all of them, and we're working with some of our partners with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Tracy, if I'm not doing that well, but if there's something that's happening with one of those, you know, programs, and let's just say if it was the um, Innovate Business Grant Program that we did not get um, the takers, if that's the, the best way to put it, that could be reallocated. The same thing with the, the housing support, if uh, Council Member Graham and, and, and the Neighborhoods Committee, you know, finds out that, you know, maybe only half of that is something that they think meets just one of those priorities, there could be an opportunity to use that in any other priority that the Council has. Yes, sir. All right. I, I just have a concern. We've got three and a half months left, and we have very little discretionary money left. So I, 
I'd like to see that we had a little flexibility to respond over the remainder of the year. Sure. I'm, I'm, Mr. Driggs, I am so sorry. So this is just in terms of the $76.5 million for community support. On top of that, you have $14.5 million in pure contingency. Right. No calls on that whatsoever. And that's still uh, available. Accessible. Yes, sir. Be clear about that. Yeah. Um, well, my last question was for Chief Graham. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I wanted first to uh, thank the chief for the tour of the Emergency Operations Center that he led me on last, uh, last week. Very informative. Anybody hasn't been there, I recommend it. And my question about is there's a lot of talk about vaccines and stuff like that. Yes, sir. And people are asking, you know, how close are we? And when we get to the point where a vaccine is approved, how much time do we think it will take before we can actually fully reopen? I don't know. Okay. That's a good Thank question. <laughs> so uh, we are working with the uh, health department there in there today. And so we have what they call a point a points of distribution plan. And so we do that for other things too, but we have sites throughout the county that we're working on one, making sure that they're good. So we have to do assessments and then two, developing a typing. So like type one, type two, type three of if we're going to open that up, that site up for vaccinations, what are the requirements in terms of personnel, equipment, et cetera, to make that successful? So emergency management and county health are working very closely on developing that plan so that when we get a vaccine that we're not, that we're ready to go. Does that make um, sense? Right. But I think the two points I would mention is there's a lot of kind of anecdotal uh, suggestions that the vaccine is going to happen at this point in time or that point in time. Some of it, I think, is a little political. Yep. So if we could be sure to have the best available information about the progress on the development of a vaccine uh, that we can uh, make available to the public, I think that would be good. And then the other thing is you, you've developed the vaccine. There's a whole critical path in terms of the elements you suggested, also manufacturing the stuff right. and so on. So I'm assuming that there's a matter of some months before the vaccine has been administered widely enough to allow us to, to fully reopen. And again, if we could just kind of keep people updated on what that outlook, I think it would be very helpful. Yes, sir. So we're, we're, wait, we're waiting on guidance from the state because that has not flowed to the local area, but we will keep you updated. And then the second part of that, which we didn't mention, is the transport of the vaccine. And so what are the requirements, whether it's refrigerator, et cetera, for the transport of the vaccine? I will tell you that we're entering into a dangerous period uh, throughout the country the next couple months. So I, I hope that in January I'm standing up here and saying it went great, we're here, and now we're moving forward into the spring, but we don't know that. And so none of us were here in 1918. And so each, each day is a challenge as you look at the data. And we're always looking at trends to see where we're training, not only for our county, for the state, and nationally, but we're on it. And uh, I feel, I'm gonna tell you, I'm proud of this council. I'm proud of the county commissioners. I'm proud of all the towns. And I'm proud of all the managers because there has been a tremendous amount of work done to get us to this point. So, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my comments want to support the city manager, $1 million for public wildfire. And just add a little antidote. Uh, so I've been working with the States for Avenue Corridor in their neighborhood. And when you're talking about Jewett Hills Elementary, Walter T. Byers, they really could use this type of uh, investment to show that it, all, it is about the kids in that corridor who really need Wi-Fi. And so total support. It. Only thing I would add, if we could, let's look at our corridors of opportunity as a priority, though, when we're talking about how we would use our million dollars. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. I just want to add to that too that I, I'm um, really, I'm really glad to see that the city is considering, and I hope that our colleagues will support that request for the million dollars for Wi-Fi access because we knew that there was a, a gap before. We knew that that was, you know, we, we talk about Wi-Fi in this day and age. It's not when I was growing up, you know, when there was a there was a difference between education children getting a good education or not, nobody needed Wi-Fi. Everybody needs it now. And, and these kids don't, a lot of them don't have access to it. My understanding is 16,000 is the number of households. So that could be a couple kids in a household. 
and some of those households are going to need more than one uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. So the, the need is tremendous. Um, I really hope that we will, and ask my colleagues, I, and I'm prepared to make a motion when everybody's had a chance to comment, um, that we use that a million to support um, the, the children. Right now, there are hot spots on buses in, in public places, but a lot of these kids are having to do homework in the middle of the night because their parents are having to you know, use their own Wi-Fi or hot spots to work and whatnot. And, and you've got to have Wi-Fi in your home in this day and age if you have any chance of being successful in school. And if we're a city that values wor our workforce, then they've got to get an education. So I hope that we do support this. Thank you. All right. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I just wanted to know as she make a motion? Uh, she said she's uh, going to make I'll a prepare, motion, I'm so I'm soon. assuming that right. she's prepared to make a motion. When everyone's had a chance to speak. Okay. The, um, are we receiving reports from our uh, community partners that are allocating the, the funds, such as how many um, families are served and error rates and time frames? Are, are we receiving outcome or output reports from those um, organizations? I'm not sure that we're receiving those reports, but we can request them. Okay. We, we have um, some of the raw numbers about what has been spent, but we'll ask specifically about outcomes and what's the impact. Uh, yeah, because there Tom, was a Do you want to add anything to Mr. Okay, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, does that relate specifically to business support or also housing? Or, or business and housing. Okay. okay. Uh, just because there was a report before that talked about the error rate. Um, I think we've, I've heard from um, constituents that have, um, are, are, there's some delays in the processing, so we just want to make sure that, that those things are being um, addressed. And also, as far as the Wi-Fi, can you, uh, Mr. Jones, can you just elaborate a little more about the, what, what the uh, $1 million will cover? You said 16000 um, Homes. This, these are for hot spots, and we're going to pay the um, data for, like you said, till the end of the year. Yes, we will. So, uh, Councilmember Johnson, what we can do with that CARES funds, we were um, we scrutinized this to make sure that it's the appropriate use of it. So, we can pay for the service through the end of the calendar year because that's when the the funds end in terms of right now the guidance that we have from uh, the federal government. I would like to add on top of that, if you put these two together, because that million five that you um, allocated for public Wi-Fi in the um, corridors of opportunity, I think that, well, after talking with our CIO, Renee, ask you that that's the best thing that we could do. But right now, with the CARES funds, we are doing the best we can to spend that million five. But as we move forward, the hotspots become the short-term fix, but the longer-term uh, fix is the uh, Wi-Fi infrastructure, especially in our neighborhoods. So this would help pay for the hotspots for the students based on what we received from CMS, the 16,000 figure. So you said there was a $4 million, um, I guess, deficit, or it would take $4 million to cover that, right? Right. So um, buying the apparatus and, st and, and also paying for it, our understanding from CMS is the $4 million was the ask total to get it all operational. So my question is, the $1 million, will there still be a deficit? Like you said, you mentioned pub private investment or... Will the $1 million cover it and resolve it? And if it will resolve it, is it just through December? I mean, is it, are we just, what happens from January to Sure, January? sure. Um, I, I'm going to um, tag in the Mayor Pro Tem, who's had some discussions with this too, but it will get you through the full year. So, yeah, I asked, I called Sonia Gant this weekend, who's run, who runs the CMS Foundation because there's some private sector work that was interested in it, and I wanted to get details. And she sent me a flyer that I'll send to everybody. But basically, they, the initial number was $4 million. They, um, CMS gave them a million for physical hotspots, the little 
you know, it's like the size of a phone. That is the hot, if that's what they still look like. The, the money that they're still raising, about $3.2 million, goes for the payment of the service. And it costs $200 per hotspot for service. And they're doing it for a full year because the contractor basically said it's almost the same amount of money to do it just through the school year as it would for the whole year. There is a, um, a part, they gave out some of those hotspots in the be at the end of sp in spring when the kids went home. And so that's what Mr. Jones is referring to. So those kids only had service through October, and this money will get them through the end of the school year. Overall, the foundation is raising money for 16,000 hotspots, the service for 16,000 hotspots that they can hand out to a family. And in some cases, if they have more than two kids in CMS, they'll give them more than one hotspot because families are saying, you know, we have this hotspot, but we've got three kids in school and you can't access it. So some of that 16,000 will be more than one for a household. And they're using four different data points to come up with that 16,000 number because it's, it's kind of hard, you know, they have a lot of families they haven't heard from, and they don't know if they're still in the area, or they don't know if they haven't heard from them because they don't have internet and they're not getting communication. So they're still using different ways to communicate with these families, but through a number of different um, data collection sources, they've determined that 16,000 of these units, mm -hmm. which they have, they still need service for it. So this will pay for um, service for those 16,000, the, the overall, the whole fundraising effort, and, uh, and they are still raising money in the public, in the private sector for it. Okay, so it's just six, it's the 16,000 units till the, through December. That's what we're paying for. That's what we're paying for. The overall effort will give them service through for one year, which will you know get them through the school year. Good. Okay. All right, Mr. Winston. Uh, thank you. Um, I've heard concerns from CATS bus drivers regarding uh, partitions um, and uh, the lack of passenger PPE. Uh, can we get an update uh, from CATS about um, progress in both of these areas? Sure. Yes. Okay. All right, um, Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, can we go back to slide number 10, where it has city operations? Um, so uh, we did have a breakdown for uh, the community support, which is 76.5. Uh, can we get a breakdown for 63.5 and how that's being spent already, or it's in plan of being spent? Uh, so thank you, Ms. Ashmere. I believe that Ryan, the last time he was before you gave a breakdown, and we can get that back to you this week. Okay, so has, has all $63.5 million has been spent? No. no. Okay. No. So there is still some that's in the pipeline? Yes. Of being spent by end of 2020? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, if you can get a, a, a report on that, that would be great. Um, my other question on slide 12 was already addressed by Mr. Driggs on uh, remaining funds for allocation, especially for $10 million for housing. Uh, and I see that's currently under the, uh, under the housing uh, committee. So um, what are, what programs is the committee considering, or is it still in works we're for this $10 million allocation? We've, we're gonna have committee reports right after this, and so, okay, so I think we can go into that at that time. Um, okay, I have, addition, I have a few more questions on uh, uh, sl slide number 15, where we have status that's a check mark uh, next to it. So are these funds already being dispersed? Uh, or? Uh, yes, so uh, the ones that have checks by them, 
Again, this was the last list that we had before you the last time that we were together. And uh, some of those decisions were made that night. So there's additional support for small businesses, additional support for arts and artists, and additional support for the hospitality industry and restaurants. So that's all being dispersed? No. For, for example, in the first line, you'll recall on August 10th, the decision to allocate $8 million for a combination of food and beverage and hotels. So allocated August 10th. Tracy and team are now in the process of standing up that program with a marketing campaign to open up the application process, for example. And then arts and artists we've talked about. And on small business, that this was really just a reflection of the fact that Survive is still working its way through the red zone across the goal line. And a number of the Thrive programs are really just being stood up at this time. Got it. So the first line item, that's uh, in-house. Is that, is that ma going to be managed in-house? On the, on the food and beverage and the hotel. And then we'll do that through the foundation. Okay, so similar to what we did with access to capital. Okay. Uh, what, are, uh, what are the additional needs that have been uh, brought to your attention, Mr. Manager? So outside of uh, this list, I'm not sure that we have anything that's in, in additional. So we're continuing to, to work at uh, this list. So I know you had mentioned earlier music venues. Can I, can I bring, before we go to the uh -huh. next subject, on this list is support for housing and homelessness, um, utility relief. Um, when we started out on this, we were not aware that there would not be the continuation of the $600 allocation that people were getting. And once that ran out, I believe that this list um, for housing and rent relief and utility payments, which were um, put in abeyance, but still have to be paid, those areas, I would really like to see some numbers applied to them um, and that's why I think um, my suggestion is that we have an October 5th strategy session. That'll give us a little bit more time for Sean to figure out how to pencil out some of those numbers. Um, we also, you know, have some other areas where um, disparities certainly have existed in housing and who's going to be displaced and eviction notices and that. So I know that Mr. Jones says that if all of those are on the list, but when it comes to those areas, I, I have deep concern and I would like to see some numbers before we start talking about other major expenses. Yes, uh, and I share that concern, especially uh, when it comes to housing and uh, utility relief. Um, uh, also, if we can get um, sort of a additional needs that are already out there uh, in a list so that we know there are additional needs that we should be looking at, whether it's music venues or uh, other asks that have been um, out there. You know, I, uh, other, last question I have is, um, so for the CMS partnership, uh, I guess the hot spot that we are um, we are allocating $1 million towards. Uh, the reason we are only allocating a million, um, is that because we can only, I guess that money has to be spent by end of this year? Well, it's, uh, Ms. Hedgemeyer, it's twofold. Um, CMS had a $4 million gap. The foundation's um, school foundation is called is making up two million of that gap, and the question became: Could the private sector in the city fulfill the final half of that gap? So that's the only reason why it's it's a million, and it's really up to a million um, because it's going to depend on the number of devices that are deployed. But but that's it. We um, if the private sector had not stepped up that million may have been a bigger ask tonight. Got it. Thank you. May I follow up to Ms. Ashmira's question? Um, in terms of the business support that survived, and it's slide 12. 
And so the yellow, the 14.7 million is money that is applications have been submitted, will be approved, and will be going out the door. Am I, am I getting that correct? Yes, the vast majority of that yellow bar on the top relates to the Access to Capital program. There were, I think, almost 5,000 applications received for that program. Um, actually, about 1,300 just in the last two weeks of August. So the team, the FFTC partnership, is working through that list of applications. It was overall $60 million that was requested from the small business community in comparison to the $30 million available. So now it's just a question of working through those remaining applications as quickly as possible. And remind me, I think that the reason that we went with that is that we opened up the criteria. And what was the criteria that we opened up to allow for people to apply? There were a couple variables at play. One was an intentional focus on working with the immigrant community. And then the second area of focus was making it open to entities that had received PPP funding as well. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had um, Ms. Bakari next and then Mr. Graham. Ms. Bakari? Yeah, um, I think given that we would be one fourth of the overall investment uh, for CMS, it would probably not make sense for us not to do it. But I think maybe putting an asterisk next to it and authorizing the manager to go have some conversations where you take into account the fact that we know how big the digital divide is, the need for Internet access across our community. My fear is that we're going to take $4 million and we're going to point it at a very specific problem that may not be around in its exact form that it is today long term. In fact, you know, no one knows, nobody knows at all what's going to play out with, with our in-person schooling. But my sense is it can't keep going like it is right now. So we know those same people are the same ones that experience the digital divide. But what I'd say is if you focus on a longer term, broader um, problem statement, that four million bucks might take a, a slightly different form. So I'd hate for us to, to tie four million bucks here uh, but given we're only one million of the four, I, I don't think it would make sense for us to say, no, we're out. But I would, I would hope you could figure out a way to go in and say to them, look, going and buying, you know, these 16,000 or whatever hot spots and then, and then programming them, like we could put that money towards real infrastructure, the 1.5 added to it and other things, and start getting to some, some more sustainable long-term um, digital divide solutions. So that, that's one point that I would strongly, strongly emphasize. And I think the other thing is um, a couple of us have been working really hard on the music uh, uh, venue side of things. And, um, and um, they, they, if we're talking about where money's needed that currently isn't allocated, I got to tell you the music venues is it. Literally, uh, th what decisions we make in this next month for them will dictate if, you know, a quarter to half of them even exist when we come out of all of this. Because f for everything we don't know, there's one thing we do know. We're, music venues will be the last that are allowed to open. Many of them don't qualify for things like PPP um, because they furloughed people and they don't have necessarily the payrolls. They're still having to pay leases and rent. And it's just, you know, it, many may qualify that as a nice to have. I would say, and the first question that you, you might say is, well, we've got $30 million access to capital. 10 grand or 20, even 25 grand for generic purposes is not going to help these folks. Like they have to retool their facilities so that um, people are able to come in there and we're able to justify, hey, it's safe to go. It's not just a matter of, um, you know, waiting around for uh, you know, us to get to phase three or four or whatever it might be. It's making sure our community knows, hey, there's a stamp of, of safety that you can come here because of the things we have in place. And they can't afford that right now. They can't afford that. And, and I, I will tell you, and I mean, I'll speak on behalf of, of Larkin, who's done a lot of the same work, too. Um, they, they are right now making tough decisions on, on whether to shut their doors now. That is an outcome we can change, but it has to be specific, dedicated um, um, pools of money and, uh, and a program 
that focuses on just them or literally with like we did a, a lot of good work with 30 million bucks and some people will maintain with 10 and 25 grand some that won't matter to that is irrelevant for these music venues right now and that is an outcome we can change so i would just highly recommend that it but if we don't do it now it, it, it'll be too late Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I didn't want the, the council to know that I was paying attention to the discussions in reference to the, the Great Neighborhoods Committee uh, and the allocation of the, uh, the $10 million. Uh, we are in sync with a lot of the comments that the, um, the mayor has made. Won't give the report now, but certainly uh, I've heard uh, uh, the discussions around the table, and I think we're really in line with the thought of what the mayor is going in. I'll share more doing that report. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. First, I want to say, as hard as it was to uh, get dressed up today and blow dry my hair, this is really nice to talk in person with you all. Um, it's, this is, these are really critical discussions that we're having, and it's been hard to do it on Zoom, so I appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion. Um, so two comments for Mr. Bakari's. Um, what he just talked about. I, I, you're absolutely right. We have got to find a solution to the digital divide. The pandemic, as I said, you know, it just exasperates the problem. But right now, CMS has parents that already got the hotspot saying, we can't get on. We have three kids and it keeps crashing. And especially for these younger kids that have you're a CMS parent, so that have the interactive portion of the day, when they get cut out of the class, they're done. So this is an emergent, this is an acute emergency that I think we're in a position to help on and we should because it's the right thing to do. And then I think we should have that conversation because you're absolutely right. Um, but right now this is service to get these kids online tomorrow. And the second thing is I think, you know, the question of the music venues is an interesting one because those are businesses. But like our arts venues and our arts organizations, they are in a different position because you can't produce a show and have 10 people. You, you know, and unlike some of our businesses, they can operate at 50% capacity or whatever that number is. And so I do put them kind of in the category as arts organizations um, that are also a very important part of the culture of our city and attract people to come here. So I, I'd be supportive of us figuring it out, doing it the right way, but with a sense of urgency. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions, Mr. Eggleston? I just, obviously, I think it's, I've said it before that I would support something for the arts or music specifically, I, I think it's worth noting, and I'm sure you've all read the same things I have, that in the state budget, um, there was some good, or the, the state allocation of dollars, um, COVID relief dollars a week ago maybe, there was some good stuff. One of the things that was disappointing was that uh, the yeah. counties with over a million people were left out of the arts funding allocations. Uh, well, those counties happen to be Mecklenburg and Wake and none other. So. Um, we, you know, we, we did come up with a short straw on that one as well. And so I do think that you could lump into um, the locally owned music venues, some of the locally owned theater companies as well that maybe don't already get grants. Uh, they're not, maybe not beneficiaries of the Arts and Science Council, things like that. Um, because what will end up, we'll still have concerts in Charlotte. They'll just all be corporately produced at corporately owned venues. We'll still have plays coming to Charlotte, but they'll all be, you know, the big Broadway plays. They won't be the community theaters. Um, but even the Blumenthal just last week, uh, I believe laid off a, a pretty large number of their employees. So even the big stages are suffering right now and really don't have any light at the end of the tunnel. So um, just wanted to echo the urgency of that. So obviously, um, this pandemic has shown us how difficult allocation of funding for people who lost their ability to have a business, a passion about their work, um, has really meant that we are being <coughs> asked as government to allocate scarce resources. And that's always a tough decision. And I think we started off thinking 
70 million dollars, oh my gosh, this is really great, we'll do this and we'll do that, and, and lots of things happen. But I wanted to just ask, Sean, if you take all of your numbers, what's left? What's the amount? Did anybody figure that out? Ed, did you figure that out yet? <laughs> what Sean? is? In terms of unallocated? Unallocated. Yeah, it's 12 million. Yeah, it's, it's basically, well, it depends, the 14 and a half million contingency and along with, you know, depending on council action tonight, either one or two million in that small bar at the bottom. So 26 and a half million dollars, including the contingency? Did you say 12 plus the 26 yeah, and, plus a half? 14 and a half? 26 and a half, that's right. right. And um, the 10 is kind of earmarked, or if you will, it's, it's, it's not down in discretionary, it's up in housing. So I think Councilmember Graham might have an opinion about whether or not that's actually completely in play. So it could be 16 and a half to 26 and a half, depending on how much we're willing to take a guess on housing <laughs> and, and utility payments, that's which we, we don't numbers. know. Yeah. So I, 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 I really, I'm gonna ask a couple of series of questions and ask you to think about them and then we'll open the floor for action. Um, one, um, I was hoping that we would have an October 5th strategy session that would be kind of a day, maybe from eight to five, um, and address two things. How do we utilize whatever federal CARES dollars that there are left, as well as a projection of our revenues that are upcoming because we know things have changed. Um, and of course, there's always room for additional discussion. The second thing that I think that we all acknowledge is the needs are gonna be great for rent and utilities. Um, the digital divide, I, I said this today, um, I'm getting as smart as Tark Bakari about this without knowing it, that this is just a short-term fix, that if we don't figure out how to deal with this disparity in the digital divide, through every time we build a road, we're putting in the broadband, every time we do, um, affordable housing, we're putting in the broadband. Every time that we have a construction project, it has to, it has to be looked at just like electricity. any other part of the engineering. You might disagree with me, but that's okay. Oh, electricity. Uh, electricity. I'm sorry. So I think that that's exactly like electricity. And I also think that we don't know what automation is going to bring as a result of this. From what I read, the tech companies are having great great profits and great times. Not to say that they're enjoying a pandemic, but just to say automation plays a factor in it. So um, tonight we can make some decisions. I would like to say that no matter what decision we make tonight, October 5th, we're gonna have to make even tougher decisions. And so being prepared to do that, I think I wanna recognize the mayor pro tem and then Mr. Bakari. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would, I would like to make a motion to use a million dollars from our discretionary funds of the $2 million there to uh, use for CMS Foundation effort to supply children with um, hotspot service for educational needs. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? I had, Mr. Bakari, you had a different subject. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, if you would raise your hand, Mr. Um, Winston, would you raise your hand? Thank you, I see Mr. Winston's hand. I believe that is a unanimous vote. So that million dollars allocation, um, Mr. Jones, I, I'm gonna say this, I, this is probably not a very politic thing to say. We have a great school system, we have to educate our children. I just like for us to communicate better about what's going on and how to do this and work well together. That would just, that would just help me. I, I've always said collaboration is a lot better than any other type of communication and I think we need to be doing more of that. All right, so with that, um, Mr. Bakari. Um, thanks, I, I would just add, well, to, okay. to your point on the uh, digital divide stuff, I, I think the, 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 the term that we need to think about there is um, di digital by design. So whether it's a road or affordable housing or whatever, part of that is it's, it's, it's 
simply, you know, a p one thing that is m a must-have in everything we do going forward. <clears throat> because um, we, if, if we keep looking back and using the kind of technologies of yesterday, like we're doing now, unfortunately, it's the only option we have. That's why I voted for it, right? And, and I think your point, Mayor Pro Tem, is a good one. Um, but we've got to start getting ahead of the curve, and that means the infrastructure, the digital by design. So totally agree and, and look forward to moving forward on that. Um, so just two points that are related. Back to what the mayor just asked, and manager, if you know this off the top of your head, I'd like to ask, um, how much money is actually out the door right now? Like, how much do we have not spent? Because my guess, based on that and, and what I remember from meetings in the past, it could be you know, upwards of 100 million to 125 million at this point of the 154. Is that a fair statement? No, that is a fair statement. The, um, what we have right now, and I, I guess the best way to describe this, is green is out the door. Yeah. Um, and that 14.7 is all but out the door too. Or subscribed. Yeah, but then I, I can't assure you that the other 14.5 that's associated with Thrive will be totally out. I can't assure you that the the 10 million with the housing, but that that's kind but of- But yeah, but then, and then there's the, the, aside from the contingency, then there's the entire other bucket yeah. Right, which we're, that's not guaranteed to be out the door at this point either. I right? I guarantee you every penny of that's going to be out the door. But it's not. It's not yet. But you, you're positive it will. Absolutely. Be. Okay. The city money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess what would be a tragedy is we get to December 30th, and there's a substantial amount of money that goes back. I think we all agree on that. So that kind of brings me to back to the music venue thing. I mean, we've gotten proposals. I think everyone's probably read the articles and things that have come out since then from the, what is it, the Charlotte Independent Venues Alliance that's loosely connected to uh, Center City Partners and others. So they, they are working to solve this crisis mode right now. They've put together some pretty interesting things that I know is, uh, is in the hands of staff. Um, but there's an opportunity to put one to two million to work of that money that may very well get sent back for these folks to save them. But you know, I, I don't. I don't think that everyone's had a time to digest it enough to make a motion right now. I'm just scared that if we wait for another meeting, we're not going to even have the opportunity to make the motion in enough time. So I, I won't make the motion right now. But I would. I, I, may, I, 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 this, I want to do it this close to authorize you and see if there would be support to go after this just because I know that clock is almost ticked down at this point. Um, but I haven't had any conversations with anyone, so I won't. But I hope that would put, put enough urgency to you at least that this is, a re, this is a real thing. And this is, in my mind, how you spend the remainder of that money and get it out the door in three and a half months. Because the moment we make a decision today, that money's not going out of the, the, the doors for at least a month and a half, right? So, and that's at, at maximum speed. Then given the fact that we have all of these um, uh, new protocols we're putting in place as it relates to RFPs and things like that. So literally, I think we're probably 30 days away from not being able to actually approve anything that gets out of the door by December 30th. So with that being said, I just emphasize the urgency of if you say there are I'll make up a number, 45 independent music venues in town, and this is designed for that. That money can get out of the door quickly once you get past those milestones. I think that's one of the only ways we're going to, we, we started with a broad brush to say all can come, all can, can take from this with this criteria. I think we're at a timeline now where we have to get very specific and look for, for niches and tranches inside, inside our community and our business uh, community that, that we can help. And, and help, I mean, outcomes that we measure. This many people are still in business that wouldn't have been. Do you have an amount of money, Mr. Bakari? There's a, two, there's a $2 million request. There's overall a $3 million request, but $1 million is from the private sector. And then two $1 million buckets they've outlined, one of which um, music independent music venues, I had it up in front of me, can get... Um, uh, can get, uh, they called it Thrive, to go along with our, uh, with our language. They can get one-time grants of up to $50,000 on a sliding scale according to the venue's needs that they've laid out, um, how, that, how that would be used. I, I think what it was is, is one was to help with both employees and rent in a pool, and the other one was to help with retrofitting um, things like 
uh, um, HVAC and and the actual venue to be safe, not just to justify reopening, but also to be able to um, have confidence for those uh, music kind of attendees, the, the the fans, to actually be comfortable coming out and and um, and go to their venues. All right, thank you, Miss Watlington. Yep, two things. Um, Councilmember Bakari, I'm, I'm comfortable to support a not to exceed allocation at this point, so I'm, I'm happy to support that. Um, to that end, though, uh, would it be possible, I know people keep asking the same question as far as what money is remaining. I, if it's possible to just bring a full recommendation for the spending of the remaining balance, I think that might help execute and expedite some of the things that are still on the table instead of looking at it piecemeal. Just tell me if we've got $26 million left, how do you think we should spend it? What does that cover? What does that leave out? And we can adjust as necessary, but that way we can just go ahead and execute at once. I think the manager would be bringing forward a recommendation on the 5th of October. Yes. So we'll have that. And as well, data that um, we've been asking Sean about and calculations. So. Um, I have um, Mr. Graham next. Um, uh, have you finished, Ms. Watlington? All right, Mr. Graham. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. And this is for the manager. Marcus, I don't know if I, we talked about this or I read it somewhere. Is there a possibility that we'll get an extension that goes beyond December 31st um, to spend those dollars? So, yes, Mr. Graham. And, um, I guess there are two things that are going on. One, and, and that's one of the reasons why we set aside the $14.5 million, was um, one, if there was an extension, but also if we were able to use it for revenue replacement. And there's a lot of things that goes with revenue replacement, but I'll leave that alone, but it's, it's really beneficial to a jurisdiction. Um, we don't have either one right now, is my understanding. Sean, okay, great. And so um, we are bumping up against the December 30th deadline. What I will say is that there are some things that we can do with these funds that would assure us also getting them out before December 30th. I do like what Ms. Watlington said. We'd, we'd love to come back to you on December 5th with a, a, a list of things that would just be our best recommendation for the remaining funds. Which, which leads me to my second question that we talked about this early in the year in terms of the, the, the reading of the language of the contract in reference to how the funds can be utilized. So are we pushing up against the line or are we, or is it a very conservative reading of how the funds can be utilized uh, and has that changed in reference to the discussion we had earlier in the year in reference to housing? Yes. <clears throat> uh, so we are um, trying to be as aggressive as we possibly can be with the interpretations, but also the worst thing that we can do, I'm sorry, one thing that we don't want to do <laughs> is be aggressive and then have to pay that money back. So we keep talking about spending $154.5 million but we don't want to spend $154.5 million in the wrong way and have to pay 50 back. So point, that's, that's... Point, point well yeah. taken, but uh, uh, again, are, are we brushing up against the line in, in reference to uh, being somewhat innovative yes. within, the, within the, uh, the way the language is written? Absolutely. And um, we've done it previously, and... There are some things, for instance, like um, water utilities. There are some jurisdictions that basically say there's no way in the world you can take the money and use it to pay yourself with water utilities. But there's some other jurisdictions that have taken a very different stance with that, that you can utilize those funds. So as we, and I think the best chart um, that was on here today is all of the different things that the different entities are doing. And we may find that food insecurity is something that, that maybe you want to play in, right? And so as we go through, Mr. Graham, as we find those things that clearly it's easy to get the money out the door and it's a priority, that should be something that we think about. Right. But we are being as innovative and creative as... Um, and courageous. 
and, and courageous. <laughs> right? <laughs> we I can mean, be, yes. without, yeah. you know, putting ourselves at jeopardy, jir- right. yeah. but I think we ought to, we are. you know, I think I, I think we are, especially when we talk about, you know, acquiring, helping people acquire buildings for housing. I got you. I mean, you know, we are stepping out there. That That place is not going to be renovated by the time but we would have a contract with them that says it is for this purpose and meets that requirement. And I have to say, Kelly has been checking every document that goes out um, because she is monitoring as closely as Mr. Jones is, probably closer than Mr. Jones is, right? Point well taken. Thank you. I I think that's a great question and something we have to look at. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Johnson. I just wanted to ask the question about the music venues. Um, During one of the last meetings, the ED committee had recommended that that we open up a fund for organizations to apply that would have included the hospitality and tourism and other types of industry. But we put the limitations on um, for, for the food and beverage. So if we hadn't had that barrier, that would have been an opportunity, I think, for music venues to be able to apply. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm hesitant to say that this money is earmarked for specific industries. Um, I, I think if we're going to look at additional funding that we're going to make a motion um, to release, then we need to keep in mind when, when we put barriers or, or hurdles on the dollars. We, we, there are organizations or industries that may also need assistance. And again, if we had approved a, a broader fund the last time, then music venues would have been able to apply at that time. So I just want to recall that for everyone and, and ask that we keep that in mind if we're considering another targeted Thank you. All right. Um, does anyone else have? Um, I'm going to go with Mr. Driggs and then Mr. Eggleston. Uh, just a brief comment as we talk about Wi-Fi. Um, 5G is sort of the equivalent of autonomous vehicles in this mm-hmm. environment. So we have to be mindful of how that technology moves forward. Uh, it promises huge increases in cellular bandwidth and speed that could render a lot of the installed uh, broadband connections uh, obsolete. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't know how real, how soon, or whatever, but it would just be useful if staff could keep us posted. I don't know about everybody else, but I keep getting emails from people expressing anxiety about how this technology is going to give us all cancer or whatever. Um, it's a topic we're going to have to address, and I think we need to be mindful in conjunction with our Wi-Fi investments. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Just to put a quick bow on the, the ongoing music and stages discussion, I think in sidebar real quickly with um, Assistant City Manager Dodson, they're working right now to try to analyze the list of venues Um, that are part of this alliance and who has applied for some of the programs that are already in place, uh, who qualifies for which ones, and is there a gap? Are there there venues and and local uh, arch stages that fall through the cracks of the programs that exist, and how can we help them? So I don't think that we need to necessarily take action tonight, but I do think that we need to kind of all be thinking about it in the next week and maybe look as we go to next Monday at, at possible action based on what staff determines the gaps are. Okay, so I think um, there are a couple of things. If you could get your questions to Sean about any of this, who's gotten money, who hasn't gotten money, all of that, so he could coordinate that. And Mr. Jones, could we hear back on the 14th during the um, briefing period of time And then I think it would be very helpful if you made a list of those things that you saw as being important to be added so that we can cross-reference and have that discussion um, or at least be ready for that discussion as well on the 14th. So if everybody would get that to Sean, I think that would be very helpful. So I made a mistake today. I know it's very unusual, but we are under the... um, 
uh, meeting criteria for virtual meetings, which require that we have roll call votings um, because Mr. Winston has, is, is um, on the meeting on um, whatever word over we use, WebEx or whatever. And so for, I need to go back to the meeting that the motion that the Mayor Pro Tem made, I can't remember who seconded for the school um, funding. Mr. Eggleston, did you second that? Yes, ma'am. All right, so I will have to go through a roll call meeting. And so I'm gonna start with the Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Um, we have now six votes. Is there anyone that objects to this motion? Hearing no one in objection to the motion, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you for allowing me to correct that. We will have to do all of our motions in that respect, anything that we pass going forward um, this evening. So Mr. Jones, is that our wrap up for the Virus Relief yes. Fund update? Yes, Mayor. Okay, the next item um, is from our 2020 Council City Council Annual Strategy Meeting. And so we'll start, Mr. Jones, with you. Yes, so uh, thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, because of um, COVID and the, the, the virtual meetings, we thought that it was um, important to um, highlight four areas that came out of the annual strategy meeting um, that you have asked for updates on. So the, the first one we'll, we'll lead off and we will, um, this actually predated the annual strategy meeting. I think it was a January 6th discussion and a strategy session where we discussed um, a framework as we looked at um, violence as a public health crisis. And so we have uh, Sarah Hazel that will kick this off, and I believe she'll have Rebecca Hefner uh, help out. But what's, um, what I really enjoy about this presentation, it's uh, an update from Cure Violence. We will have, I believe, Brent, uh, who is with us, who will uh, WebEx with us to give us an overview. Oh, I see someone waving their hands. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Brent. <laughs> To, to, to give us an overview of how the cure violence model works and how it can help us here in Charlotte. So. Okay, we, we're gonna need some help here. Hey Brent, can you mute until, yeah, there you go. All right, um, I'll get started. So thank you, Mr. Jones. Tonight I'm gonna provide an update to you. I think the last time the city manager shared um, some of this information was at a July meeting, so um, what I'm gonna do is just provide the most recent update about our work to stand up a violence interruption program, which is part of our effort to address violence using a public health lens. Um, and as a reminder, let's see if I can click here. Ah, there we go. Um, as a reminder, um, this effort is rooted in the work that um, not only was started in January um, and predates January even, but um, was worked on in the Safe Communities Committee. Um, back in February, the Safe Communities Committee focused on how to develop a framework that would align with addressing violence through a public health lens and all of these pillars um, do just that. One of the pillars is interrupt violence um, and um, that's what I'm gonna be focusing on today. And then Rebecca Hefner, who will do the next presentation, is gonna focus on some efforts around how we're really using data um, with um, a new data dashboard. And so um, what I'm gonna do is just give you a brief update as to where we are um, with our work with Cure Violence. But um, as Mr. Jones mentioned, we have Brent Decker um, who is joining us and we may have Kobe Williams, he might have had to jump off. Brent Decker is the Chief Program Officer for Cure Violence International um, and we've been working with him since July. So I'm gonna let you know exactly where we are to date but he's gonna get into some of the details and can answer some of the more specific programmatic questions. 
Um, and as a reminder, violence interruption in our focus is about standing up a street outreach program. So outreach workers focus on folks who are most likely to be victims of violence or involved in violent crime. Um, those street outreach workers are trusted members of the community and they work to interrupt violence um, in the area specifically for this focus of this assessment, we're focusing on Beatty's Ford and LaSalle. Um, so these workers will be uh, working in those communities directly to provide alternatives um, and connect folks with resources. So in July, when we started to plan this assessment, um, Cure Violence uh, and the city um, and our partners in the county talked about how we could do a hybrid approach. Typically, it's a completely on the ground assessment, but in our COVID-19 world, we had to develop a hybrid approach where we were doing as much work as we could virtually, um, and they'll still be coming to Charlotte to do an on the ground assessment. So we started in August with work looking at the data we have for the Beatty's Ford and LaSalle area. Um, so after doing a deep dive into city data, CMPD data, as well as some of the, the issues surrounding that data and some of the county health data, um, we're now going to be focusing on September and October meeting with stakeholders, ensuring that the community has an opportunity to learn about cure violence and the work that they do, um, ask questions, get questions answered, and then it will continue with deeper dive stakeholder meetings with some of the key stakeholders and potential folks who can serve as these trusted interrupters in the Babies Ford and LaSalle community. So at the end of this assessment, we're gonna receive a recommendation from Cure Violence, and this recommendation is going to let us know what some of um, our biggest opportunities are and what some of our local challenges will be. Um, it'll also enable us to think through how many interrupters we need and how we can best set up a successful program in this area. Um, this, again, is a collaborative effort with the county uh, as part of our core planning team for this assessment. We have Raynard Washington from Public Health, um, as well as um, representatives from city departments. Lacey Williams is program managing, putting this assessment together. We've had support. Um, from many others, from CMPD and um, Rebecca Hefner as well. So I think um, two, uh, one other thing that I would mention is that um, we're gonna have a larger update with you all about our efforts around standing up a hospital-based violence intervention program. Mr. Jones mentioned that too in July. We're not gonna focus on that today, but these programs do work together. And as part of the assessment, uh, Cure Violence will be meeting with Atrium, who's our partner in that effort, um, to ensure that these programs are aligned and can have the maximum possible impact. So I just wanted to note that before we jump back into hearing from Cure Violence. Um, so I think um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Brent Decker, um, and I'm gonna drive, Brent, your presentation, um, and you can unmute yourself. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you all for having me this afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Cool. Great. Um, so if we can go to the, you can go right to the next slide, Sarah, that, that's okay. Um, uh, go back one, there we go, yeah. So anyway, I, my name is Brent Decker, and I'm the Chief Program Officer with Cure Violence Global. Uh, I've been with Cure Violence for about 18 years. Uh, my training is also in public health and epidemiology and uh, international development. Um, so our program, this model, uh, was started by a physician who worked at the World Health Organization. And he worked on other epidemics like cholera, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis. And he came back to the US in the mid to, to late 90s when we were seeing, a, like we are right now, a spike in violence. And he really thought about what would the public health lens or the health lens have to offer this issue, because at the time it was you know, a lot of questions about law enforcement, education, uh, employment, all those very serious and important questions, but he was thinking more in the terms of, well, what would public health have to offer this conversation? And it was him and a number of other physicians at the time that really started looking at it and seeing that violence behaved like a contagious disease, that it was an epidemic. And so 20 years ago, this is a new idea, but now I think often we hear, oh, violence is an epidemic or the epidemic of violence. Um, but 20 years ago, it wasn't understood as such. And so we think about the public health approach. You know, we really are saying that violence behaves like a contagious disease. 
And that's just not theoretically, but institutions like the Institute of Medicine, uh, the World Health Organization have actually classified violence as a, a contagious process, meaning that it causes more of itself. Um, and if we look at um, treating violence like an epidemic, we can actually get results on a community level. So it's not just individuals, but community levels, and we'll get to some of the results we've had um, later in the presentation. But for, again, from us and from, from Dr. Slutkin's perspective, that's his name, when he came back to the U.S., this was kind of a new idea. And so from that, we were able to kind of, um, but I'm gonna go through a couple points of it real quick just to kind of describe it. So Sarah, if you can go to the next slide. So we say violence is a contagion, meaning it causes more of itself. It has the same characteristics as other contagions, meaning that there's clustering, there's epidemic waves, there's a mode of transmission, and there are population characteristics. So if you go to the next slide. So you can see um, in the first on your left-hand side of the screen, we see violence clusters like a disease. So on the left-hand side in the top, we have cases of cholera in Bangladesh, and you can kind of see that there's, it's not uniformly across uh, the entire area, but there's actually clusters of hotspots. And, and the, 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 the map right next to it is actually my beautiful city of Chicago with the shootings and homicides. It's, again, you can see kind of this clustering um, effect, right? So it doesn't, it happens in specific hotspots. In terms of it spreading like disease, we also see these epidemic waves. So we can see a couple of events can really kick off a major spike in violence. And we see it following similar waves like influenza and other things. And I mean, now we're all kind of public health experts because of the last couple of months with COVID. But we see, you know, again, we can see the same type of epidemic waves that take place in other um, contagious processes. And I think the, the, most, uh, the most important thing to understand when we're thinking about health, uh, violence as a public health issue is this idea of the transmission, right? And so violence is transmitted through exposure, modeling, social learning, and norms. And if you go to the next slide, Sarah, I mean, this is really a critical thing for us to understand, um, that the mode of transmission in the organ where this takes place is really the brain, right? And it's when people, when humans are observed, when they witness, and when they experience trauma and violence, it, it fundamentally changes the way that we then react to situations. Um, and, and there's a much more high level, um, smarter version of this, but if we can go to the next slide. I think this kind of describes the mode of transmission, right? And so there are, there is a, you know, there are some slides we have with like brain maps and all those other things, but if you just look at something as simple as this, the boss yells at the employee, the employee yells at the significant other, significant um, other yells at the kid, the kid yells at the cat, right? And so this really, I think, demonstrates kind of the contagious process and as simple as these cartoons look and as antiquated as they are, I think it's, it's a strong demonstration of us rethinking violence, right? Because right now, a lot of cities and a lot of people, we think of like bad people who are making bad decisions. But from a health lens and a health public health perspective, there is a specific mode of transmission that we understand that, that, that we see with violence. If you can go to the next slide. And so, you know, once the, once the, the violence has been transmitted, we think about this in terms of behaviors and shifting behaviors, right? And so when we think about um, this idea of how behaviors are formed, it's really through modeling and trial and error. And we can kind of see in this picture, uh, a young person following, you know, presumably some family members, putting their hands behind their back. And, you know, again, this is an unconscious process. And once the behaviors spread, they're maintained through culture and social norms. And so we look at this picture, it's very innocuous, and we understand human behaviors in this sense. But if we go to the next slide, Sarah, this is the exact same process. You see kids about the same age, and we see people throwing up gang signs, holding a gun, um, you know. And again, we say all this to say is we understand kind of the brain functions that are going on that spreads things like this. And we go to the next slide, and I am going quickly. And so we see in a lot of you know, when we see in areas, there's a lot of methods of exposure, either community, media, family, schools, that can affect people who are susceptible, and there can be outcomes in terms of violent events, uh, shootings and killings, as well as addiction, uh, additional victimizations like beatings, things of that nature. And if you go to the next slide, Sarah, and what we see is in a lot of areas that we, we work and live in are from, there's multiple exposures that lead to multiple and multiple events, right? 
And so in understanding things in this nature, if you can go to the next slide, Councillor, I mean, I think there's, there's a bit of a good news in terms of understanding things in terms of uh, the contagious nature of violence is we know in public health how to stop epidemics. And the model that we're working is really three things interrupt transmission, prevent future spread, and change group norms. So you can go to the next slide, sir. In terms of the interrupting the transmission, so this is about having individuals from the community that are trained up, that have a level of credibility uh, with those who are most likely to be involved in violence, that really try and get in front of a violent event. So they have their ears to the street and they can hear when conflicts are brewing and they step in to prevent the initial event from taking place. And they, we train them up in terms of conflict mediation, de-escalation, how to identify and detect potential uh, conflicts. But they kind of step in, this is the interrupter piece of it. And they step in to try and mediate the conflict. Or if an event does take place, try and prevent the retaliation. And so we can get there and do that part of the work. We, we, we can start to slow down the transmission of people responding uh, with violence. We can go to the next slide. So those are the interrupters. And a big part of what they do and I'm sorry, Kobe's supposed to be joining us right now. It's a picture of him with the hat on. Is they're working in communities that they're from and they're trying to identify and detect when conflicts are brewing, who's likely to be involved and use that same credibility to get people to shift some of their thinkings and behaviors around the need to use violence um, to settle disputes. So if you go to the next slide and from a public health perspective, I mean, we think about this at a very granular level where we map out house by house, block by block, person by person, who's in the specific area, who has the best relationships with them, and kind of open up some, some lines of communication so that when people feel like they're either slighted or they hear about people who are about to do something, they would call one of our interrupters so we could intervene and stop something from happening. Or if something does happen, prevent future retaliation. And so again, it uses very um, basic but effective public health methods in terms of the whole kind of mapping out communities and really thinking about who's there, what are some of the historic conflicts, and things of that nature. And so that's just kind of the first part of the interventions, the interruptions. The second part, we go to the next slide, is preventing future transmission. We go to the next slide again, sir. Um, so could you go to, oh, there we go. Um, it's really kind of more, so the interrupters are kind of dealing with the day-to-day -day stuff. The more long-term work is done with outreach workers. We're trying to change the behavior of the highest risk. And this is done through doing kind of monthly risk reduction plans with them, but thinking kind of more of the long term. What, 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 what additional services might be needed? What other support do these individuals perhaps need to kind of get back on a, a more pas a positive kind of track in life? So you can go to the next slide. And so this, you know, really can look like, you know, case management, mentorship, but it's really about linking uh, the highest risk individuals with existing resources. And so many times, the individuals that we work with, you know, have been kicked out of school, kicked out of programs, all the times don't, don't feel like existing resources are for them or they feel welcome there. And so part of the job of the outreach worker in this long-term work is getting people ready to kind of um, participate in, in some existing resources um, to help people either back in school, um, with employment, music, I mean, whatever it might be, but this is the second component of the model, which is the outreach. And the third part, if you want to go to the next slide, is really changing community and group norms around violence. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, go back one, I'm sorry, sir. Um, we try and make a big deal every time there's a shooting or homicide in the community that we're working in. This can take place either in marches, prayer vigils, barbecues, et cetera. But the idea is that this is linked to the interruption and outreach work. It's not just marching after something happens, but it's kind of part of a continuum of engagement that has kind of a more community element to it. Um, and we do things sometimes not only when an event occurs, but we say we went 200 days without a homicide in our area, have a barbecue about it, you know. You go to the next slide, we also, as part of the changing group norms, implement community um, public health, uh, public education campaigns that have, you know, messaging around shootings and killings. Uh, it kind of depends. It's very locally driven. Like the, the pub ed in, in Honduras looks very different than Chicago, than Baltimore, and wherever. But the idea is to have kind of messaging in the target areas um, against shooting to try and get people to kind of rethink some of those things. But again, it kind of piggybacks on the community group norms, the outreach, and the interruption piece. 
So if we go to the next slide, you know, and, and what we really, by doing these, these, this public health approach, we're really trying to re-understand violence, right? And think of, get away from kind of some of the moralism, the bad people, the bad choices, kind of focus in on some of the science, the idea of adverse circumstances, and this notion of transmission, of, this, of exposure, right? Understanding that people are exposed to violence, they're much more likely to be involved in violence. And so if we can lessen the number of exposures in an area, right, in a community, um, you will lessen the probability of more violent events. And, and, and I think from a health lens, um, this is not to take the place of any other, uh, any other kind of sector, but it's like, what can health and public health do to support a larger kind of comprehensive plan? Because this is kind of the day-to-day, -day, at night, in the community with the highest risk, and not thinking of them as like, gangbangers, you know, things of that nature, but thinking of, of, you know, fellow humans that have been exposed, that have been in adverse circumstances and meeting people where they're at in a, in a non-judgmental way with individuals who they trust and respect and therefore would be more likely to listen to and participate in with. Um, and that's where we see some of the successes of this program. So we go to the next slide. I know we don't have a lot of time, but this just to give you a sense of the, of the, the countries that we're operating in, uh, Canada, the U.S., a lot in Latin America, uh, some in Africa. We did a number of projects in the Middle East. And again, it's still a, see, three things interrupting, preventing future spread, and changing group norms. It looks very different in area of work, but like Sarah said, this is a collaborative process. We kind of bring best practices, scientific literature in terms of a health, a public health way of addressing violence, but then we kind of co-create with local actors to make sure it makes sense at the community ground, at the community level on the ground. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Sarah, I mean, there's been a number of independent evaluations of the program. Uh, the first one, we'll go to the next slide, had to do with some of our work in Chicago. And now this is like 10, 12 years ago that Northwestern, which was funded by the Department of Justice, looked at like pre and post intervention, the idea of hot spots in terms of shooting per square mile. And you can kind of see before the program and after the program, we saw in many of the areas where we're a cooling down of violent events. And, and what you see in this is not just pushing it somewhere else, right? It's about cooling down not only the community, but then the surrounding areas. And we saw, we've seen this happen in a lot of the places we've worked that it's not really just pushing people out because we're dealing with the shooters today. It's about changing some of the behaviors so we cool down the number of events. You go to the next slide. Some of the other things they looked at to Chicago was some of the reductions in shootings and hotspots. But if you see here, this idea of reciprocal murder, so retaliatory homicide. And we were able to really shut this down in a lot of areas because of the workers we had. And then once something happened, we were able to kind of prevent those future events from occurring based on that. Next slide. Um, the next evaluation that was done was done in Baltimore. Um, and this was done by John Hopkins, again, funded by Department of um, Justice, I believe, but it looked at, you know, some of the reductions we saw in some of the neighborhoods were up to 43% in terms of shootings and homicides, um, you know, and some of the areas in Baltimore uh, were able to go multiple years um, without a homicide in their community after the, after the program began. Cherry Hills is one of those, which is a, a, a public housing complex in Baltimore. Um, and so again, the evaluation saw that we were able to do uh, attributable to this program and statistically si significant, we were able to see reductions in the areas we were working. We go to the next slide. Um, one of the most recent ones, go back one, is in New York City, John Jay, uh, with money from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and now the city, we were able to see again, some reductions in the areas that we were working in. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can kind of see versus comparison areas. And so a lot of the um, areas saw uh, much more significant reductions uh, where the program was being implemented versus kind of comparison areas. Um, next slide. In terms of internationally, the, the most recent evaluation was done by American uh, University or ASU, switched to ASU, Arizona State University in Trinidad uh, in Tobago. Um, and what we saw there, you can go to the next slide, we saw a very similar thing where we saw reductions. You kind of see this swiggly line at the top. You see once the program started, we started to see almost an immediate drop off um, in the shootings and killings in the communities where we worked. And, and I bring up Trinidad just because, you know, the, the levels of poverty and inequity in Trinidad um, 
are, are much starker than they even are in the U.S. Um, but that's not, to say, I mean, that's to say, and there wasn't a lot of resources. So in Trinidad, we weren't able to plug a lot of people into schools or into jobs, but what we were able to do is to, to, to change the behaviors and thinking around having to respond to everything, you know, with violence or with an AK-47. And, and, and by doing that, even without additional resources, we're able to see pretty um, massive reductions in Trinidad and Tobago in the areas we are working. You go to the next slide. Um, like I mentioned, this has been featured in a lot of major media outlets, but there's been a lot of communities you've worked in that go uh, pretty frequently um, over a year, two years without an incident in their area. Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, which is not too far from y'all, is they're, I think, almost at 300 days in their target area without a homicide right now. I haven't talked to them this week yet, but I know we were up to two, 295 without a homicide in their specific neighborhood. Um, and so, again, this happens um, pretty frequently um, in the areas we're working in because of the type of workers we're doing and how we're engaging those who are involved in violence. Um, go to the next slide. Um, this is just, you know, kind of, it's been featured in some films. Uh, it's featured in a, a lot of books. The Contagion of Violence is something that was put out by the Institute of Medicine. And all of this is available on our website. You can go to the last slide. Um, Thank you very much. This is kind of where our website is. All of the evaluations and all of the information can be found there. So I know I didn't have a lot of time. I just wanted to briefly kind of um, provide an overview of the work that we do. And there's, you know, we've started this assessment uh, process uh, in Charlotte, and there's a number of meetings coming up over the course of the next couple of weeks. And we're hoping to land at some point in October with what our kind of final recommendations would be so that we can hopefully get started and get this. Um, program implemented in Charlotte uh, and start to see some of the reductions that other cities have seen. So thank you very much for having me and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Or Sarah, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. No. Sorry, I'm gonna open it up for questions, Ms. Watlington, followed by the Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, I've got a few questions. Um, so as I think about this approach to violence as public health, I just want to make sure I understand the theory. And then I got a couple questions about the methodology as well. Um, so I think about violence, I'm, and I'm positing this question, correct me um, if I'm thinking about it wrong, but I'm likening it, likening it to a disease that doesn't have a vaccine that can be contracted multiple times, right? There's no herd immunity if you will, just because somebody didn't commit a violent act today doesn't mean that next week they won't do it, right? Um, so when you talk about interrupting transmission and that trauma and that exposure that happens over time, um, how do you, can you talk to me about how you all interrupt amid ongoing social norms in the environment? <laughs> Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, the mute thing's a little hard. So, I mean, we think about it kind of in three phases of work. And when we first start, um, and when we train the staff on, is you're, you're kind of starting at a point where it's like ongoing conflict, right? So there's a lot of things going on. And then we map out, okay, what are the 40 or 50 reasons in this neighborhood where people are shooting and killing each other, right? Um, and then we think about, okay, what are the first five to 10 of those that we can tackle kind of easily? And easily, I mean that like, it's not like a drug hit by a cartel boss in Columbia calling you. That's much more difficult than there's an ongoing beef between these two cliques who you know, don't like each other for some reason they don't really understand. And so we, we start on some of those things. What we want to get is we try and get the groups from like ongoing conflict in the area to being on the defense, right? So that they're, that it's it's, we're getting people to stand down a little bit, you know what I mean? And then from there, getting people then to be, have some sort of some sort of coexistence with an infrastructure set up that if something kicks off, they, they, they know who to call to not feel like they have to go be violent on something. And so in, in terms of the way that the model works, it's like it's, you know, most public health, you know, there isn't, you know, there isn't a vaccine. It's mostly like behavior change stuff and dealing with stuff. And you think about Ebola, cholera, and other things, it's like, it's this constant kind of idea of doing the behavior change, which is, you know, the majority of the work to help to try and mediate, uh, to help to 
mitigate some of the risk factors associated with violence. And so I, I think it starts off often, it's very complicated, but that's where we train the staff on like really mapping out what are the major conflicts we can try and address. Um, and like I said, we can get it always down to zero, right? But we can see significant reductions, even if we think about the first five to 10 easy things on the table to try and get off, right? And the way that that's done, again, is by having credible workers from the community who have the relationships, but then are trained up in terms of some of the more systematized ways of doing this and thinking this through. So, I mean, it, it can be complicated in the beginning, but once we start to see, um, once individuals and groups start to see that there can be something different going on and they start to buy into the mediation process, which can take some time, a new norm kind of emerges, right? So my first reaction might not be I'd get a gun and go down the road and shoot at someone. That might be my third or fourth option, but if we can get some, some other kind of norms uh, inserted back into the community, um, we tend to see these reductions. And in terms of like sustainability, I mean, we really think cities like New York and others that invest, like this becomes a part of the way that the city does business in that there is uh, a budgetary line item ongoing to do the kind of health approach to keep um, the violence uh, down over time. That you, you mentioned something that tied into one so of the- So I hope I answered your question. You mentioned something that tied into one of the other, one of the fundamental questions that I have, and it's about sustainability, um, particularly because I haven't heard, and I know we, you've just given us the overview, but I'd be interested to understand how, from um, uh, even a mental health standpoint, talk about coping mechanisms and things of that nature, how we're actually, or what the plan is to fundamentally change how um, the individuals think about conflict um, because I noticed in the Trinidad example and I would imagine that based on your comments that this would be an ongoing thing that if this program was to end in some way that we would see an increase back in the um, in the violence so I'm just I really would like to understand a little bit more from a sustainability standpoint about sure. how you're impacting folks on that level um, the yeah. other I mean I, I Sure, and I think what the plan is here is to do this in one or two areas to see how it works um, in Charlotte. But I think the sustainability plan is, I mean, it, if we think about uh, the investment made in a project like this is, you know, fractional of what the healthcare and uh, other costs associated with violence potentially could be. And so um, I think in terms of its sustainability, I mean, I think if it works and we see the type of reductions that we've seen in other cities, it gets adopted. So New York, for example, and I'm using New York because I think they've done this in the most comprehensive way. It started in one or two uh, communities with federal dollars. Um, it's now part of the mayor's kind of crisis management system that it does this, it does some reentry work, it does a couple things as part of its, of its annual mayor's budget um, because they see that the investment in this work really is minimal compared to some of the costs associated with high levels of violence. And so I think from our perspective, step one is doing the assessment, step two is implementing this in one or two neighborhoods and seeing the effectiveness of it locally. And then three, really thinking about the city, potentially if this is successful, adopting this um, in terms of maybe perhaps even a citywide programming of it you know, if we can have the types of impacts required. But yeah, something like this does cost money, like in public health a lot, you know, there are costs associated with it, but I think it's really uh, minimal compared to the cost of gun violence. Yeah, my question's not so much about the cost, it's about the sustainability of the outcomes. Um, but you, you've spoken on that, so I appreciate that. I did have a question and you hit on it a little bit here when you talked about external factors, particularly to the Johns Hopkins study. Um, or to any of the ones that you uh, alluded to in terms of attributing violence reduction to cure violence, were there any other external factors or um, dare I say competing factors that were highlighted in these studies? Like are we sure that the smoking bullet, if you will, is cure violence? Or how does that work in concert with some other things? What else has to be true? Yeah. So um, what I was demonstrating is what, what the independent evaluators, evaluators thought could solely be attributed to our intervention. Mm -hmm. So in, in some say, it's so I, I don't want to get the wrong impression. We are not like the solution, right? I'll say that again. I think what we're 
where where the public health model can be is if it's part of a comprehensive thing. So law enforcement has a role, right? Education has a role. Um, employment has a role. I mean, just listening to the conversation before we started in terms of, you know, there's a lot going on. What, what the cure violence approach, as if it's part of a comprehensive thing, is a very specific lane, right? In dealing and working with those are at highest risk to be involved in violence today. Right, and so what we saw in those evaluations is those are the percentages that people smarter than me <laughs> statistically were able to show were attributable because our program was there. So in some cities and in some places you have, you can see reductions even greater, law enforcement might be doing a part, your balance is doing a part, you know, there might be some education stuff, there might be other programs running, but the evaluations that we, that I was describing, that's what they're solely attributing to um, our program without other confounding or competing factors. Um, and so in a best case scenario, and what would be great to build towards is that, that this program is in concert with other efforts. Right. Um, but the, again, this has a very specific kind of um, target population and a very specific role and in that we wanna work with the highest risk that we wanna work with those who are actively involved in killing and shooting today to try and prevent future smoke. Right. Um, and in terms of some of the mental health stuff, I mean, I think when we... When well, one we, moment before you before you continue, Brent, real quick. pure expectation... Brent. Can you hear me? One moment before you say that. central to before, what drives human behavior. Excuse me, before you move on, how we can dress, you hear me? Or am I on mute? Um, you know, tattoo, whatever, and, and part Brent. of the training and part of the conversation we really work in is like this idea of people acting in a way because their friends <laughs> think it's cool, right? And so we really work on that and try and shift some of the group norms around so I can still be cool even though I reach out to an interrupter instead of doing so. You know, and, and, and I don't and I, I, I don't want to overstate this, but this idea of peer expectation drives most human behaviors. And, and this is central to kind of a public health understanding, and that's what we really use <laughs> to do intervention. Um, and, and, and I'm not, and I, I, the issues of equity and some of the um, kind of structural issues for sure are there. And, and public health, I, you know, from a public health lens, I don't think anyone would negate any of that. That's all very important. Uh, and our issues that need to be addressed. What we're proposing as part of this for addressing violence today is kind of working on some of these peer expectation group norms and working directly with those who are involved in violence to help shift some of their behavior today. So that's kind of what we know in terms of some of the psychology and larger traumas, these are all critical things. Um, but really getting into some of these peer expectations and shifting um, people's norms in spite of some of that, uh, we've been able to see these reductions and they've been maintained. Brent, this is by, you have a lot of questions, so we're gonna try to make sure. Ms. Watlington, do you have another question? Um, yep, but I will say, I wanted to piggyback on, Sammy, you uh, oh. You have another question from Ms. Watlington. And um, Mr. Winston, do I see your hand up? Got it. All right, Ms. Watlington. Hold on, I think Ms. Jackson's got something. It's not They're both talking at the same time. It, it messes it up, and that's why we keep having the mute. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to highlight something that Brent said for my colleagues and for staff. Um, in particular, I, I want to make sure that as I want to see this successful, and so if there are things, even from an intergovernmental standpoint, especially as we look to put our, um, legisl or our agenda together, is that if there are other factors that make this successful, I just don't want us to do cure violence in a vacuum. And I don't think that's our approach, but I just want to highlight that we're real clear with our partners um, what other things need to be true based on what uh, Brent said. The other, uh, I've got a couple more questions. Um, from a methodology standpoint, you talked about violence not being moved elsewhere. Can you help put some color around that, if you will, because it seems that the program in some ways is place-based versus necessarily the people-based. Um, how, how are you all assessing whether or not that, that uptick may be going somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, this, this is what some of the independent evaluations kind of showed us. I mean, I think, from, but from our perspective is, we're trying to engage those who are involved in the violence like today and their conflicts aren't necessarily going somewhere else, right? 
And so, in, 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 and I'm glad uh, Ricardo Williams joined us, who's the director of national programs, so he can uh, answer some of these questions as well. But if we think about a community, right, a target area, um, it's comprised of individuals. And part of our mapping out is, okay, who in the neighborhood is involved in violence? Right? And by engaging them and working with them to kind of change some of their thinking around having to respond with violence, it's either conflicts or whatever, you know, okay, don't do it here, go do it somewhere else. You know, it's really about engaging those individuals who are involved in stuff. And we think about part of our training is anything that affects the target area is the target area. So we really, you know, strategize around that. But I think if we really engage the highest risk who are involved in the violence, the ask isn't not to do it here. The ask is to not to do it or mitigate it or do it less. And so that's how we see it doesn't kind of, they're not like, okay, we're cool, we're gonna go over here and do it, and we're okay with that. It's really about engaging those who are involved in it. So I think that's really the critical piece of why it doesn't kind of spread over. And the other part of that too, is that once you shift some of the group norms, the community norms around the acceptability of using violence, this issue of peer expectation looks in a little bit, right? And so it's not just, okay, all of a sudden I'm gonna do this, if we already know the norm, you know, is, you know, instead of doing something, let me talk to an outreach worker, and call an interrupter or let me mediate the situation on my own, right? And so that those are all kind of steps and milestones along the way that we kind of work. And so I think that that's why it doesn't just spread it somewhere else. It's not like we're just putting up like a, a camera and be like, don't do it here. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, this is the community we're working at, who are the people who are there? How do we engage them so they can stop doing this or do this less and not just do it somewhere else? Got it. Um, two, two more things. The second one, I just want to make sure when you talk about the target market, you talk about folks that are high risk, true or false, cure violence is, is focused on, um, like you said, reciprocal violence versus maybe first time folks. I'm trying to get an understanding of if you all are able to assess who might be more likely to commit a violent act or if you're going based off how do we prevent something once an initial act is taken. I don't know what to say true or false to, but we essentially are working with those who are involved or likely to be involved. And the way that we assess that, maybe Kobe can speak to this, Ricardo can speak to this, is when we really have individuals um, from the community involved, workers they know involved in what and what's going on. And so it's not only really just once something happens, but we know generally what's going on. So Kobe, I don't know if you want to talk for one second just about right. something. So um, the, the people who we target is the people who who, who in that lifestyle right now, who's, who's perpetrating the violence, who's doing the shooting and who's doing the killing, who making the choices. And we ain't saying they bad choices because we meet people where they are. We don't look at people as good and bad people. We don't judge nobody. So we dealing with the people who have risk. I was one of them persons before I came an interrupter, before I came an outreach worker. I was high risk when the program found me. I was out there game bag is part of the problem, doing everything under the sun. But when you target these guys, when I say target, it's all about the relationship. It's somebody who had relationships that reached out to me and like, man, Kobe, you could do something else. So once they show, show me I could do something else and knowing I had influence in the community, it helped me change my thinking. So when people saw that I changed, other people in my communities on the south side of Chicago and Inglewood start making that change themselves. So it's all about the relationships people have with people. So it sounds like you're not just focused on reciprocal violence then. And so then my last question um, goes to the idea of economic incentive, right? Um, so part of it is about giving people coping skills and that kind of thing. But another part, when you talked about the lifestyle, um, just from an economic incentive standpoint, if, for instance, I have barriers to employment or I can go work a minimum wage job or I can go sling dope and make a lot more money in a shorter amount of time, right? How, how have you seen uh, economic or workforce development programs um, support cure violence work. Right, right. So what, what I say to that, everybody know jobs is important, George, right? A job could help a person change their life and all that, but jobs don't fix everything. Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people right now, brothers and sisters in the community right now, it, they got jobs, if they had a job, they don't fix that. So folks, you have to change on their mindset, change on, to focus on their behavior. Because I know a lot of people do a nine to five, then on the block, they back in the streets. 
So what we focus on changing their mindset, changing their behavior, and showing them other ways. You got to change their thinking, though. We got to make sure their days are matching up with their nights. Jobs do not fix everything. What fix things is people mindset. They thinking, that's what helps fix things. Jobs is important though. I know a lot of people right now offer them jobs and opportunities. They don't want to do that. They used to being on the block, so they stay out there on the block. A job is important. I saw a lot of people change with jobs, but it just don't change everybody. But changing their thinking and their mindset is most important though. <laughs> I think one of the things just, I mean, one of the things where we have good partnerships is once we have individuals who are ready to do that, making that referral can work very effectively. But I think what Kobe's getting to is if you're dealing with the highest, highest risk, it's it's often not just, okay, you want a job today. I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that has to kind of go in uh, to getting people kind of really ready to do something different. All right, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the... Uh, my colleagues did a very good job asking a lot of technical questions, so I'll kind of keep it real basic. What does the assessment on the ground look like? I know you've already done your virtual assessment. When So when you come down on Bates Fort Road and the, the South Street, what is that on the ground assessment going to look like? Yeah, so it, it's taking place in a, in, a, in a number of phases. And so the first phase, we're, we're kind of looking at um, some of the data to, to make sure that the type of violence that's taking place in Charlotte is, even fits our way, right? Meaning that, you know, is this something that we've seen in other places that we can be helpful to? The second kind of set of presentations will be to kind of, I think there'll be, there's a meeting with governmental officials where we kind of present this model, there's gonna be with some like community-based organizations that might be doing this. There'll be some with other service providers, there'll be some with the hospital. We're trying to kind of like generate some conversation around uh, this approach, what people kind of think about it and, and really land on where would the area be that we would work, which I think we have sorted out. But two, a lot of the on the ground stuff is figuring out what community groups and what individuals could serve as partners and the interrupters and outreach workers. And so what that's gonna look like, there's kind of meetings where we present stuff, there's a lot of dialogue, but then when we come, so Kobe and his team is gonna go out in the neighborhood uh, with individuals who we kind of identify during this process, you know, speak directly to those who are involved and kind of present the idea and try and find um, the right individuals who can serve as interrupters and outreach workers. So there's a series of meetings there's, that happen both kind of Zoom, there's official meetings, but then there's also a lot of kind of community-based meetings that take place, um, you know, at night with smaller groups to really get a sense of kind of what's going on. Because we, again, we, we have some partners in Greensboro and Durham and others who, who, who know people as well uh, in Charlotte. So trying to kind of link all that together. And so, Again, we're meeting with kind of various levels of stakeholders looking at the data. And at the end, we'd say, okay, you know, does the data exist that can really help us to identify where these clusters are? Yes or no? We, we believe that to be true already. And I think you all are going to see some of the data sets after this, not specifically to ours, but just generally. Is there is there some sort of pattern in terms of some population characteristics of who's involved? Yes. If we're thinking about these communities where we're in, how do we then, or we're thinking about doing this, how do we then find the right groups and individuals? And so that's really gonna be the second phase of conversation, which we'll be doing, I believe in October, or, um, to be on the ground. But at the end of the day, through these conversations, through these meetings, we wanna be able to present back, here's the areas we think it would make sense. Here are the number of workers given the groups and dynamics. Here are some of the community groups that we think could work or couldn't work. And here are some of the individuals or a recruitment strategy we recommend to get people on board. That, that, that was a very uh, uh, good response. I, I really want to know how you're going to link up uh, with local activists that's actually on the ground here in Charlotte doing your work, like like a Robert Daw Dawkins and Safe Alliance who's out there on the ground um, actually going through these neighborhoods uh, and communities. Um, so and I can... Also um, Councilman Graham, just let me um, add to what you just asked. Um, we have gone through a process of working with uh, c community members and folks like Robert Dawkins to build the list that are getting invitations as well as um, invitations going out door to door um, to make sure that we're really um, being as comprehensive as possible. So um, 
you know, cure violence is really counting on us as a city and our county collaborative partners as well as our community stakeholders who are very interested in this and who have had contact with cure violence in the past to build out those lists to get them started. That, that, that's extremely important. Yep. I, I got you. Good deal, good deal. So what does non-police crisis assistance look like as it relates to cure violence? Crisis intervention teams and how is, is there a relationship there or? So, can, so I think that question, I, maybe Brent is the best person to answer what he's seen on the ground in other places. Okay, okay. So, sorry, you're cutting out. I didn't hear the question. I apologize. No, I was just asking whether or not there's a correlation between non-police crisis intervention teams or is there a, I, I think um, Councilman Wallington is right, there has to be more than just one thing happening, right? There has to be almost like a buffet line of, of situations occurring at the same time. The city working with, with the county in terms of the, the wraparound service, in terms of the mental health, housing, substance abuse, the cure violence is doing, and also this, what I would call this crisis intervention team. So when someone calls 911, and it's not really a criminal matter, but there's someone on the other side, whether it's a 311, Mr. Manager, uh, working with. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Brian. I can't even hear myself either. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> but in many cities we work, that is the goal and the objective. I, I think we're, we're starting in that process, but a place like New York has something called the crisis management system that kind of coordinates all those efforts in the priority areas that they're working in. And so that's part of the conversations we'll be having with with um, Sarah, as we're thinking about how does this get positioned best at a county city level? What are some of the other organizations or institutions that are also working in this particular area that we're thinking about? And then what existing coalitions or service provider coalitions are there or governmental institutions to think about how can we bo both uh, and better kind of coordinate and support each other, uh, particularly as it comes to uh, the target population of this particular intervention. So yeah, that would be the, the goal and objective as this starts to build. Well, I, I, I look forward to the, the, to the partnership, Mr. Manager. I, I think it's a combination of interrupting the violence, building community capacity, and, and helping people in crisis. So, so Mr. Graham, um, I, I totally agree with you. And while cure violence is something that we've been tracking down for a number of years, it's just a small piece of the framework. So the framework, which came out of the Safe Communities Committee, has an infrastructure in place that addresses much of what you've said. Yes, sir. And, and I'll say the County Health Department uh, um, is still going to be working on a comprehensive violence reduction strategy with the city manager and the county manager as part of the steering team related to that effort. So this is one piece that folds under that larger effort um, with the idea that these things should and have to all work together and that's what a public health approach really is. And, and I, I just want to kind of say this for the public, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint, right? So we're going to have to be, as Councilman Wallington said, really consistent uh, and doing this, um, and and it's, again, it's not the cost, right? It's just the having the stamina to stick with it uh, and stick through it. And so that's that's my commentary for tonight. All right, Mr. Winston. Um, real quick before Mr. Winston, Brent, would you do me a favor and just turn your speakers down? Just a request to make sure that um, that we don't get a lot of feedback. Okay, thanks. So I think Ms. Watlington asked this in one kind of way, but um, uh, this question is um, to Mr. Decker, but really to, um, to Mr. Jones, uh, city manager. Um, you know, as we are learning with epidemics, uh, this isn't something you can ever stop addressing um, or, you, or something you can stop uh, pre preparing to intercept. Um, how would the city of Charlotte envelop the violence interrupter model into a praxis that is seen as a municipal service um, and not just something that, you know, um, a, a program that we implement um, when things get really bad. So, so thank you, Mr. Winston. I believe it goes back to, to that framework because this is an element of it 
But I think if we race to the end, if this pilot works here in Charlotte, the concept would be what other areas would we do replicate this in also, and then it just becomes an ongoing part of the budget. Would this live in a department? Would this live in, um, we, we talk about this from a public health um, model, um, that's something that the county uh, administers. So how would we uh, uh, guarantee, it, assuming that this works in Charlotte, um, how, how would we implement this? Uh, where would this go? Um, and you know, how do we make sure that uh, we're not reliant because we don't have a consolidated form of government um, we can't tell the, the county um, um, how to do anything about their business. Um, how do we enter into this with the end goal um, of, of providing municipal services that are needed but don't exist right now? Sure. So I think it's twofold. One is, um, for the most part, we realize that to do a violence interrupter, we don't want it to reside in the police department. But in different jurisdictions, it could be in social services or a health department or even in an office that the, the jurisdiction has created. I would say what's important is we have a great partnership with the county on this right now, especially the relationship with the, the two managers where we will both fund this. But even without that, the city council had already decided to move forward. So I don't think it's as much of a reliance on somebody else to do the violence interrupter. It's great to have partnerships, but for the most part, it's those individuals in the community that are going to be um, the ambassadors, for, for lack of a, a better word, but the folks that are out there actually doing the work. So in essence, by allowing us to move forward, you have allowed us to, um, make this more, more long-term based on the success. And I would just, I would just add, I mean, I, different cities position it in different places. So sometimes it's in the health department, uh, other places it's in the mayor's office of criminal justice, just kind of depends what makes sense locally. But, but I agree. I mean, the idea is we're not, we, we're, we're not interested in just doing a program. You know, I, you know, I, I think we're really interested in hopefully um, being able to provide training and the example on one level where this could really, uh, if it works, and I know it does work, but if it works locally, you know, be part of kind of the way that Charlotte thinks about um, addressing this issue. And, and like we see in COVID, it's not just, here's a program, here's a program, here's a program, but how can we build these institutions and systems in a way that are more kind of health and community focused that can be helpful in terms of the long term. And so finding exactly where it lands, I, I don't have an answer for that. I think there's a lot of kind of local things that need to be figured out, but I think the idea of having this be institutionalized in a department as part of a regular budget, you know, of course, if it works, I think is, is, is really the objective of some of this and to do it um, in a broader scale, you know what I mean? Not just one or two neighborhoods, but try and have it be in, in all the, uh, the hot spots to be able to really reduce the levels at a citywide. I, I agree, and that's why, I, as we go into this, um, um, I, you know, we we can't write the ending at the very beginning, uh, but we should have goals and aspirations. And, and, and I would hope that our goal and aspiration um, would to be as as you as you say this, as you said it, uh, Mr. Decker. Um, uh, how do we institutionalize um, and, and 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 systematically implement this into our municipal service models? Thank you. I agree. This is a great uh, approach. Um, this, this will work because it's a systemic approach and advocacy matters. So they mentioned things like trauma-informed um, approach and cog this is what I heard, cognitive behavioral therapy and peer mentoring um, and all of these evidence-based approaches that will work in addressing violence. My question is, because these are models, have we issued um, RFPs for other organizations to administer this program? Because if we're going, if, if Cure Violence is going to be working with community organizations, 
there are community organizations that already have relationships in the community. Um, they may also have a 501c3, and they could also administer these type of models. So um, are, are we looking at, at opening this up for organizations that already exist here in Charlotte to bring these approach um, I to, can, to the table? I can speak. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Jones. It's, so thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yes. The, um, I believe in the Greens, well, I won't say that. So yes, there are opportunities to have a 501c3 that could be um, the implementer. However, just because you have a 501c3 status doesn't necessarily mean that you may be the best to achieve the results. I thought you were asking whether or not we we're gonna open this up to another entity other than Cure Violence, which we didn't. Um, we could have tried any other violence interrupter, but because there was so much um, evidence and such a, a strong push behind Cure Violence, we, this model, we thought that this is the right way to go today, and we did not RFP this, this piece of it. And, and one thing I would say is that this is the piece that we're currently engaged with Cure Violence on is an assessment. Um, so from that assessment, they provide recommendations and then any further engagement um, at a larger scale. Cure Violence would never come in and just run our program for us. Their work is all about helping at a local level set up the right uh, structure and the right systems and the evidence-based <coughs> model so that at the local contact, con at the local um, level, whether it's a city department or city department working with a community-based organization, it can actually go successfully. So their their role isn't to, to kind of set up shop and, um, and do the work. It's to make sure that we have the right players and um, organization in place to get that work done and to assist us in doing that both first from an assessment level and then potentially next um, in actually getting the system set up. Huh? Well, no, I would just, I would, I mean, I would just say that there may be local organizations who, who are capable of doing the same type of work because these are, these are models. These are evidence-based models. When you talk about peer mentoring and cognitive behavioral therapy changes, the thinking and, uh, you know, community case management. So these are, these are approaches that there might be someone um, locally that could, could do the work. That would just be my suggestion. That, thank you. Okay, Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, Mr. Manager, you mentioned that if this works in uh, one corridor, we can implement this in other parts of our city. Uh, so, what would that, I guess, when we say if it works, would there be sort of um, metrics that we are looking at that within certain time frame, here are certain criteria that has to be met in order for this program to say that it works? Yes, and, and Sarah or, or Brent can correct me if I'm wrong. We chose um, Bates Ford Road because we believe there's an infrastructure that's there that could make this successful coming out of the gate. Um, we would have loved to be at I-85 and Sugar Creek. That's really where we started the discussion. But um, it didn't have the same level of infrastructure in place. And my understanding is, and which you'll see a little bit this later, is that uh, Brent and Company were impressed with the data and how we collect data. So it may give us an opportunity to launch this maybe faster or with a better success rate than maybe some others. So it, once we get through this one, the concept would be what other um, priority areas or corridors of opportunity that we could replicate in there too. I, I understand that. I guess, does anyone respond? 
I mean, part of, from, from our perspective, I mean, some of the indicators that we saw on a really um, great database that you all have locally, I mean, you'd want to look at number of shootings, number of homicides, there's a number of, there's a number of the indicators that we would be looking at to move. And so we would look at kind of pre and post, we could look at comparison areas and city as, as a whole, and what we're going to want to see and what we, you know, what we put our kind of name on the line about. You know, is that everyone kind of does the protocols? We should see reductions of shootings, homicides, and other violent events in the areas we're working in that are more than other comparison areas and more than a city as a whole. And so, I mean, that's really what we're we're talking about is you know reducing the number of violent events within this community. And so that's shootings, killings, and there's a couple other um, classifications that I believe you all have locally. But that's the, the needle we're trying to move around those. And so for us to be a success is, is really to, to see violent incidents decreasing uh, in the areas that we're working in. So a follow-up question to that. Okay, a follow-up question to that. So I, I hear what you're saying is sort of like before and after. Uh, if we see certain trend going down, uh, that we can say this pro program works. Uh, I guess what is the time frame that you're looking at in order for us to really have uh, a good view of the data? So we typically start to see results um, within the first six months. Um, and what we'll start to see is we do everything right, we'll start to see some, um, some stretches of uh, um, streaks, we call them, where there aren't any shootings or homicides in the area. And we will hopefully look, and I believe you all have the data very well organized on a quarterly basis. And so we're hoping within year one, and this is very consistent to some of the areas we've worked in, is if within year one, we should see a pretty significant reduction. Um, you know, uh, and we, we will project that um, after we do the assessment, but we're, this is not like, a six year, you know, we were hoping to see some uh, pretty um, stark reductions within year one. And then I think it becomes about then how do we maintain those reductions and further reduce them over time. And so like a place like Luisa in Puerto Rico, what we saw in year one was a 50% reduction. Year two, we saw a 50% reduction from there. And then years three and four, we kind of maintained the line, right? And so we kept the violence below a certain level. And actually, they lost some funding, but because they had had a couple of years of intervention there, the shootings and homicides, even to this day, never went all the way back up. You know what I mean? And so we're, we're hoping to see, and if we do everything like other cities have done, we can see uh, results within this first year, likely within six months, um, and then over time. I understand. So the commitment that we, we will make uh, it's so cure violence will play a consultant role. Uh, is that correct? So will help us with the data, the analysis, and metrics, and so on. Uh, so what is the commitment upfront in terms of the time frame? Um, so, so right now we're just talking about the assessment piece. We usually do a year-long engagement, if not longer. I mean, it just kind of depends on what the local. Um, funding cycles are. And so I think this one is for a year, 18 months. Sarah, please correct me if I'm wrong. I apologize for that in front of me. Our, I mean, our city budget is annual, if that's what you're asking. Yes, yeah, so my understanding, the assessment is roughly $10,000. And then after the end of the assessment, um, we as a city can make a decision, a community can make a decision about how far we'd like to go with this, as well as um, how we would like to employ, let's say, cure violence. My understanding is that sometimes cities have not been that successful with this when they've done something less than totally going through. Right. So I'd like to caution us. I think we should get to the assessment first before we start thinking about whether or not to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's all we're doing right now is an, an assessment. Fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think uh, this is a really good evidence-based model. As, um, and they have certainly seen successes from the data in other parts, uh, I mean, around the world. So I, 
I'm really looking forward to seeing how this will actually produce uh, the results that we want to see. Thank you. So I think Mr. Jones said it well. He says that this has got to be one of those that you decide you're all in. Mm -hmm. So if you're not all in and you think that there is another way to do it, at the end of this assessment, I think, and choose the other people that you'd like to come in, that you'd like to have review. We want to be fair about it. But at the same time, I think that this is one of those things that we've been working on since we started working with um, John Hopkins. There are just a few of these that are having the successes across the country and in other places. But I think that is a fair statement to look at your own community and decide what's right for it. So if there is going to be after this assessment an opportunity that you think that there's another way to do it, we need to get that brought forward and do it quickly. Because as you know, we, I think we're up to 84 homicides right now. And I don't know that you can measure in money the loss of a life. So with that, I think we're gonna now have Rebecca come out and talk to us about um, the dashboard for the um, violence interruption or violence prevention. Is that correct, Mr. Jones? Y yes, Mayor. I know that I believe that um, Rebecca did a brief uh, presentation of the budget and effectiveness committee. It's actually in the committee report. Okay. Well. okay. Comment on it there, but, okay. Do you want to? But do you want to introduce it now, Mr. Driggs? And uh, I guess I could do that. Seems like a good place Rebecca to call. Rebecca comes on. Um, so one of the items in our agenda on August uh, 18th in the Budget and Effectiveness Committee was to hear about uh, Rebecca's work on the violence prevention data matrix and public scorecard. Um, basically, we, we got a view of the kind of work that has been done to uh, develop data around violence and to convert that data into a, an actionable and accessible form. So um, that will involve, as uh, Rebecca will tell us, a, uh, a, a framework and a scorecard um, that others can use for reference. Uh, in the committee, we talked about the advisability of establishing an interagency data sharing team, the Violence Prevention Data Collaborative. Um, we also talked about publishing a violence data dashboard, which I think is where you're going with this, to publicly share violence-related information and three, build capacity for grassroots organizations to measure results of their work. So uh, clearly this ties in to what we've just been hearing and I'm sure it will inform a lot of the work of Cure Violence. Uh, Rebecca, I want to tell you, fabulous job. Uh, so uh, I think this will be a useful tool. Mr. Manager, the one thing that I questioned in committee is um, I want to see us pull together the data that we're getting and the plan that we have for our evidence-based and data-driven uh, violence reduction. So last year we adopted a policy that said we were going to use data in order to improve our performance. I think Cure Violence is probably part of that, but uh, this is one piece of an action plan and we need to see how it fits. Yeah. But that, that's just what I would comment on from committee. Uh, Rebecca, I guess over to you. Thank you and good evening. It's really wonderful to see you all in person. Um, I just, no. Just one moment while we get queued up here. Now I'll just say while we're getting the presentation going, um, you know, listening to you say data, metrics, methodology, evaluation, evidence-based. As your data and analytics officer, these are the words that give me chills. I wasn't even gonna wear my sweater tonight, but I thought, woo, this is, this is good stuff, okay? So it, it is, of course, a, a serious topic, um, but, um, but, you know, love, love to hear this conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just start briefly um, because the, the presentation itself, um, I, can, I can do some of that without the slides and just uh, get to the dashboard when we can get it queued up. 
Um, but I would, would start by saying again, the, the use of data and evidence is a piece of um, the framework around violence reduction, um, that it's the, the use of that broadly. So the collection of data and the sharing of data is a really important foundational component of that. Um, one of the things I like to say is that shared data leads to shared solutions. And so it, it, when we say as a public health approach that this is an issue that we need to work through collaboratively, um, sharing data about the violence in our communities, what's happening, where, uh, and, and what's, what's the context around that is a really important foundational component. Uh, right, let's see if, oh, oh we almost had it. I'll just say, you know, to reiterate uh, Mr. Drake's comments, um, there, there are three uh, actions we're taking right now as part of this piece, the use data and evidence piece of the violence reduction framework. Um, we are working with partner agencies. Oh. We're working with par partner agencies in the um, Violence Reduction Data Collaborative. So this is a work team that's being co-chaired by myself and Donna Smith from the Public Health Department. Uh, we have engaged county um, agencies, uh, community support services, criminal justice services, as well as CMPD, Adrian Health, CMS and um, a couple of uh, universities, Johnson C. Smith University and UNC Charlotte are engaged. Um, okay. Can you advance the slides, please? Okay. Oh, no, that's right. So this is not my presentation. Thank you. I'll, um, so the, the, the data collaborative is a piece of it, and then um, the uh, community violence data dashboard, which I'm hopefully going to show you tonight, is a piece of it. Um, I've been waiting a really long time to show this to you. <laughs> I mean, a really long time. So, uh, I mean, if I, have to, if I have to get out my markers and draw what it looks like for you, I might just do that. Um, and then the last, the last piece that we're working on is uh, helping uh, organizations, particularly those that have received Jump Start uh, funding, in helping them to uh, describe and evaluate the impact of their program. So building the capacity uh, for the use of data and evidence, not just for our own agencies and with our partners, but uh, with those grassroots organizations in the community. Uh, the the uh, Community Violence Data Dashboard, I'll give you the context of that, is um, it is, well, first of all, this is a big deal. We've been working on it for a long time. Um, oh, look at this. Hold on. Okay. So this, Mr. Eggleston, is my presentation. It looks very familiar. Let's see if I can get presenter access and we'll roll right right through the slides and get you to the. <laughs> I think we've got it now, Mr. Jones. Click on there. All right, you know what we're gonna do? We're, oh, look at that, thank you. Okay. Oh, I mean. This, this just makes the presentation go so quickly, right? Let's just fly through the slides. All right, so this is a little bit of what I wanna share with you before I get to the good stuff, which is the dashboard itself. So uh, the, the context of the dashboard, um, really we're looking at um, violence as a public health issue. So we have a lot of context and framing around the public health issue. It's a work in progress. I mentioned our partners. Currently the dashboard includes um, two, uh, two, two pieces. One is violent crime offenses and the other is demographic information for victims and offenders. And um, 
But we're working very closely with that violence prevention data collaborative group to build this out because this is a tool that is most useful when we're looking at the issue of violence comprehensively. So we are um, including information on social determinants of health. Right now the dashboard is linked to the quality of life explorer so you can see some of that information already related to poverty and education and employment um, and many of the other factors that in Im impact violence, um, but we're also working with our partners to add information on um, exposure to violence and youth violence, intimate partner violence, emergency department visits. So all of the things that you heard um, Mr. Decker talking about in terms of framing violence as a public health issue, we're working on building this out. Um, so best uses for the dashboard, um, you know, not everybody gets excited about data just because it looks really cool on a dashboard the way that I do. I know that you all want to be able to put this data to work. Um, so th the purpose of bringing data together in this way is really help our partners and, and you all collaboratively plan, implement, and then also evaluate violence prevention efforts. You talk about what metrics should you see change over time. You can see those in the dashboard. Um, you can monitor violence-related behaviors, injuries, and deaths. Uh, it helps people frame research uh, around factors that pe put people at risk of violence. And then also to promote the adoption of violence prevention strategies and those evidence-based practices. Working together, you can see what, where some of the gaps are. And so, without further technical difficulties, I hope, I would like to show you what we've got. Now, let me do, I'm gonna follow, try to follow the instructions. I'm not really, um, I'm not usually so compliant, but I think this will do the trick. All right, so again, this is a significant partnership with Mecklenburg County. Um, n not, not just in implementing the programs, but in planning for what's needed in the community, um, in the, the health department in particular, um, Donna Smith in the epidemiology division has been uh, so helpful in helping us put this together and think through it. And I will take just a moment to tell you, it really does, I've said this before, take a village to raise a dashboard. So I wanna do really quick thank yous to um, Monica Wen and Crime Analysis, Mike Defoe, Andrew Bowen and Bill Majersik, um, on my team and then our partners at the health department, uh, without whom none of this would be published. So there's two ways to explore the data on this dashboard. Um, you can explore by offenses, and all of these data are interactive. They are uh, automated to update monthly. So around the 15th, you'll get an update from the previous month's data uh, that's automatically feeds through to the dashboard. Some of the ways that you can uh, then look at this information, you're able to uh, look at particular geographies. Again, you can see the links to the Quality of Life Explorer are in here. You can switch to year to date, so you can see how we're doing so far, how it compares to trends in the past. You can look by priority area. Um, for example, if you click here on Beatty's Ford Road, you can see uh, the numbers for that particular priority area. And just a note that most of these are the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting um, uh, Part 1 Crime Offense categories. We have one additional data point in here. This is the non-fatal gunshot injury um, that is uh, inclusive of some of the other categories, but it's a really important data point in terms of um, driving programs and interventions and, and understanding um, uh, how we're doing as it relates to programs like Cure Violence. So that's uh, one of the important pieces of information that we have in here. The last piece of the dashboard is the ability to explore by demographics. Uh, again, there is um, the ability to look 
over time, to look at particular priority areas, and it's looking at an overall breakdown of the um, demographics of offenders, violent crime victims, and then the overall demographics in the community. And again, and we've, we've stressed this um, from the very beginning, but understanding the underlying contextual issues, the systemic uh, challenges, and the root causes really is what helps to explain the disparities around these demographic numbers. And so it is important to think about what's happening in that context. Uh, and one of the reasons why we'll continue to build this out with additional information. And um, I think, uh, you know, you, you can explore, cook around, um, learn, learn about what's happening. Um, but I think, you know, I'll, I'll let you all take a look and drive around with this later on. Um, it has been pushed publicly. Um, the links are, are in here um, and can also be sent out, but it's uh, viewable on the City of Charlotte's Tableau public profile page, um, along with a number of other dashboards, one of which I may get a chance to show you later on tonight. Um, I just want to kind of close with this idea of, you know, what, what can we do with this information? Um, you know, the, the ability for other city departments and partner agencies and community organizations um, to really have this easy access to the same summary information about uh, violent crime as um, we do and our police do um, allows other uh, agencies to participate in violence reduction. So again, that shared data helping with shared solutions. Um, that's, that's, that's the tour. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there are any in follow-up. I see Mr. Driggs and Mayor Pro Tem. So Rebecca, I, I'm almost as enthusiastic as you are about <clears throat> this quantitative stuff, and I really appreciate the work you've done here. Um, what's interesting to me that you alluded to is do you have ideas about how we can perform analytics on this data in order to kind of get more out of it than, than just the numbers? And in particular, um, how can we identify the success of a cure violence type of program with reference to these numbers? I assume that's one a, a, a very critical use, right? That we measure uh, what kind of results we're getting as we consider whether or not to pursue a program like that. Absolutely. Um, See if I can stop sharing my screen for a moment. So there are, there are a lot of different uses for it, but evaluation is a really important component. Um, so on the on from the kind of highest summary level, like what we have in the dashboard right now, from the highest summary level, we should be able to, in implementing cure violence. Um, or any, any of our breadth of um, activities that are related to the violence reduction framework, we should be able to see in the kind of overall high level numbers a downward trend. And then um, there's a little more um, robustness to you know, being able to compare, compare to other areas and attribute the trends to specific programming. But this is the heart of just being able to watch those trends. Another piece of what we're doing with the Violence Prevention Data Collaborative, um, and this, this one I might even get more excited about than the dashboard, um, we are working with the Institute for Social Capital at the UNC Charlotte's Urban Institute to share across agencies individual level data that can be de-identified and aggregated and um, from that information, we'll really be able to do more of those in-depth analytics, looking at what are some of the drivers of, of um, you know, exposure to violence or introduction to violent behavior. What what are the what are the key points of intervention? At what point would you have likely to have the most success with an intervention? And then the ability through that partnership 
to track individual outcomes and report on them in aggregate to be able to say not just did the violence, as was referenced earlier, um, reduce in a particular area, but our violent behaviors for individuals really reduced. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, thanks, Rebecca. This, it is it's great information. I, I have a couple of questions. One is the, um, the FBI statistics feed into it. What's the time lag? Because I thought I saw 2020, but are you, how current is the information that you're getting? So we are, we are currently including data from January of 2015 through present, and by present, um, let's see, it would be the end of, um, right now, July of 2020. Next week, on the 15th of September, we'll get an automated, automatic update to the dashboard, so then you'll go through August of 2020. So Great. in addition to, um, you know, the visualization piece, we've built out the whole back end so that um, there are automatic data updates coming from CMPD. Um, and, and so you'll have much more current data available in, than you've ever had before. Great, okay. And then uh, my second question is, you sort of um, alluded to this a little bit of partnering with UNCC um, and giving people the opportunity to ask questions. Because when you look at some of these numbers and you might go back and say, wow, why did you know aggravated assaults go up? Um, when we actually did this back in 2008, it tied to the, the FBI statistics went back to 2006. That's as much as the public could get. But uh, there, was a, there was a correlation between the crime statistics and what happened in the, co in the court system at the state level and court funding. Mm -hmm. And I just still think that's something we don't talk enough about, um, is what, what happens to the court system and funding. And it's one of those things where like people really don't know when the state defunds the court system. Um, and so, but it, it rolls down and our district attorney's <clears throat> office being the largest in the state bears the brunt of that dramatically and has to make decisions about who, what cases they're gonna try, who they're gonna let out. and. We just never, we, the community, never talk enough about that. So is there a way that um, it, within this great data-rich uh, resource, there is, a, there is something there that says, here's things to think about, here's other connections, or just that people that really want to look into this stuff can learn more as to where else they should be advocating, who, what other elected officials they could contact. How does the whole system work together? Because it is city, county, state, when it comes to the criminal justice system, are very much interconnected and the public doesn't always understand that. So just a question as to how you can, we can use this to ask those questions. Sure, so I, I think the starting place is that the Violence Prevention Data Collaborative will be working with the, um, the core team for the community planning effort, um, which includes the, um, Mr. Jones and um, Sarah Hazel, and I'm a part of that, um, the, as well as you know, county partners and the police chief and the sheriff. Um, so that core team will be the initial group that requests well, what questions will we ask of this aggregate data set. Um, so uh, I think um, we won't know what all those questions to ask are. So the more that we can collect um, people's thoughts and um, questions about the data, um, we'll be able to work through, okay, how do, how do we use these data to answer those questions? And then, um, I mean, this is, future looking, but what, what I envision is that this would then become a place where we're not only sharing the data, but we're sharing the results of analyses, um, which would then lead to what actions might we take. And that would be the same as thinking through, you know, evaluation of cure violence, for example, right? So we would, we would um, 
imp implement a program that's part of the overall violence reduction framework. We would evaluate it. We would share information on that evaluation um, or you know, that analysis that would then help you all and people in the community make decisions about what to do next. Okay, thank you. Great work. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for the work that you continue to pour um, into this project. So without any other questions, um, we look forward to the opportunities to marriage our decision making about how do we address violence and the data that we collect on it, and especially as a part of um, being a part of the Effective Governments Committee deliberation. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Great job, Rebecca. And uh, so now, uh, Mayor, members of council, we'll uh, bring in John Lewis, and we're going to uh, talk about a dedicated bus lane pilot program. Um, as you may recall, uh, we started with the uh, Fourth Street uh, dedicated uh, bus lane. I, I tease John and Liz all the time because I wondered whether it would ever work, and they said, "Just watch us." So now they, <laughs> so now they're going to um, put it up another notch. And I know, Mayor Mayor Pro Tem, this is something that um, you have talked about all the way going back to the last annual strategy meeting. So with that said, I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you, Manager Jones. I'm John Lewis, Executive Director of the Charlotte Area Transit System. Pleased to be with you, uh, Council Members, tonight to discuss second phase of our bus only lane pilot program. <clears throat> so CATS and CDOT are continuing to advance the plans and initiatives that were originally outlined at the council strategy meeting earlier this year. CATS continues to advance its plan, uh, not just the 2030 plan and silver line design, but we've also been working to design and implement better bus strategies in line with the Envision My Ride program. Over the last few months, several cities have taken advantage of opportunities brought about by reduced traffic volumes resulting from the health uh, pandemic crisis to pilot new initiatives in the public rights of way. Bus only lanes are just one of those types of initiatives that have been established in several uh, cities. And we'd like to follow uh, suit with our second phase of our pilot program. So I've talked a lot about the Envision My Ride uh, program, which was launched in 2016 to redesign our existing bus system. Uh, it was implemented in the fall of 2018, and it was a three-phased approach to providing our customers with better, more reliable bus service. This began uh, with a structural approach, phase one, of redesigning our entire bus system, moving from that hub and spoke uh, model that required so many of our bus riders to take a, a bus into uptown, get off one bus, go across the apron of the transit center, get back onto another bus to head to their final destination. It was uh, ineffective and inefficient for so many of our customers and transitioning from that hub and spoke to a bit more of a grid system which enabled more direct connects uh, without uh, and minimizing transfers. Uh, once we implemented that in, in October of 2018, we then moved towards phase two, focusing on frequency of our service. Once we got our bus uh, infrastructure right, we still wanted to move towards uh, adding more frequency to our service. Um, at, at the beginning of this uh, plan, more than half of our buses had uh, bus routes, had frequencies and headways of greater than 30 minutes, uh, and some of those were upwards of an hour. So imagine standing at a bus stop, you may have missed a bus and had to wait 45 minutes to an hour for the next vehicle to come. Uh, you probably had some strong feelings about the effectiveness of our system at that time. So our goal uh, that was established through Envision My Ride was eventually to be able to fund a system that had no bus routes greater than 30 minute frequency and a majority of our routes moving towards 15. And we continue to invest in that strategy. Uh, the third phase, which we'll be talking about tonight, is focusing on reliability. Once we got our infrastructure correct, we focused on uh, invested in additional frequency. 
wanted to make sure that we took advantage of all the opportunities uh, that have been identified within the transit realm to ensure that our bus system has the kind of reliability that we see in our rail system due to the ability of rail to operate in its own right of way um, and have that certain reliability of service. So as we're moving into phase three of our bus uh, priority, CATS funded a study to examine and identify the corridors that bus enhance enhancements could deliver more effective service to our riders. Those enhancements included uh, such technologies as bus only lanes, queue jump projects, and transit signal priority. This type of program has proven to deliver more reliable service outcomes to riders in other jurisdictions. Here are some examples of the treatments in other cities that identify the bus only lanes and separate it from regular traffic uh, lanes. Working with our partners at CDOT, uh, CATS and, uh, and CDOT staff took a deliberate approach to define potential corridors that worked from a, not only a traffic standpoint, but also delivered quantifiable service outcomes. Staff examined multiple corridors throughout the city uh, through the standards of ridership and frequency, traffic volumes, and potential impacts to roadway capacity. After that analysis, it was clear that 4th Street was a clear winner in all of the categories of evaluation, and we implemented that pilot in December of 19, as Mr. Jones said, to great success. Um, that, since then, the 4th uh, Street corridor has been striped uh, and remains striped and operated as a bus-only lane uh, for many of our uh, routes that are coming in uh, to the transit center. And we've seen upwards of 15 to 20 uh, percent increased in efficiency as a result of that investment. Central Avenue is the next uh, corridor that we are proposing. When you're looking at the uh, building that connection, we're proposing a three-phase approach with the 4th Street bus only lane being the first phase of the project, the next phase from Eastland Mall to Eastway Drive, and then phase three from Eastway Drive to 4th Street connecting the entire corridor. So looking at the, uh, as I mentioned, phase one, uh, phase the 4th Street bus on the lane. The far right lane has been striped with a solid white line and the lane has been marked as a bus only lane. Personal vehicles are only permitted in the lane to make right turns and as mentioned earlier we've seen an increase in frequency and reliability as a result of this pilot investment. Moving to phase two, the phase that we'd like to implement uh, with councils uh, okay, uh, we want to go uh, add bus only lanes from Eastway Mall to, from Eastland Mall to Eastway. Uh, we would add bus and bike lanes, which will be separated from regular traffic. We'll restripe, add signage and signals, and our goal is to implement this phase um, by the end of October. And then phase three, which would be uh, east way to 4th Street, uh, we will begin with next week's council action to bring a consultant on board to help us further analyze this complicated section of the corridor that will assist us in developing solutions uh, that we can begin implementation of the phase three and complete the entire corridor. Some of the issues that this consultant study will help us identify are how do we deal with the, the physical characteristics of this portion of the the corridor that has multiple driveways and curb cuts, lack of a median, uh, but also the significant obstacle of the railway crossing uh, on Central Avenue as you're coming into Uptown. So next steps, phase two implementation will begin in by the end of October with Council OK. We'll move forward with public outreach and notice 
of the adjustments that we'll be making along the corridor, uh, and then look for implement, uh, begin striping, uh, signaling, and identification of that corridor during this time period. And then phase three, as I mentioned, with council action on Monday, we'll begin developing recommendations for how we can address the challenges brought on by the third phase of that corridor. <clears throat> So with that, uh, Mayor, members of council, if there are any questions, uh, I'd love to engage those now. And I also have my colleague Liz uh, also here if there are any other questions for CEDA. Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lewis. As a district rep, and I imagine that Councilmember Newton shares my sentiments, I'm glad to see this being put on the east side on Central Avenue. My question, I guess, is what what did you look at? I mean, you, you looked at the ridership. How much of it did you look and weigh the traffic that exists and how much it slows down our buses on those routes? Because anecdotally, that section of Central that we're talking about for phase two here doesn't strike me as one that's particularly bogged down by traffic. Um, it does, I wouldn't assume that it impedes the buses, but so much. So I'm concerned that this pilot might not demonstrate a lot of change in how quickly the bus is able to get uh, through that corridor. So uh, great question. Two things uh, that this pilot will enable us to do. Number one, uh, begin to uh, um, to pilot this kind of technology, and, and really from this, this uh, segment, to your point, the biggest time savings are not gonna come in phase two from Eastland to Eastway. Really, they would begin to catch up in phase three. But we wanted to take advantage of reduced traffic volumes right now to uh, look at the impact from a traffic standpoint that taking the lane away would bring, while also giving our, our customers some uh, additional uh, reliability as a result of allowing uh, particularly Route 9 to operate in its own lane. Um, despite the uh, reduced traffic volumes, there's still interactions during certain periods of day where bus reliability is impacted um, by traffic volumes that, that even that we are seeing today. Um, that makes sense. I, I'm, and I'm glad that the vision is to connect it to, to make it more of a network by connecting it to 4th Street. Um, I, I don't think we'll, again, I, I hope we don't, we'll bear in mind now that the statistics we'll see in terms of this pilot for phase two might not be that uh, wowing because I, I don't think it's gonna speed up the, the bus travel that much. Uh, and also on the flip side, it won't impact traffic particularly negatively. Are you looking at phase three almost as a litmus test for the impacts that, and this will get confusing, but phase three of this bike pilot, are you looking at that almost as a test balloon for the impacts that phase three of a potential gold line streetcar could have? Because there is enormous space constraints on Central Avenue, particularly from, um, I'd say, Morningside through to Uptown um, with businesses right up against the street. There's certainly no way to add a lane there. So, you know, I, I can just imagine the pitchforks that will come out if, and, and I've clearly been supportive and I'm still supportive of the Plaza bike, or the Plaza road diet we've done, the Parkwood road diet we're going to do if we basically one lane every street coming from East Charlotte into Uptown, except for Independence Boulevard, which I'd also, maybe is my third question, um, how we plan to utilize that, I think that we, we might be pushing it even a little further than I at least would be comfortable with this quickly in terms of really putting the people who are still gonna have to drive in and out of town to work um, in a position where they, they cannot get there effectively at all. Sure, so 
Uh, I think there, there are two points you, you are making in, in this question. Number one, the uh, effectiveness of this uh, uh, new technology from a bus standpoint and, and reliability, um, how it interacts with the Gold Line uh, Phase 3 study. And then I'm going to, and I will attempt to address those, and then I'm going to turn it over to Liz to talk about the uh, potential traffic impacts. And so to your point, once we get into phase three, uh, this could be, and number one, a precursor to a future phase three uh, along that corridor um, streetcar, if it is determined that that is the technology we want to move forward to as we begin to update the 30% design for phase three. Uh, the great thing about uh, bus only lanes and bus rapid transit is we can begin to test the impact of reduced lanes uh, to a quarter. How does it uh, uh, address uh, reliability from a transit standpoint, but also how does it impact uh, traffic along the corridor? Um, and then compare that to our expected and, and uh, experienced outcomes from streetcar even though streetcar uh, interacts in the same traffic and we're not taking away a lane of traffic. So I think this gives us the best of both worlds. Number one, we can provide immediate, uh, um, I won't say immediate, I will say short term, uh, shorter term uh, uh, enhancements to our bus uh, reliability along the corridor while we are evaluating the impact uh, and from a ridership standpoint, a trip reduction standpoint, and then be able to compare that to phase one and phase two of the streetcar and help that to inform uh, the decisions moving forward on what phase three of that project will look like. Um, from a traffic impact standpoint, I'm going to turn to Liz and perhaps she can uh, better illuminate that. Thank you, John. You, you actually almost answered it completely, um, but I'll hit on a couple of points that, that I think are important. Absolutely great questions. Um, and as you might imagine, maybe this will make you feel better as the transportation director. Those are the kinds of things that keep me, keep me up at night. Um, so it shouldn't come as any surprise that we have lower traffic on our streets across the city today. We are seeing over the last six months anywhere from 20 to 50% lower volumes than what we saw before COVID, which again puts us in a very unique situation and I believe Mayor Pro Tem has brought this up on a number of occasions where we can get out in the field and actually begin to really test in a very unique set of circumstances and conditions to test an impact as a result of a project just like this. And so we'll be looking very closely at the traffic as traffic starts to come back. Again, we don't really know what tomorrow holds and what life after COVID will look like as it relates to traffic in the city. We do believe that people are gonna continue to telework in a lot of different ways. Um, and so we don't know what those ultimate volumes will look like, but what we are seeing is that they are increasing slowly, which is a good thing. And again, puts John and I in a very unique situation where we can test something like this and really understand how it works in this corridor and make sure that we're not doing anything unsafe for the residents in our city. And we're trying to strike that ba right balance for all people that want to use our transportation system. The other thing that we're seeing with data, um, traffic data across the city is our peaks, what we call our peaks, which are the AM peak and the PM peak. Those are less and spread out over a longer period throughout the day. So again, those two hours that are pretty typically intense on a corridor like Central Avenue are even less in these current conditions. And so we don't know what it's gonna be like after COVID and how people will resume going back to their normal habits and, and work and so forth. But this does give us a very unique opportunity to test that. So we'll be looking at that closely. Um, very well aware of all of the other changing conditions on the street network in your district, um, particularly as it relates to how traffic might resume on Central with a bus lane. We do have quite a bit of capacity on Independence Boulevard. So there's a benefit with that as well. This corridor just gives us a lot of really unique characteristics that we can test. And I'm sure these are all things you've considered too, but even just some of the allowable movements in terms of left turns and things off of Central, particularly in that, in that phase three corridor, just the first one that comes to mind is at Pecan. And there's things where 
you know, I hope we're very thoughtful about all the places that traffic already jams up um, because of the constraints of that road and there not being room for a turn lane. Um, I, I do think we need to be ambitious in pushing. We don't want to make driving and parking so easy in our city that there's no incentive to take transit, but at the same time, I don't think we want to um, incite a, a mob of, of pitchforks showing up at the government center because we make driving so impossible that the people that need to do it, and even not just commuters, but delivery drivers and things like that, um, just can't get around our city, and particularly um, considering the amount of, of roofs and, uh, and bedrooms being built on it, going online on any given day on this corridor with all the apartments and stuff. So uh, I do hope we'll, we'll weigh all of that and try to strike that balance. And I, I am still um, hoping we will be super aggressive with the managed lanes that are coming on Independence and throughout our city with creating bus rapid transit opportunities. Um, this one just strikes me as, as being a little bit more of a double-edged sword and having some more challenges. Yes, sir. And so I will also point out one big difference between phase two and phase three is just the cross section of the road. So if you think about what that section in phase two looks like on central, um, it's very access controlled. We have medians, we have turn lanes at all of the intersections. So it neatly works into a corridor where we can easily implement a bus only lane. That is not the condition in the portion moving closer into uptown. And so as with phase two, we, we actually designed that internally with our own staff. And so with phase three, we're gonna seek some additional support because we do understand the complexities of that portion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the presentation, John. Uh, so I would agree with my colleague that having uh, another rapid transit connector uh, in East Charlotte is a good thing. Uh, I, I want to get a better understanding of what we're talking about here, and uh, I, I could be, a, you know, kind of uh, uh, a little behind the curve on this. Uh, are you saying that we're talking about taking away an existing lane uh, ex uh, to create an exclusive bus lane? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, uh, and uh, I don't know what all, uh, what all the data uh, shows. Um, I I think that there would be people, of course, uh, from Eastway down to Albemarle that would contend. Uh, maybe, I don't know if the data would support it, but we would contend that, that there's traffic uh, uh, that exists uh, beyond uh, their, uh, uh, you know, their satisfaction there and taking away a lane uh, might bring out some pitchforks in that area. Uh, having said that, um, I, I, uh, my thought, of course, goes towards Eastland, Eastland redevelopment, and how taking away a lane right there could could impact traffic. There, there are already concerns um, from a traffic standpoint uh, 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 concerning so uh, so kind of uh, pertaining to 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 full development and uh, what traffic it would create in the area. And I'm wondering, has that been taken into account here? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so absolutely, we've done the traffic analysis along the entire corridor, and as you might imagine, at key intersections like Sharon Amity and Kilbourne um, and Eastway, we do see that congestion. But again, what we're seeing today, and I didn't share this number with you a little bit earlier, um, I'll, I'll expound a little bit more on the traffic reduction. So again, we're seeing about 20 to 50% in reduction in traffic across the entire city. Our volumes on Central in this quarter, about 21,000 to 28,000. And so let me give you a sense of comparison. Even if we took the higher number, which is 28,000, and reduced that by 20%, we start to get at volumes consistent with quarters across the city where we have done road diets. So think about what that means. We've taken four lanes and brought them down to three, which is similar to how this road would function by taking one lane in each direction and dedicating it for a bus. So, are, uh, so you're saying that you're taking into account a potential uptick in the future though? I mean, uh, you would think, I mean, right now because of the pandemic, certainly, and, and people working virtually, maybe, maybe as a result, people probably will still work virtually, but I think even us, I mean, we're experiencing this here where people will, uh, there will be those that do go back. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, at some point in time, hopefully, uh, there's a, uh, uh, 
uh, there's um, uh, a, 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 a cure or uh, uh, something that can be taken for uh, for COVID, and, and folks, you know, uh, we'll get back on the roads. Are, are you saying that you're taking that into account? And what I'm not really hearing, and I guess this is really the core of my question, Eastland. So, I mean, do we have traffic data on what uh, the eventual development of the Eastland site will will be and bring and create? So I don't believe all of those development plans have been finalized, but again, we have taken into account the idea of traffic coming back. And so I'll share with you another, um, another thing that we're doing is we have traffic management cameras throughout the city. Obviously, we have them along this corridor. And so on a regular basis throughout the day, we will be monitoring the corridor. We will continue to work with CATS. Um, not only to look at their bus operations, but also to take counts along the corridor so that we can stay on top of monitoring those conditions as they change in the coming months. It, it was my understanding, I think this might have been touched on, it was my understanding that we were creating, so with that center lane on independence, uh, which is eventually going to be toll roads, uh, but that was creating a, a, a bus rapid transit connector uh, out of East Charlotte as well. It, is that still on the table? Yes, sir. John and I were just conferring, and I don't believe either one of us have the schedule, but let us get back with you and let you know what that schedule is. At some point, there will be a time where NCDOT will allow CATS to operate in that lane again as they continue to build out the remainder of the Independence Corridor. And if that's there, I just wonder if we would be duplicating efforts in this regard. Uh, so what is the the uh, the reason for that preference? I mean, I, I, I kind of look at the map and I'm seeing how phase three is coming down, uh, you know, separate from any connector to downtown. And I know that we normally kind of uh, will, will work from downtown or uptown outward. Uh, and, and so we don't have that middle connector from uh, east way up to uh, up to four. To four. Yeah. Um, so uh, the methodology here, maybe you mentioned this, but what is the methodology for starting somewhere separate that doesn't create that connection in between? So um, in, in regard to starting with phase two from Eastland uh, to Eastway, uh, it's, it's really about taking advantage of the opportunity we have with reduced traffic, the physical characteristics of Central Avenue in that area with the median, as Liz mentioned, that will enable us to get some uh, useful data in terms of trip reduction, speed, reliability, et cetera, that we can help to apply to uh, the, the evaluation of solutions for that section of Central Avenue that has um, some pretty significant obstacles. Number, the biggest uh, obstacle of all is how do we, from a, a service standpoint, deal with the significant uh, obstacle of the railroad crossing? Uh, and the impact that that has to through traffic uh, at, at multiple times a day. Uh, the second thing I'd like to bring up is uh, as we continue to gain experience uh, and uh, provide more reliable bus service, it may be that we give people an option uh, to drive in a car along that corridor. So just like we're seeing on the 77 corridor, not everyone utilizes the, um, the variable pricing lanes, but it's enough that frees up uh, more, more throughput on the uh, other lanes. And so it may be that we see the same kind of, of uh, reaction as we continue to build this out uh, along the central corridor. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think, I mean, so the inference and uh, what I'm uh, gathering here from the conversation is that that, uh, that corridor from Eastway up and, and probably a little bit further up uh, from Eastway to Fourth is really where there is more traffic, and you would think, right, that there's less traffic on the road today. That might be the place where you would want to target first. Uh, having said that, I completely understand to uh, Council Member uh, Eggleston's concerns because uh, I, I, I'll come up Central, and I know just how how close you know the businesses are to the curve, and, and, and just how narrow the street becomes there. Um, I. I wanted to ask about Gold Line. So from what I think I heard you say, and I just want to get clarification on this, this in no way, shape, or form would prevent or limit the ability 
for Gold Line to be built out in Phase Three out towards Albemarle Road? That's that's correct. Um, there, there are two things that I think this would help us um, have an even better evaluation of what phase three looks like. Number one, if we are able to implement in the short term uh, bus only lane through that portion of Central Avenue and the world doesn't end, um, that may we may look towards changing the uh, way we implement a phase three in the future. Perhaps it should be in its own lane which will provide us much more reliable and better speeds throughout that. Um, we would be able to evaluate that uh, portion of it through the bus only lane. Um, or maybe it, it may be that it is better to go back to the current uh, version of phase three in which uh, the streetcar would operate uh, within mixed traffic as it does through the rest of the corridor. So this enabled this uh, project will enable us to get even better data as we continue uh, the evaluation and design of phase three. So is there a, a possibility of having Gold Line operate on the bus, the bus only lane? Is that what you're saying? It is certainly a possibility. Um, again, uh, we would implement the bus only lane if we're able to find a, a solution, uh, particularly uh, getting uh, around over or through the railroad tracks. If we were able to implement a bus only lane during that portion and it did not uh, severely impact businesses, uh, individual. Now, uh, especially on Central and, and some of these other corridors. So. Uh, I think let's test it. If it doesn't work, we can revisit it. Uh, but it doesn't hurt for us to test it because so many other cities have done this and it has worked uh, in other cities. And it might work here in Charlotte. Uh, next thing, I and Matt will be riding a bus uh, here to Government Center. So uh, thank you, Mr. Lewis, for your work and appreciate it. All right, Ms. Johnson. Are these, excuse me, are these bus only lanes um, limited to specific hours or is that like all day? Like the, inten the, the intention would be all day. So yes. the bus, so are you looking at buses and carpools and maybe ride sharing or is it just buses all day? And I don't know how often the bus runs, but would it be an opportunity for other vehicles to utilize it when the buses aren't? We, we can certainly evaluate that, but right now it is intended to be a bus only lane. The Route 9 that operates uh, today along that lane is on 10 minute frequency, so there's a bus every 10 minutes. Uh, once we got into a full uh, phase implementation, we would uh, look to increase those frequencies to about every five minutes. So that's a, that's a lot of buses coming through that corridor. Um, what you want to make sure is that it, if you were going to make that investment, we have to make sure the corridor is clear and allowing other vehicles in that to make stops, pickups, it tends to uh, defeat that purpose. And so we, it would be our goal to make that uh, bus only lane, certainly as we've done on 4th Street, emergency vehicles, school buses, et cetera, I think could also uh, derive benefit from that but uh, it would not at this point be our, our recommendation to allow um, uh, cars in that ad lane. Now Central, if you, if you create a bus only lane, will that just leave one lane for cars? Yes. 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 So that's the difference than 4th Street. 4th Street still has you know, two or three other lanes. So, no, it has one. Right? Yes. One. 4th Street. Street has three. three it's, three, it's not one lane. Central Avenue, if there's a bus only lane, that's going to li limit the traffic to one lane for cars. Is that right? Yeah. In each direction. Yeah, one yeah, in each direction. direction. Oh, okay. I thought you meant just one lane and it was going to be reversible lanes <laughs> like on 7th Street. I was no, like, no. no. Okay. But I, I mean, I just. Oh, we could try that though, couldn't we? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, if a bus is running every 10 minutes and um, you have traffic, it, there just seems like more opportunity, at least for carpools or something, because one lane with traffic, if there's no other connectivity, that's, uh, it's just something I would to, to think about. Because one lane is, it can get very tight during rush, rush hour. 
Yeah, so. I know you're the transportation expert, but I just, as, a, I, as oh, someone who drives, you know, sure. that would be all of those are valid utilization for that, that bus lane. Sure, all of those are very valid concerns, and I think that's why we're excited about doing uh, this pilot now, so that we can identify those issues, and, and if it is a, a complete uh, challenge, I'm sure Liz is going to be the first to uh, uh, suggest that we reverse our decision in this case. You know, um, a couple of years ago, I can't remember, Mr. Newton may remember, how many jobs are there on the east side? And how many people? Anyway, it was a, it was a really wide disparity, and a, and a woman called me, and she was basically bringing her pitchfork to me, saying, "You know, I can't get to work." And the thing that I think we forget sometimes is that mass transit is about connecting people with jobs and home. And what she was basically saying is that the bus doesn't come often enough. It doesn't get me where I need to go. And I know that this isn't the end all that's going to answer that problem that she had. But to me, one of the most important things we can do during this pandemic is to try to experience what can we do to connect jobs to people's housing and to make sure that they can get there on a reliable way. At some point, we have to just really recognize that most of us are fortunate enough to have a car. And she talked to me a little bit more about our situation, and she's not fortunate enough to have a car. And the idea that you can, um, and this is national data, a bus has to be reliable to get people to work. If you miss the bus because of your job or your schedule, or you st have to stay late, and it's going to be another hour, we've got to figure out a way to help people um, move around the city and not have the expense. You know, most cars are an expense of property taxes, insurance, um, repairs, all those things. And, and we've got to help people do something that's different. So I, I don't know that this is something because for me, it's like it's paint. It's paint on an asphalt. But we could at least try it, put the paint down, see if it works, and see if it adds value to our community. So I know the mayor pro tem wanted to address this as well. But I just, I really do feel when someone calls you and says, I can't get to work on time every day and I'm going to lose my job. That, that says something. I think it speaks to the need, and so if I could just interject mm -hmm. real quick before the mayor pro tem as well. I think it speaks to the need for job creation. In East Charlotte as well. Uh, we have a business corridor that has many empty lots today uh, and uh, what we do, the decisions we uh, we frankly make this term leading into our next term uh, for, for those of us who were lucky enough uh, to come back, uh, I, I, I think will make a big difference there as well to, to create those jobs in East Charlotte. But most of our jobs are center city and that's where she was and getting down there on a reliable basis was really our only ask. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Liz and John, first of all, thank you, because you know I've been, I like to call you on a regular basis about this topic. Uh, so I really appreciate you trying it, especially during COVID. Um, it's hard. I know it's going to be hard. We're going to have people who don't want to change their habits, and that's the whole idea, really, is that, you know, it, it, that it's going to be a hard change, but that's because so many people do want to get in their cars and we have all these individual automobiles with one person in them taking up a lot of space on our roads. And there's no solution for that unless we try something different. So my question though is, um, as long as you're having a consultant come in on phase three, is it now, this is where I push the envelope a little bit, is it worth including any other section, you know, we've talked about Central and Providence Road, is it worth doing a dual review of other routes? Because we may find that that third section on, on Central, we just, there's things we can't overcome, or for whatever reason, people don't want to use it in that section, whereas in another part of town, um, you know, with a different road uh, plan, you know, 
structure, whatever, we might have different results. Is it, or is that just too much for? Oh, not budget? at all. Absolutely. That's, that's the point of the study. Um, and we were bringing on this consultant to evaluate all potential corridors, but one of their first tasks would be to help us address this specific portion of uh, Central Avenue. And so they're looking at other corridors. They will continue to look at other corridors um, and utilize the data that we get from this to help inform uh, those discussions. Okay, but it'll be sequential, so they'll finish Central first and then start other corridors, or when would we expect them to also have a look at, at other possibilities? It'll be uh, going at the same time. Okay. Um, one portion of their team will be looking at Central as they continue to evaluate other corridors. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So on this one, I think the question has been that um, it was a pilot and um, that we were asking for counsel okay on doing it. Mr. Driggs? I'd like to make a motion to approve the pilot. All right. I have... Um, Mr. Winston has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, so we have to do this. Um, so we'll start with Ms. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said that you were. You didn't need to say anything. I had to that earlier. Sorry. I just wanted to want to make a comment, which is uh, this is kind of a tipping point or a critical mass situation. So the worst of all worlds is to have uh, frequent, virtually empty buses competing for space with cars on the road, right? When your network gets uh, dense enough and reliable enough for people to be willing to relinquish their cars and to recognize the advantages of taking a bus, then they'll do it. So we have to get from here to there. That, that's, I, I think, the challenge. And if we do it in these increments, um, there's going to be a transition period where, where, in fact, it will be the case that buses that run frequently are not generally full. And so, in the interim, your traffic situation is exacerbated. Uh, the question I had, though, was, um, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you'll recall that uh, a year or two ago, we were talking about the, uh, the goal of getting to 15-minute intervals on all lines. And I seem to recall then we talked about the fact that there would probably be a capital cost of something like $100 million and that it would have a 30 to $40 million impact, I think, on our annual operating expenses on yours. So uh, how far can we leverage the results that we glean from these pilots into a system-wide uh, increase in service without bumping up against budget constraints? Sure. Um, that is a, a great question. I think I'm going to give you sort of the 50,000 foot answer to that and let us dig into the exact answer because um, by, by investing in these types of service enhancements, the next goal in this, if we, uh, I'm going to take a little bit of uh, um, uh, professional privilege in this. The bus only lanes work and the, it doesn't destroy traffic volumes or impediments. The next phase would be to utilize different vehicles in this. And so if we could get to the point where we're using articulated vehicles um, that can move twice the numbers of people for the same operating costs, then you start to gain the efficiencies of rapid transit, reliable service along the corridor, utilizing uh, technology that allows you to move the largest number of people as efficiently as possible. So the the one-to-one -one trade off on that, we'll, we'll have to take a look and, and apply that filter to that estimate. Second would be how many corridors could we implement this on? And so as we look to other corridors, Providence Road um, that gets mentioned, so does um, 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 perhaps West Boulevard as an example, uh, we tend to get, we could possibly get those uh, uh, if efficiencies also in those uh, areas also. But there will be times of day when your desire to have a high frequency of service necessarily results in buses that aren't that full because there just isn't much that much ridership. Sure. I mean, you, you have the challenge that you can't schedule the buses so as to expect to have them full on each trip. That's correct. And uh, uh, I've seen that happen on Providence Road since you mentioned it. I'm glad you did. So, again, I... Uh, I hope we're also thinking ahead in terms of the equipment needs we're going to have and the impact on the operating budget of trying to scale up 
the bus service that we provide in the way that you're suggesting, because if, if we, people are expecting us to be able to do this on all the routes, uh, that's going to take, especially at a time currently when fare collections are down, it's going to take uh, some planning in terms of finance. Absolutely. This is not a solution where you flick the light switch and, and everything changes overnight. This is going, typically, it takes 18 to 24 months for a new bus route to reach uh, its expected goals. I would think when you're n not only ch uh, um, looking at the changes in commuting patterns and what the new normal may be, um, we'll have to add that to our, our um, uh, stack of assumptions as we continue to move forward with this. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'm a yes to the, to the motion. Okay, we have a motion on um, Mr. Bakari. What do you, what do you need? Voting. Voting. Are we ready to vote? Yes, Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Graham. Right on. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Ms. Esmeral. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Um, everyone that vote, Mr. Winston. Yes. All right. So the vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. I'm. I really look forward to trying things to see what works and see what we can afford, all of those things. So thank you for the hard work you're putting together to get this done. Before we go into our committee structure, we have one more item that is, needs to come before you um, from Pam Weidman. Mr. Mitchell? Um, Ms., Ms., uh, Madam Mayor, we have yes. two items. I had asked a question of, uh, about cats uh, during the COVID response, and I said I, said I was going to get a... Um, I, Answer I, about that? I thought that that was going to come back in a report. I'm sorry. Get Mr. Lewis back in here. Sorry, I thought it was going to be in a follow-up report. Um, so while they're trying to get Mr. Lewis back, Mr. Mitchell, did you have something? Mayor, I would just say we have two items. We have the housing service dashboard and corridor of opportunity. I, I think that we're going to try. It's um, a little bit after 9, and we were going to try to do the housing dashboard maybe as a part of um, Mr. Graham's committee report. Or, But we do have one item that we need to bring up that's going to be on your 14th agenda for action. Mr. Lewis, Mr. Winston, would you repeat your question for Mr. Lewis, please? Um, I have heard concerns from CATS bus drivers regarding partition, partition, partitions um, and lack of passenger PPE. Uh, can we just get an update from CATS about the progress that we've made in these areas? Sure. Um, and I'm going to start with passenger uh, PPE. As uh, council members have known, for the, about the last two months, um, CATS has been uh, actively uh, uh, providing PPE to all of its customers at our transit centers, on board our buses, and council member, you and I were at the uh, transit center uh, one day handing out PPE. We continue that program. Any customer can approach any of our customer service uh, representatives, any of our G4S security, or any CATS employee uh, and request a, a reusable mask. In regard to protection of our operators, we have been, uh, that has been a top priority for us at CATS. We, as we've progressed through this uh, difficult time, we've done things such as rear door boarding, uh, fare free service to limit interaction uh, at the front of the bus. We've taken bus seats out of buses to promote social distancing. Uh, and along that, we, we have tried for several weeks now, several months now, to acquire uh, plexiglass shields that would protect our operators, another layer of protection for our bus operators. Um, we have had some challenges through the supply chain since a lot of restaurants and, and businesses are trying to acquire plexiglass shields for the exact same pur purpose. Um, good news is that we got our first shipment of shields last week, um, and those were for our special transportation uh, vehicles. That uh, installation began not this past weekend, but the weekend before that, and uh, by the in the very near future, 
all of our STS vehicles uh, will be uh, installed with those shields. We are awaiting the delivery for our bus shields uh, since they are larger and have to be uh, flexible so that the operator can uh, still interact with the customers at the fare box if needed. But we're just waiting that delivery and as soon as that uh, arrives, we'll begin those installations. I hope that answers your question, Councilman. Thank you, it did. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, my understanding is we've got Tracy talking about the corridors of opportunity, and then we'll come back with Pam on a housing issue. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me go ahead and move this to the second slide. Oh, up. Um, well, we can tee up the video to play. Is it teed up? Do you know? <laughs> Okay, so uh, Donato's pulling that up. Let me um, just remind you kind of how we got here. Let's get back to December and January, um, either last year or earlier this year. And we heard loud and clear um, from not just Councilmember Graham, but from others too, that there wasn't enough being done in our corridors. And we started at that retreat, if you remember, to lay out a strategy for corridors of opportunity. And since then, we've done a lot of work to try to take a different approach, an approach that's really going to lead to impact um, and real impact that you can see. Um, there was a lot of discussion that we had at the staff level about there is a lot of work that's been done out there, um, but sometimes you just don't see it. It's been infrastructure work or things like that. And so we'll skip. You want to skip this? Okay. Okay. Um, so there is a lot of work that's been done out there. This um, was a quick video that we had to essentially um, kind of bring back together or kick off the strategy that we had. Get to the next slide. Where's Donata when you need her? <laughs> <laughs> I ask myself that several times a day. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Donata. 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 It's not working now. I mean, I am technologically challenged. Donata. Take this back and then try now. Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay, let's get back one. Here we go. So what's new? Um, it's not the work, it's really the implementation strategy. Um, if we go back just a couple months ago, when um, council approved the $24.5 million budget um, for, this, for this year, since then, the city manager has brought together several of the department heads who work closely together on a very regular basis to talk about the investments in these corridors and coordinate these investments. So planning, housing, economic development, transportation, and others meet on a regular basis uh, to go over how we're going to invest this $24.5 million to create the most impact for our communities. However, the coordination goes beyond these departments and the sticks in the mortar. Um, there's a lot of labor, layer, layers to this. Um, we talk about community engagement. We have had a lot of conversations about more private sector engagement. We talk about things like talent development and real job creation that's going to impact our corridors. And even tonight, we talked about public Wi-Fi. So there's a lot of layers that go into this. It's not new work. Again, it's a more strategic implementation strategy that's really going to lead us um, to the impact that we want to see. 
So since Councilman Graham has an event tomorrow on Beatty's Ford, I figured we would use Beatty's Ford as an example of how we are setting up the strategy in our corridors. And that is um, to be geographically targeted. So for Beatty's Ford as an example, we are looking at primarily four different areas. You have the Five Points area, you have Oaklawn, and you have LaSalle. Um, there's always going to be corridor-wide initiatives. We can't look, we can't uh, just look at these three. We have to think about our corridor as a whole. Um, but if we're really strategic and really targeted, again, we'll start, we'll plant that seed that will grow again throughout the corridor. So I'm going to give you an example um, of how this kind of ecosystem can work together. You look at this and it's a lot to read, but what I want you to start to think about is these layers in coming together. If you look at this intersection, which is Beatty Ford and LaSalle, we have housing projects. We have two ED public-private partnership projects. We're looking at Wi-Fi. We have a facade improvement grant. We have multiple infrastructure projects. We have community engagement opportunities as well as placemaking opportunities. So. Just think what this intersection can look like in a couple of years if we layer all of these investments together and we're very strategic about it. The next layer that we'll start to get to is what does it really look like when you put these together? What does it look like today and what can it look like in a very short amount of time? And we'll take this strategy and we'll start to implement it over the six corridors. We have a, a working sheet um, for each corridor that we're starting to build out. And the goal of this is any of you, any staff, or even during budget season, we have this list of projects in these geographic target areas, and we can start to inform how budget is going to work. We can start to look at how we're prioritizing the projects to get the most impact. And so it'll be a living document that, again, all the departments and the staff will hit on a regular basis, and eventually we'll build it out for all of these corridors. So to take it a step further, to keep it connected, we need to take additional steps in how we work together and tie all this work together. The projects will take different amounts of time to implement, but our community really needs to be reminded this is all connected into a common vision. And so we think that creating an identity and a brand will help do that over time. So this is what we have come up with so far. It's corridors of opportunity. And there's a couple of unique things here to this. The crown is in the center of the O, which is the opportunity that reinforces the concept that these are Charlotte opportunities. The C and the O are intertwined with each being in front and behind, which showcases movement, always working and always together. Echoes of CO without saying it can easily be hashtag for social CO of Charlotte or co-op, I think is uh, council member, I think it was council member Wat Watlington had brought up in one of our committee members co-op. Um, professional and adaptable, high profile um, for meetings and events, and the pattern represents the diversity and complexity in the fabric of our community. So we can take this and brand them a little bit for each corridors, but again, if you think about how many times something like this can pop up on a corridor, it really reminds the community as well as all of us how this work is intertwined and how it is going to lead to real impact. Lastly. Uh, a web page and design to bring all of the corridor work together, but then all the different initiatives that are on, e on each corridor. And here's just an example of what that could look like. You have on the far left, kind of all the corridors of opportunity, the, the main landing page. On the far right, a page for a particular, uh, for I'm sorry, a page that outlines all the corridors. And then in the middle, a particular landing page for an individual corridor that can have everything from projects to different initiatives in the community, to just the demographics of the corridor. But um, this is, again, not our story, not our work. This is the community's story. We're just implementing the community's work and the community's vision. And so we, will, we want the public to know what we have been doing. We want them to know um, through future outreach, how this implementation strategy is trying to implement their vision. And we will continue to engage with public around the corridors of opportunity in a variety of different ways through traditional digital media, grassroots. Our outreach um, has, has been a little bit quiet, I think, while we've been pulling all this together. Um, but even starting tomorrow, we will really be able to have the opportunity to show the community how we're bringing this all together. 
with that, I will stop. We can play the video. All right. You can play it? Yeah. Oh, great way to end. Can you pull it back up? Do I have Mr. Mitchell yeah. and then Ms. Watlington? Ladies first. Ms. Watlington? No. Oh, are we doing the video now? Yes. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Ms. Watlington. We're doing the video first. <laughs> video before ladies. <laughs> We've only got a little bit more to go, guys. Unless you're a video. <laughs> She can ask her. Yeah. Start <laughs> Go ahead with questions. Tracy, my question is we look at West Boulevard and starting to identify real projects from the playbook. The issue that I keep running up against as I'm talking to folks in the private sector, particularly from a development standpoint, is how do we accelerate the market, if you will, or how do we get ahead of the market to attract that investment? Because what I'm finding is that the gap that we would have to uh, close from the public sector um, may help on the capital side, but when you look at the ROI for these particular investments, particularly what we're looking for at West Boulevard, mixed use um, in increased density development, we're not really able to to accelerate the need, right? When we look, especially with COVID, even in South End, um, we've got places that are for lease and we don't necessarily have tenants yet for them from a commercial standpoint. And so adding that into the market, uh, particularly along West Boulevard, has been a barrier, if you will, in terms of attracting uh, private partners. So I wanted to understand how we are looking at from a public standpoint, though, Communities may be willing and even the property owners may be willing and even uh, big business may be willing. How do we um, how do we close that gap in terms of viability of the projects at this point without driving um, displacement? Make sense? It's so let me start with one of the things that I have. Uh, I feel like I've said over and over every quarter is different mm -hmm. and the market on every quarter is different and what type of development is suitable for a quarter is, is, is different. And I'll use the example of Betty Sword and LaSalle. Um, when we started talking about some of the P3 projects, uh, we had some staff said, well, wouldn't it be easier if you just tore down the building and build a new mixed use building? Mm -hmm. Um, but the market doesn't support that. And so what we have to look at is how do we approach this from a phased approach where market realities can meet our vision. And sometimes it's not just we have a site, we're going to build a mixed use, a mixed use development. Sometimes we do need to think about how it, how it phases. I would say the same thing was true for South End when transit first came. Not everything was knocked down day one and, you know, some buildings were repurposed. And so we have to think about that to grow the market in a way that we want to. And that's why when I mentioned in here the additional work that needs to happen, um, we have to think about the talent development and the, and the job creation opportunity. And I know you've had a lot of conversations on your corridor about that. Um, I don't think we, we think about that enough in our, in our corridors. And that's another mechanism that helps bring the market to the corridor. So it's not just a gap with a developer. I think we have to think about all the pieces that move the market, don't displace the market, um, but it is always going to be a multi-pronged approach. Um, so I didn't answer your question in its entirety. We can sit down and talk about some of the specifics on West, um, but I, I think it is a phased approach that takes, takes time, and it's not just a, well, if we put X amount into a project, it'll work, and, you know, it's off and running. It takes a lot more time and I think a lot more strategy around it. And sometimes it's investment, you know, in year one, a year three, and year five. Um, we're, we're looking at all different, with the projects I'm looking at on the corridors, as well as you look at an Eastland or a Gateway, these different projects, we have to think strategically about how we invest in them to not just get the development, but get the right uses in them and things like that. So it's not uncommon, but it's complex. Mm -hmm. I had Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just kudos to the collaboration that has allowed us to get to this point. 
I think, Council Mayor, you're thinking about, number one, our budget priority. We, we set aside $24.5 million. Staff, you all went to work, and then we had our committee to really talk about what we would like to do in our corridors. And then we have a new branding. I, I think when I spoke to staff, when you think about open for business, the new excitement it created for us, and I kind of wanted that same type of excitement. So, uh, Councilman Graham, you, you have the best marketing piece. Can you show council uh, the corridors of opportunity uh, marketing that we, we would display? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, so thank you, staff. Uh, thank you, committee, and thank you, city manager, for allocating these funds. So, and uh, I think the big announcement is tomorrow. So I'll leave it up to Councilman Grant. There's only one shirt. There's only one shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you did it next year. Let me tell you, it was saving money for projects. <laughs> Okay, I, Mr. Graham, do you want to say anything about tomorrow to the council members? Uh, yes, just like to, again, extend an invitation um, for everyone to come out tomorrow if you can. It, it is more than a district event. It's a, it's a citywide initiative that we're kicking off tomorrow, focusing on Betty's Fort Road. But uh, we're talking about some of the activities on the quarter, um, leveraging the investments we've already made. Uh, like the streetcar, that is a significant investment for the city. And so here's an opportunity for us to do a, three things. One, um, talk about um, crime um, and public safety on the quarter, uh, talk about how we can uh, interact with our neighborhoods and our residents uh, um, through code enforcement and supportive services. Uh, and then lastly, talk about the economic development activities that's occurring on the quarter. We'll be talking about projects that are more than shovel ready, but projects that are ready to, to be built and be occupied within the next 12 to, to 14 months. So um, it's, just, it's a good day for the city. Uh, and I just extend an invitation for everyone to be here. Thanks Council Member Mitchell and his committee for really um, kind of putting some uh, meat on the bones in terms of the, the initiative, the branding, um, the outlook for what we're doing for the city as a whole again. So this is not a really a district event. It's, it's more of a citywide initiative that we're kicking off in District 2. Thank you. And the, um, meet, the time of your meeting is? We're, we're starting off in the morning with a community cleanup and community outreach um, starting around 8.30. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a, a mini press conference we're doing at 10. Uh, the main event is at 1 o'clock um, uh, on the corridor um, uh, next to the McDonald's uh, restaurant. Uh, you can park at the Bayes Fort Road Library. The old one or the new one? I mean the old one, the House of Prayer one. Top of McDonald's, the burger joint. Okay. Okay. Uh, and you'll see the tent, so you, you can't miss it. Um, but uh, we cordially invite everyone to come out tomorrow um, at 1 o'clock. We will be socially distancing and, um, again, uh, adhering to all uh, health codes. Um, but we believe it's really important to have a visible demonstration of support for the initiative and for uh, the quarter. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? Ms. Dodson? No. Mr. Downs, what's next? So, Mayor, we just have uh, one last, I believe it's a five-minute uh, presentation, and it's uh, a dashboard that's dealing with um, where we are with housing, and we believe it's a tool that uh, council members will be able to use not only for the city, but also um, in the particular district. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pam, and I, and I do believe that she'll also mention one additional um, opportunity for the city next Monday, um, which is a NOAA project that will come before the council. Okay. I think Ms. Hefner is going to be in charge of all dashboards across the city. <laughs> good, good evening. Um, it's good to see each of you all, and it's also good to be seen. 
Uh, I'll just be <laughs> really quick this evening um, and talk to you about, this was one of your deliverables from your January retreat. That seems like a long time ago. Um, but you all, we talked about the delivery of a housing dashboard. Let's see if I, oh, I can do this. And so uh, l let me just start by um, thanking the team for do, for getting this done. You, got, you guys have already heard from Rebecca, um, but Rebecca and her team are really the people to thank for getting this up and going, and also the folks on the housing team as well, Warren Wooten, um, Zelka Beerman, and um, Miles Vaughn. But basically what this trust fund uh, what this dashboard will do is it, it will allow us uh, to look at all of your investment by geography, um, by program. We are um, going to be adding to it. You'll be able to see your investments in real time. So when you go out to your district meetings or to your town hall meetings, you will be able to print reports to see how many um, housing trust fund dollars you've allocated to a certain geography. You'll be able to see how many House Charlotte dollars you've allocated. Um, we're still building this, and so we're putting in our rehab data. You'll also be able to see what we've accomplished in terms of affordable housing by way of rezoning and resolutions that you all approved. And so with that, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca just to give you a quick um, look at what is actually there. Rebecca? All right, I promise to make this fast. I'm going to give you a very quick preview. Um, I'll just reiterate. Um, the thanks to the team that put this together. Um, this is one that even though I'm sharing it with you tonight, I had very little to do with. So the team did a fantastic job both on the visualization and the data management pieces on the back end. Again, we have a way to get the overview for people who like to read a lot before they see their data visas. And and here's what it looks like. So just a quick question. Anybody in this room ever said, ooh, I wish I could just pull up the number of housing units created in the city, the number, the amount of dollars we've invested. Anybody show of hands? Every day. All right, this dashboard is for you and you and you and you and you and everybody who's ever asked this question. Because I'll tell you what, I started the city seven years ago as part of Pam's department and this is one of the things we were asked then. So the fact that we can do this with a click of a button, um, you wanna know how many 30% and below units, just go to the filter and take a quick look. Easy, up to date. <laughs> oh, my streak stands. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just, just uh, you, know, you can kind of take a look through here and see all of the information that's available. You can view it by city council district. Um, you can look at the different corridors of opportunity, for example. We included the um, county commission districts in here as well because you'd be surprised how often they call Pam also. Um, so we've, we've got it all in here. And then if you want to take a look at something that can be printed out and shared, all of the data can be viewed uh, as, a, as a detail table. Um, has House Charlotte information goes back to 1999. Housing Trust Fund since its beginnings in 2002. We're very close to adding rehab data. As Pam mentioned, we'll be adding um, voluntary units created through rezonings. And uh, you can kind of get, get a sense of the totals, um, total number of units and total number of dollars invested. And then you want to take a look um, at the detail table and take it with you and hand it out to people who want to know what does the city do um, in housing investments, you can overwhelm them with these totals. So um, this is just a visualization of the great work of the housing services team um, and your investment in housing across the community. And with that, I will, oh, oh the WebEx. 
Yes, Mr. Picard. Stop sharing. Uh, now that you're tracking this, are you able to um, benchmark it and start showing how many affordable units we lose each year? So. Good question. We can do that, um, and we keep track of that on an annual basis, um, and it's something that could potentially be shared uh, along with the dashboard uh, data in the future. Let's do that. Can I ask a question about that, though, Mr. Ricari? Are you tracking those that we would be in a position of trying to replace? Because I've seen places where houses were torn down and just bigger ones or two bigger ones are what what is what are we going to attract I think the thing that for, being for the last now? three years that we've been questioning over and over again is just we, you know we get the how many people are moving here a day and and roughly 13 percent of those are below the area median income that add to it the number of units we've built we we don't we've just never been able to see how many we lose each year which you know obviously changes a, por a portion of that of that quotient that determines what our gap is to solve. Ms. McCarty, can I follow up? Because I have a similar comment. I, you I should, I should ask the mayor, probably. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was the voice of God coming. Um, but what I was trying to say is, you know, like we could tear that. down a house and build a 5,000 square foot house. I'm trying to get, you know, what would we, we wouldn't replace the 5,000 oh, yeah. square foot. It's so just, it's just to know. Really, I, I don't know. It might inform our decision making, but I don't think I don't have anything in mind that I think that tells us other than the whole picture as it evolves each year. I wonder if you well, Madam May, I that's what I that's what that's kind of what I had a question about a comment about how it can be useful to us because um, I think there's a missing data. So I think this is great. Um, I'm always for figuring out um, more ways to effectively share information. Um, with the public about, especially about where their tax dollars are going. Um, but I think the point of, of, of this type of data is twofold. Um, I, I think it, one of uh, the, the, the second most important part of this is for, for this data to inform policy decisions of, of future councils, right? So if we are saying we're making these investments um, without understanding what the marginal impact is year over year on the need, um, then we still don't have enough information to make the most informed policy decisions, right? Um, where, um, where do we fine tune those housing trust fund on dollars, even how much we should be um, um, putting in our housing uh, 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 trust fund um, 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 bond asks year over year. Um, as Mr. Bukhari said, we have the, the thousand people a week moving in. Um, if we don't know, if we don't, if, if we don't count for that, as well of the units that we're losing, that we don't really have a clear understanding of the impact that our investments are, are making on, on the problem and, 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 and the solutions um, at large. And I think that's what we really need to understand. And that's what the public expects us from a policy standpoint um, to, be, to be doing, making um, good decisions um, that don't just um, communicate well on tables and charts, but making decisions that are having the type of impact that are needed uh, uh, to, to bring security um, 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 and healthy living situations for the people that need it the most. So I, I don't know how to do that, and I'm not sure that what Mr. Bakari suggests would do that. And so, Rebecca, well, you, you, think about you would it? do it by saying how many units are needed year over year, right? So we said, you know, when Opportunity Task Force report came out, we had this 34,000 unit shortage, and we were saying that by year 2040 or 2050, we would need 50,000 units. Is that the same? Is that the same arithmetic now that we've had even more explosive growth over that time? Is has the velocity of people that are being displaced and have are not able to live in 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 in, um, in certain neighborhoods? Has that increased over the past five years? Um, what is that outlook going to be, look like over the next five, ten? Um, 15, 20 years. If we don't, we should be able to count that um, uh, theoretically um, to, to make more informed decisions. May I make one additional comment? 
So the um, the housing dashboard is is depicting the investments that just the city of Charlotte is making. Um, so it, it's only a component of contributing to closing the housing gap. And I think the question that's being asked is about tracking the affordable housing gap, which we do monitor every year we recalculate. Um, that information was just recently shared with the Housing Recovery Task Force, so that can be shared out as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Rebecca. All right, um, Ms. Weidman, I'm sorry, Mr. Newton. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, the, the number crunching you do is invaluable, and I can't wait to dig into this. I just wanted to, to remind everybody, and to Council Member Winston's point, we do have a $50 million uh, bond uh, initiative on this year's ballots. Uh, for housing trust fund dollars. Uh, Mail-in balloting, I believe, started last week. Uh, I'm not really getting out much these days, so I don't know if there's a campaign out there for it. I know we've had campaigns in the past from the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance, but I think it's important that we make sure that the word is spread about that so people know and they're not taken by surprise when they get to the polls to vote or if they vote by, by mail, which is already happening right now. All right. Uh, yes, I just want to also take this opportunity um, to update you on um, a, a housing trust fund request that will be coming your way. I'll go back to the uh, framework that you all approved. I think it was in 2018 now. Um, the, we, in that framework, we had three things. We said that we would build new, we said that we would preserve, and we said that we would help um, increase family self-sufficiency, right? Um, you all, after you approved the housing opportunity framework, you also approved a NOAA policy, naturally occurring affordable housing. That is whereby we preserve uh, multifamily housing. We said that within that we had to be flexible because we know when property owners put a, a, a multifamily property on the market, they want to close in 60 to 90 days. So what, this is why this is coming at us fast. We have an opportunity, you'll be presented with an opportunity at your September 14th business meeting um, to approve a housing trust fund request um, for $2.4 million. The opportunity is to preserve, it's called Lake Mist. It's 144 units um, of multifamily housing. It's along the Archdale light rail station. It is consistent with your approved NOAA eligibility criteria. Um, it has units in it ranging from 30 percent um, all the way up to 80 percent. They would be get the 2.4 million dollars would be used to do some HVAC replacement, some water heater replacement, um, doing some lighting and some other life safety issues. And I think that um, the developer is making or has made its his way um, around to most of you all, but we wanted to just give you an opportunity uh, to hear it here before you see it on your agenda um, on the 14th. With that, I'll pause and take any questions. Any questions? I, I just wanted to express um, that the um, principals have indicated that this is a model that they think can be um, not just appropriate for Charlotte, but could be a national mo model, um, and that the investment by, again, our private sector corporate um, um, banking community has been exceptional, as well as the people that are working on this project. So it will help us get more units more quickly and I think the one thing that distinguishes the group is that they have agreed to take 30% without taking housing choice vouchers. So that really means that they'll be coming to us with some ideas about how to do that. So most of us know that housing, I don't know what a housing choice voucher is, but it's usually considered a market rate. And what we've been doing is saying 30%, and most of them will get vouchers from the housing authority or in Livian and they get um, a certain rate. But in this case, they are going to do 30% without that voucher, which frees up vouchers for more people, and they're gonna to try to figure out a way to make the rents work for those folks. And I think that that is a pretty significant change. 
um, in our effort and the work that this group is doing. And I just want to be clear, I know there's been a lot of conversation in the community, not, not only about housing choice vouchers, but other sources of income as well. And so they, they, are, they are really open to trying to really, as the mayor said, help, help meet the need, so. So mayor, I'd like to just add one thing. Yes. <clears throat> Pam, I, I believe last time when we had a bond, I guess in 2018, we're in that May 2018 time period, and we, I guess the best way to say is we had oversubscribed and we had to wait until we got the, the bond approved. I think even with this action, you still have so, four million left over from that's that's right, Mr. Jones. It should should you all approve this one, we still have about four million dollars left to get us to the next bond cycle. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Right. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Madam Mayor, for working through this. All right, now we're going to go to a <clears throat> council committee report. Could, could we could the great name of his committee go first? While Ms. Whiteman is up there, where we have like a two-second report. Ms. Whiteman, do you have a two-second report? Well, I I, 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 just, I, I I need her to correct any mistakes I make. So that's why. But we, the uh, um, so. Uh, Th Ms. Mr. Driggs, you don't mind that, do you? No, go for it. Thank go you. For it. Uh, right. We did not meet well, in... Can I say something? Sure. I hope everybody has read the report. And what the report is to do is come up with actions that we need to take. It's anything that the committee is bringing forward on the 14th. So that's really the focus. Um, okay. we, we all can read, so we don't need to do that for each other. All right, well, our committee, this will be really brief then. Our committee didn't meet at all uh, the month of August. Um, but I, I just wanted to counsel. I knew I was going to get in trouble. I knew it. Uh, but, but, but we work real hard during the summer. Uh, but I, I just want the counsel to know that we did hear uh, the, the comments and concerns in reference to the, the $10 million. It was intentional for the committee not to spend it all. Uh, we wanted to wait until the fall as we get into the winter season. So we, we heard the mayor in terms of uh, some of the um, usage of those funds, utility, rent, uh, electricity, et cetera. And so uh, the committee will be meeting twice this month, uh, September 16th and the 23rd. We have two referrals coming from the mayor, one from the city manager's office in, in, in Taiwo, uh, and um, that's our report. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Graham? Yes, Ms. Watlington. Mine's really in general, and it's kind of procedural. Um, I got two invites in September for the housing committee. Is that intentional? It, it is, yes, okay. ma'am. The 16th and the 23rd. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Wyman. Our next report is from Budget and effective, Effectiveness. Ms. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make sure we're covering everything. Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this one may take more than two seconds, I'm but um, let me start. So the committee met on August 18th. The members of the Budget and Effectiveness Committee are myself as chair, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Isolt, vice chair, and council members Ajmera, Graham, and Johnson. Uh, we had four topics at this meeting. One was talking about our ethics policy, the second was the police budget review in conjunction with our ongoing uh, council effort to review our police operations. Uh, the violence prevention data matrix, which we've discussed earlier, so I don't need to say anything more about that. And prioritizing projects funded by hospitality revenues. So I'll just comment briefly on those in reverse order. Uh, we got an update uh, relevant to the charge to our committee to consider how hospitality funds are invested, capital projects with hospitality funds, criteria for pr prioritizing those investments, and Chief Financial Officer Kelly Flannery came up with some concepts for us to consider. I think right now all I'll say is that there's still a work in progress, and we expect to come back to Council with recommendations about that. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about was the police budget review by services area. So Budget Director Ryan Bergman provided us with uh, sort of consolidated data for CMPD, which you can see on our committee's website. Uh, some key takeaways from that, the percent of total community uh, general fund budget, including county and other, not just the city, that is spent on police is 14%. 
And I mention that just because much has been made of the fact that some large percentage of our general fund budget was for police, but it needs to be seen in the context of uh, overall local government spending and not just the city's budget. The other thing I will mention is that 75% roughly of the expenditures of the police department are for personnel and in fact only $24 million of non-personnel expense is actually discretionary. So that is probably the number that we're talking about as we consider uh, the finances of the police department and try to incorporate the work that we've done on the budget committee with what's being done in safe communities. And one thing I would like to mention in that context is there has been a call a couple of times for an audit of CMPD. And in that context, I'd just like to point out this book, which I hope everybody is familiar with. It's our Consolidated Annual Financial Report. And this book presents all the financials of the city and is in fact audited. So <clears throat> I will read to you what Cherry Beckert, our auditor, said. In our opinion, based on our audit and the report of the other auditors, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects the respective financial position of the government activities, the business type activities, the discreetly presented component unit, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund information of the city as of June 30th, uh, 2019. So the point I'm trying to make here is we need to be thoughtful about the use of the word audit. Uh, if it's a question of doing an audit in the narrow sense, that has happened. You're not going to learn anything by commissioning a further audit that isn't already covered by Cherry Beckert in this document. I think for people who are calling for an audit, what is required is a more careful, uh, thoughtful consideration of what exactly it is that you want to delve into in greater detail. And when we take an action like that, we need to define uh, what it is. So to say, okay, I want to see details about this and this. I want somebody to look at this or to look at that. But the audit thing has been done. And the truth is that if you want an audit that is different from what has already been done, you're going to need to specify what it is, talk about who's going to do it, talk about the time frame in which it's going to get done, how much it's going to get uh, cost. So uh, I'm very open on, in, in my committee to considering any requests for action like that, but I can't respond to this idea of we need an audit of CMPD. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is the uh, ethics policy. And this is something that we have the possibility of actually doing something about tonight. Um, and <clears throat> if you'll bear with me, since this is actually a uh, fairly sensitive subject, the, our committee had a charge to look at our ethics policy generally. And then the uh, issue of complaints related to ethics that have occurred, come in recently, got caught up in that. And uh, just in order to be sure I do justice to this topic, I'd like to read into the record a, a statement, a personal statement of mine on this subject with a recommendation for council action. In the past month or two, an unprecedented series of ethics complaints have been filed against members of city council pursuant to council's ethics policy. Without prejudging the merits of any of these complaints, it is fair to say that, collectively, they constitute a misuse of our rules. The current policy was implemented five years ago, and not one complaint had been filed before the recent activity began. The excess activity that's going on now is a problem, not only because it undermines public confidence, but also because it trivializes the complaint process itself. Genuine ethics violations are a serious matter. We owe it to our public to ensure that our policy is not rendered less effective by overuse. In brief, our current policy requires that complaints be submitted to the city clerk and that they contain certain information that identifies complainants and makes the complaints susceptible to review and, if necessary, investigation. And I, uh, do we have those uh, documents? Did everybody get them? Okay, so you should have uh, a copy of our ethics policy in front of you. And uh, that is the entire ethics policy that you have there. If you scroll through a little bit towards the back, you'll see the specific section that relates to uh, complaints about uh, alleged ethics violations by council members. <clears throat> so uh, the policy requires, as you can see, it's not that long, it's one page, 
that uh, complaints be submitted to the city clerk and that they contain certain information that identifies complainants and makes the complaints susceptible to review and, if necessary, investigation. The city attorney is called upon to verify that the complaints are properly submitted and, if so, refer them without further evaluation to an outside person who is currently referred to as an investigator. And I will note uh, Council Member Bukhari's objection or, or uh, specific position on the question of what exactly without further investigation means or what the word specific means, but I'm not going to try and resolve that issue right now. Uh, that outside investigator makes a determination under our current policy either that the complaint does not war warrant further action, in which case mayor and council are so notified and processing ceases, and you can see that in section D2A, or that further action is warranted, in which case a, quote, investigation commences, section D2B. The problem with this current process is that the city's attorney referral to the so-called investigator in accordance with D1C is perceived by some in the media and public as being tantamount to a subsequent finding, a later finding by that investigator, that an investigation proper is called for pursuant to D2B. This unfavorable perception is unfair to any council member who is not guilty of an ethics violation, and the potential it offers to inflict harm invites the use of the complaints policy to attack members of council for reasons that it may have nothing to do with ethics. At the meeting of the Council's Budget and Effectiveness Committee in uh, last month, committee members voted, and Ms. Ajmira was excused, to recommend to full Council that we amend the wording of our complaints policy to indicate that the City Attorney will refer complaints he finds to be properly submitted to outside Council rather than an investigator. And if you look at the copy you have in front of you, you'll see it's marked up to reflect the word change for outside counsel in lieu of investigator. You can see the effect of this substitution in the printout on the amended uh, Section D that you have circulated. The only change to the policy would be that one word change. All other provisions remain as they were. The effect of making this word change would be that the initial referral by the city attorney to an outsider initiates a review rather than an investigation. The latter word comes into play only if the outside counsel determines that the complaint has sufficient substance to warrant further action pursuant to D2B in the existing policy. This will have the effect of protecting innocent council members from reputational harm, while at the same time, and this should be emphasized, it does not afford any relief to any council member who is actually guilty of an ethics violation. In addition to the recommendation from the Budget and Effectiveness Committee, I would also like to propose tonight that this word change be effective from a date prior to the submission of the currently pending complaints, so that innocent council members who are the subject of those complaints get the benefit of protection from unfair reputational harm. The city attorney will complete his review of three complaints that have not yet been certified for referral before an outside counsel is appointed so that no council member who is the subject of a current complaint will be treated from any other, differently from any other. And it's worth noting we are all, at this point, the target of at least one complaint, given the one that we had uh, from KJ. The second recommendation I would like to make to council is that any ethics complaint filed after our vote today will be held to be processed in accordance with a new complaints policy that council will move expeditiously to adopt in the next month or so. This will ensure that our handling of future ethics complaints benefits from the lesson we have learned about the shortcomings of the, of the existing policy. So just to emphasize, the proposal would only change one word in our existing policy so that it more accurately characterizes a complaint referral by the city attorney. It, making the change retroactive removes any stigma that might unfairly attach to a council member against whom a complaint is lodged that is determined not to be actionable pursuant to D2A. And three, deferring action on new complaints will help end the current cycle of filings and help us ensure that going forward the public is accurately informed about the status of complaints and how they're being processed. So the intention of the committee is to complete the more comprehensive review of our ethics policy over the next month or six weeks. The suggestion for tonight is that this group now take an action to make that word change so that we don't have this word investigation showing up in the paper every time somebody decides to file an ethics complaint. I think it's a small step, but it could be a meaningful one. Now, one thing that's interesting to note, though, is since we are all 
the target of at least one of these complaints. Um, it's not going to be possible to take any action on this without having people who have been named in a complaint uh, participate in the vote. So we were hoping at one point that we could get a majority vote done by people who were not so that there wouldn't be any suggestion of, well, uh, you know, you did this to help yourself. But here we are, we're all in this position right now. So the question is, tonight, can we all get agree to go ahead and make this little change as an interim remedy for the situation that we have around ethics and, um, and then look forward to taking action in a more su substantive way in a few weeks? And at this point, I would like to ask the city attorney just to talk to us a little bit about what our situation is in terms of our participation in a vote on this issue tonight. So, uh, uh, thank you, Councilmember Driggs. Uh, there is no legal basis for any of you to be recused from voting. Um, so, um, and you understand the difference between recusal and excuse. Um, uh, and being excused is simply a matter of a vote by this council to excuse uh, a particular uh, individual. And, uh, and what's being recommended uh, is that there not be uh, any excused uh, voting and that the full body just vote on this particular uh, a matter that's in front of you. So uh, I think in practice what that means is if we can come together around the idea that this group is not going to excuse anybody from voting uh, and we get a majority vote on that, then when we proceed to the vote on the question of whether to make the word change and the effectiveness, then we will all participate in that vote. And I think what that does is it avoids a suggestion that some of us were more sensitive to the appearance, if you will, or allegations of an appearance of impropriety than others. We need to do this together. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity for us to come together as a team and demonstrate some unity in response to a very divisive and unfortunate situation in which we find ourselves with all these complaints. So uh, my suggestion is that uh, for one, that we agree that uh, we will all participate in the vote, and two, I would then like uh, like us to vote on the proposal that we make the word change. Is there a motion? So do you make a motion to, to, re to recommend the changes as noted on page six of the revised document under two A and B by section one? To complaints, investigations, and sanctions. Right. The, the motion is, is only to make the word changes that are marked in the document that you have in that our complaints policy. Right. And it consists entirely of avoiding the use of, of the word investigator early on uh, and instead referring to outside counsel. And then changes the date of effectiveness. And the date. I'm and sorry. the date, yes. And the date. Yeah. Um, so I think Mr. Driggs has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. All right, is there any discussion? I have Ms. Ajmira and Ms. Watlington. Is there anyone else that would like? Ms. Johnson? Yes. All right, Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, well, I had raised my hand for uh, the earlier topic, but I do have questions on this one as well. Uh, so during the budget committee meeting, when this topic had come up, um, I had, I had excused myself because of the perception since this is going to be retroactive. So, uh, Mr. Attorney, uh, I know you had addressed that at the committee meeting where <coughs> there could be a perception issue because this is going retroactive and those who have complaints against them uh, would have a perception issue. And that's why I was excused. Uh, so. I, I, I would like to be consistent with what, how, what I had stated in the committee meeting and now in front of full council. So in, in reality, the subcommittee, uh, keep in mind you don't excuse yourself. Um, the subcommittee uh, chose to excuse you. So right. it would be the full body here uh, that, would, um, that would participate in, in excusing any council member if it so chose to do that. Uh, but an individual council member can't, I mean, you can ask to be excused, but ultimately that's a, that's a decision for the full council to make. 
Okay, so so how many complaints are there so far? Everybody. Everyone has a complaint against them. Yeah, I mean, how many complaints are there total? There are 14 total complaints, separate complaints. But one is against essentially every council member for the last 15 years, including everybody in this room. So I understand that with this retroactive, with this going in effect retroactively, uh, there is no way we, we can actually excuse ourselves because all of us have complaints against us. Um, um, you know, I, this really is a difficult, um, it is really a difficult issue. I understand what Mr. Drakes is trying to do, and I, I, um, I appreciate what he's trying to do is not uh, have someone weaponize this to, uh, to file a complaint and have this investigation tag. Um, I, I agree with the uh, approach. However, I would like to be consistent uh, as I had stated, there would be a perception issue. And I know that uh, since there was a complaint filed and I had excused myself, I would like to be consistent. So I would like to be excused. And if I'm not excused, I'm not, I'm not comfortable voting on this. And just keep in mind that if you're not excused, any vote is going to be a yes vote unless you vote no. Got it. Thank you. All right. Ms. Watlington. Yeah, so um, this one in particular, it's unfortunate that we're here. Um, I absolutely agree that we need to restore some level of dignity to this council, and I think we do need to deal with this um, um, expediently. However, as I've shared with uh, my colleagues, I have some reservation about pulling this particular piece um, forward because I think that we could have kept this same energy to do the full work of the ethics policy um, just because it feels that we're prioritizing ourselves over the public in this. Um, I'm, from what I understand with discussions with the attorney, this doesn't change the procedure as it exists today, correct? No, I would, I would refer those complaints that need to get that initial review of whether they're frivolous or even state a claim for an ethics violation that would go to outside counsel and I would treat it as outside counsel consultation as opposed to an, an outside investigator which is the terminology that's used in the policy. So I understand the terminology is different but from a material impact to how you're going to respond So I've never participated in one of these I, I would think that it would be fairly consistent in that I'm having someone not not me, yeah. not anybody in my office um, uh, that would uh, th that I would hire. Uh, it says I shall um, uh, hi hire uh, someone, and that that individual would be making the call as to the base level whether these claims are frivolous, state a claim, should be proceed, you know, should go forward, or what have you. Or for those that that need back and forth, they would have that discussion you know, to get uh, further evidence for, uh, to, to make a determination, mm -hmm. depending on the complaint. Okay, um, and as I understand it right now, the motion on the, on the floor is to update this particular wording and make it retroactive? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, um, so as I said, I, I just think that we could spend our time doing due diligence to this ethics policy to restore some trust in the public. And I'm just uncomfortable with the approach that we've taken to single some things out. I, w I would prefer to defer the vote until we can do the full work, um, but I'm not sure that there's support for that. Um, so with that said, um, based on what I'm seeing so far, I do have reservations. Thank you. What did she say? Ms. Johnson. Um, I want to piggyback off my colleagues. Um, how many complaints? You said there are 14 complaints filed. 14 separate complaints, yes. 14 separate complaints. And how many are deemed um, not frivolous or um, 
complete enough to move to the next level. I'm sorry, say, because <laughs> it's careful, the, the, the language here, uh, I haven't made any determination as to whether any of them are frivolous, not frivolous, what have you. Um, the review uh, that I believe that the policy, in my opinion, clearly states, uh, requires me to do a technical reading of what's been submitted. Um, and, and I provided you all uh, with, with information that, that seems like years ago, uh, I think it was uh, about four weeks ago, uh, based on the, the group of complaints that I had at that time, uh, that there were three that I felt met the technical floor, if you will, and I think floor is the, is the proper word, um, uh, to move on to uh, an outside reviewer. Uh, the policy says investigator, uh, and we're talking about changing that term to outside counsel to make that initial determination as to whether the complaint is frivolous um, or even states a claim uh, of an ethics violation. Uh, so so that's, that's where we are. Since that time, there have been another 10, 11 uh, complaints that have come in. Uh, the vast majority of which required me to ask for additional information, which is uh, under the policy. I, I don't have the ability to just say that complaint's not going to go forward. Um, I have to let the individuals know that they haven't met my specificity threshold and give them the opportunity to provide more specifics. That information, that back and forth has been occurring over the last couple of weeks, uh, and I got some information as late as today uh, in response to, uh, to, to those responses uh, or those, those questions that I put back out there. But there was one complaint that was actually filed on Friday uh, afternoon that I have actually have not had the chance to reach out to the, uh, uh, to the individual. So, so of the 14, only three have moved to the or met the technical requirements to move to the next level. Right whether, now, wh whether we call it investigation sure. or review, it's it's semantics. We've discussed that, right? Right. Because yes. The process is the same. Right now, there are three, uh, and I would expect to uh, to make calls on the other ten in the next day or two. Uh, certainly by the end of the week, and um, and maybe in a position to make a call on the one that was filed on Friday um, uh, by the end of the week as well. I'm not sure yet. And I'm trying to handle these all in a batch as opposed to one at a time here or there. Uh, quite frankly, the last time I cor corresponded with you all in a group, I thought I was done. Um, and as it turns out, I was just beginning to handle uh, complaints. Okay. Um, and then one of the things that Ms. Watlington said is um, just the, the um, the priority over this policy. I think we have to be careful in that appearance. Um, and one thing that we had a, a meeting a couple weeks ago where we were going to, it was a closed meeting, we were going to review the video and talk um, about the, oh, excuse me, some other, <laughs> but anyway, okay, okay. It's okay. Yeah, okay, well, anyway, I, I'm just not comfortable pulling out this policy either, especially when there was a, an incident um, that affected our public on June 3rd, and we still, that that hasn't been a, a priority to, to even discuss until September 15th. So I think as a council, um, I think- You mean June 2nd? June 3rd, June 2nd, June 2nd, the, the, um, the gas, the tear gas or whatever, the mm -hmm. chemical weapon, we haven't, we haven't changed that policy, it's gone to committee. Um, so I think that's a, a, a bigger priority for me than making a policy retroactive. I, I agree that we do need to address it, but I don't think it sends a, a message that I want to send to the public um, that, that we would do a retroactive policy, not even based on policy, based on semantics. Um, so, so for me, I won't be um, supporting the motion. So um, I have to say that this is probably one of the very toughest things that I've ever had to deal with. And I'm going to say that because two years ago I had to deal with it very directly. Um, when I was running for mayor the first time, I was accused of an ethics violation. The violation was very clear that I had used my position as a council member to allow 
for my children to benefit from work that the city had done. It was a very difficult time for me. Um, I didn't know whether, um, quite how to deal with any of it. Um, in the end, I felt um, that my integrity was questioned. I also felt like I had been bullied. And there were lots of things about this. But at the time, and the overall issue that came up, it was under this ethics policy. And it was whether or not council members are required to vote on issues that perhaps are very difficult, that they don't want to make a choice about, don't want to take a stand on. And as a result of our laws and rules, basically, I was told I had no choice but to vote. Because while I was being accused of doing something that would allow for my child to make or to benefit from my position on council, when that was shown not to be true or accurate, I had the responsibility to vote on those contracts. So this isn't just something that for me is kind of one of those, well, you know, whatever we do is fine, it'll be okay. Because it's not. It really reflects on how this council as a body appears to take seriously something even when not true, even when accused, it requires you to stand up and note something. So a couple of things I want to note. This is a two-step process. It is one where there's a decision that's made whether or not the complaint is frivolous or not, and then it takes it to another step. Nothing that Mr. Driggs has said changes that process. So you can say, well, I don't, I'm, you know, the word's different. Yes, but the word is also synonymous. It's not a word that's different. It still says that they have the accountability to review a complaint referred by the city attorney, to review that complaint and then make a decision whether or not there is an allegation that's true. The second thing that I want to say is that in, when you're looking at this language and the word may be changing, has the content, if you looked it up in the dictionary or in a synonymous way, what difference does it make as long as the work that is required of the person still state and is stated in the policy? The policy's intent is to have someone look at this and say, does it go forward? And then does, is there a reason for it to continue? Now, all of us know that in the times that we've been on council, and I, and I have to respect, sometimes I really feel like Ms. Watlington and Ms. Johnson haven't been here as long. But that city attorney has a, a client privilege relationship with each of us individually and as a group. And to think that he would have to make that kind of decision in regards to any one of us, I think, and boxes him in in such a very difficult way that it's almost like saying to, to him under this policy that he has no choice but to send everything forward no matter what he thinks about frivolous or how he defines it. I think it's actually more dangerous to not send it to outside counsel that doesn't work for us, that speaks to this public, that says this is someone that works for us that cannot judge each and every one of us. How many of us have walked into Pat Strick's office and had to say, I've got a concern, I'm not quite sure how to handle it, give me advice. And that's his job. That's what he's the city attorney for. And so when you're talking about the changes that we're making 
Is it better to have inside counsel instead of outside counsel take this kind of action, which is a two-step process, someone that hasn't had to sit, and I have to say, I have read all of the emails, all of the comments. For someone to have a clean look at it, it's almost like it's tainted already from the back and forth that we have done. And I would not, I ask you to put yourself in his shoes and say to yourself, would I want to be the one who has read all of these emails and, and they've not all been nice and to be, have to say, I'm going to investigate this and it comes back and I have to work with you and you have to assess my performance. You have to say what I have done well. Is that really an arm's length transa transaction? So I, I, I think that we have to be extremely careful. And I'm not saying change your mind. This is going to be a majority vote of whatever happens. But what makes this, I have heard the word say difficult, weaponize, defer until we can do the whole policy. And we're going to have to work with Patrick Baker to do that. And he's going to be the one that's going to evaluate and judge a complaint about one of us. So I, I, I really um, feel that somewhere in all of this, it's like what happened to me two years ago. I was in a debate with Kenny. And Kenny and I get along great. But he turned, someone asked him, well, how would you feel when something like this happened. And he said, I would feel bullied. And I turned to him and I said, that's exactly how I feel, Kenny. Now, I'm not speak speaking for Patrick Baker. I'm speaking for the person that's going to sit in his chair, the next person and the next person. And I think about how they would have to feel when they one-on-one -on -one have a client, a privileged attorney-client relationship with you, and you're going to say that they're going to investigate you. And I don't think that anybody would feel anything more or less than bullied by Patrick Baker. So I will not, I mean, I'm not going to have a vote on this, but I could not imagine being in any worse position than to not be arm's length and something this important, especially since the way it started and the way it has ended. It is muddled. There's no winning in this, but I certainly hope that we won't any further discourage or destroy the relationships that we have. So I don't know if there's anyone else, Mr. Driggs. Uh, I just wanted to mention to everybody, um, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for the newspaper coverage, front page stories, so-and-so is under investigation. And so what we're trying to do is just make sure that that uh, label is not tagged on any of us. We all are in the same situation here. None of us wants to be characterized as being under investigation unless and until this person on the outside looks at the thing and says, okay, this does warrant some further action. So it may be semantic, but the intention is to manage public perception and media coverage so that people don't have the opportunity to just walk in, file a complaint, and then generate a newspaper story that whoever was the target of that complaint is now under investigation. We will be looking in more fundamental terms at the ethics policy and I expect that what will come out of that is a recommendation for a completely different approach, which the city attorney and I have discussed, uh, that may involve counsel, for example, looking at these things rather than the outside person. But the goal here is just to take this, this particular crop of investigations uh, and put them in a status of being under review and then let the ones that are serious and that really warrant investigation proceed under the existing policy, paragraph D2. But meanwhile, anybody whose complaint was found to be frivolous will never have been, quote, under investigation. That's really all it's about. You can call it semantic. Uh, it, it's not a huge change in policy. 
and we will have a much meatier discussion about how our ethics should work, how we should deal with complaints in, a, in about a month or so when uh, the committee has had a chance to consider the other recommendations that we will make to council. Every one of us will be tagged as having an investigation. So it's just, that's where we are. All right, I have Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I, I also, I would like to respond to Councilmember Watlington's uh, statement about the public good. And, and I agree that we, we serve the public. That's what we do. That's our job. But the public are paying for these reviews, these investigations. And so that's, you know, I don't know what would, it costs Patrick, but, you know, when all of a sudden we've got all of these complaints, I still believe it's because someone figured out that if, if you can say somebody's been investigated, that's going to be a pretty strong accusation versus a complaint that was reviewed. And when procedurally it's done exactly the same, I would hope that our legal bills would fall more in line with a proper review of a complaint versus complaint after investigation after investigation. So I, I don't know if you have a comment on how much it costs every time you send one of these to an independent counsel. I don't. I've never done one before, um, and we'll, we'll find out. I, I am aware of, um, I think it was 2010, 2012, the last time a major investigation was done, um, uh, and I, I think it was in the, in the upper five figures, maybe even low six figures total. For one investigation? For, well, it was a big investigation. I want to be clear about that. It was a, as I recall, it was a sexual harassment investigation sex, involving was, multiple yes. individuals. So I think I saw Ms. Johnson and Ms. Mm -hmm. Watlington. Thank hand. you. I think the process, I think it, the public might be confused the way that it's been presented. None of us are under investigation as it stands, not even those three. The, 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 um, they, they have to go to investigation. That's how this is written. We explain. Please. No, nothing has, I have not, I, I don't, ha, don't have a secured investigator outside counsel as of yet. Um, as we, as this has been going on, I've been waiting to hear in terms of exactly what this council wants to do, uh, what it wants to call, but, but nothing has been sent out to anybody at that, uh, at this stage. Uh, what you got from me two or three weeks ago was a status report of where I was based on the complaints. And I think at that time I had four complaints of, of, of where I was at that time. But so, how is he going to choose? No. Okay. So the current process, even if we change the word under review, does not change. The process is the, the, the complaint is filed, Patrick reviews for validity, I guess, or, or thorough. Technical. Or technical, yes. technical, yeah. If it's technical. And then if it is technical, you don't have the, the, uh, the authority, I guess, is the word. And, and I don't know if you even have the desire to do that, you know, but you send it to a third party reviewer to investigate. Yes. So it doesn't say reviewer, it says send to a investigator. It says in, independent, yeah, the independent investigator. Investigator. Right. But that Correct. doesn't mean that it's under investigation. And if we had stepped out when the first three, when this was filed, and been very clear, none of, this, none of them are under investigation. I'm going to say this, <laughs> and I'm going to be really clear. Co council members are all under investigation because a complaint has been filed. And that, I, I, I would love to say that the media is nice to us. But here's the thing. If we change it to reviewer, that we're still in, under the same I, thing. I didn't say reviewer. I said outside counsel. I don't, I, I think we have to be very, not, none of them, no one is under, under. So, Mayor, could I, could I respond to that? That's not true. Uh, I think you're exactly right. No one is under investigation. The problem is that the way a defect an admitted defect by the author of this policy suggests that as soon as the technical determination has been made that the complaint was properly submitted, an investigation begins. What actually begins is an evaluation of the complaint to decide whether an investigation. So by making this word change, all we're doing is aligning the nomenclature with the actual process. 
is to avoid a situation where any council member who is the subject of any old complaint, as it now stands, will be described as having been referred to an investigator and being under investigation. That's all it is. Um, Mr. Newton. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. So I, I wasn't involved in the process here, but it's in front of us today. So I, I think we're all in a situation where we're compelled to, to make a decision here. Having said that, the, the way I read this, and I think you would probably uh, agree with this, right, Patrick? Uh, you would make a preliminary review determination then possibly send it to someone else who would also make their own preliminary review uh, before the possibility of any investigation. And in that, in that sense, right, certainly nobody today is under investigation. It's just the possibility of it, you know, being referred out to someone who would also do a review and subsequent investigation if they thought that that was necessary. I think what we're talking about here is eliminating some of that confusion in that process, because when you have that that term investigator, uh, I think it leads people to believe that instead of that person engaging in an initial review, they're already in, in engaging in an investigation, which isn't the case under this. And I, I look at it and I feel like, you know, we're really talking about a due process and fairness issue here, affording due process to the accused, making sure that the process, in as much as its perception is concerned, is perceived fairly for that individual. And right now, because this word investigator is in here, uh, even if, right, like this person gets this, they're still not involved in an investigation. It's still a preliminary review, but that word could lead many people to think that, you know, someone is under investigation. It is a damning accusation. It's not fair. It does not afford due process to the accused. And I do feel like, you know, seeing as how this is in front of us today, we have to make a decision on this. Um, I, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, now, at the same time, I would agree with the mayor in that, Patrick, I, I still question why you're involved on the front end at all, right? Because you could have perceptions of conflicts existing there. And so I would ask the committee after today's vote to please, you know, consider as you're looking at a more comprehensive uh, amendment or uh, review of, uh, of the overall ethics policy, consider the possibility of eliminating Patrick or putting some language in there, further separating him from the review, because I could see where that could lead uh, many people to think that there's maybe some sort, you know, something underhanded or nefarious happening as well. Uh, but, but yeah, those are my comments. I think what we're talking about here, plain and simple, due process, fairness, and eliminating the confusion that currently exists within the policy. Exactly. Okay. Excuse this, me. Yes, Ms. Watlington. Yeah, I'll be quick. I just want to make sure my position is not mischaracterized. Um, to be very clear, this is not about Patrick or bullying anybody for me. It's not about being afraid to take a vote. It's not about being on council for a particular time. I feel we're sending mixed messages. Some folks are saying we're changing the policy at the very next moment. Well, this doesn't actually change, or excuse me, the process. At the very next moment, it doesn't change the process. We're under investigation. We're not under investigation. I think ultimately, if the intent here is to um, provide due process or to keep people from being unfairly characterized in the media, honestly, I don't believe that what we're doing tonight is going to cause anybody in the media to go back and print a retraction. Um, <laughs> it's out there. It's done. Um, I'm not against updating the policy, but I am against prioritizing this above the rest of the work, which to me it sounds like from what I've heard several times from council here and before does not have a material impact to how it's done. I think that this, this vote is premature considering even some of the comments that M council member Newton just made. It sounds like there are, are substantial updates to the process that need to be made anyway. And I just think that we would be better served to take a look at this holistically. Um, and that's all. Yes. I, I told myself, sure that's that. me. Uh, Graham? Graham. I, 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 I thought I was going to sit down and sit this thing out, but I, I, but I won't. Um, because I'm under investigation, too. <laughs> no, you're not. No, 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 no. I'm talking about. That. No, perception, no. perception, <laughs> perception is reality, That's right? right. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. Perception is reality. And obviously I read the one against me, 
and others, and it's a reckless disregard for the truth. It's a reckless disregard for process. It's a reckless disregard for facts. And it's a reckless disregard for my reputation. Period. So if I have done something or my colleagues have done something, then we should be under, under review, on inquiry. But, th but this is, and I said it in my email weeks ago, a whole lot of BS. And we have a fiduciary responsibility to be as transparent as possible. We have a, a fiduciary responsibility to the public to be um, public servants and under this scrutiny, right? Because this is what we all signed up for, right? Public officials. But we didn't sign up to be dis disparaged by frivolous, talk about mine, Complaints where there's no facts, no merits, no process, just whatever. And so I think what we're doing today is a small adjustment. Nothing changes, but we're just changing the perception that Newton was right. Fairness, perception, and process. And if we have to go back and fix this thing that we have to do, we know we have to fix it, um, but the entire city council of Charlotte perception is under investigation. That ain't right, because I've read a couple of those. And, you know, if you don't like how somebody votes, then you go to the board of election. If you don't like that James Mitchell wears a three-piece suit with a, 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 a two-side five pin, you go to the Board of Election. You don't file a complaint. And so this kind of fix what was unintentional consequences based on the former mayor three cycles ago, four, I mean mayor's five, <laughs> this kind of kind of kind of fixes that a little doesn't change the inquiry that has to happen but it it, it gives people around this table um, some due process I'd like to make a substitute motion uh, to defer any changes until uh, the budget committee is able to make a comprehensive um, ethics uh, uh, recommendation uh, to full council. The second. Do that. I had Ms. Johnson recognized, so Ms. Johnson. Oh, I'll, I'll defer my question. That's okay. All right. Mr. Um, Winston has made a substitute motion to defer changes to the policy um, until after the budget, any change to the policy until after the budget and effective government has revised the policy. So in the interim, can I ask a question? Is your intent to have these um, complaints that have been filed to be handled in any specific way? Well, um, I, I think that was, I couldn't quite hear, but it was that question to me, Mayor Mayor Yes, yes, it was asking. I was asking you as the motion of the maker, the mo motion maker, Yes, ma'am. Um, the rules, while they might be imperfect, uh, uh, they the, the, that fault um, lies on city council for, for not prioritizing that in the first place. We've had mm -hmm. um, um, at, at all the opportunities from the day that that policy was put in place um, to make those changes. Um, it, it is unfair to move the goalposts, um, even how wrong um, th th this policy might be. Um, so we should uh, uh, focus on, on doing the work of, of making the full change um, and not put a Band-Aid on it. Um, I think this is possible. It doesn't have to take a long time. Um, if we commit to a work plan, I don't see why this can't be done in, in, a, in a matter of, of weeks. Um, but, you know, the rules are the rules, um, you know, and, and, you know, we sh they, they should go forward. I mean... Um, it's not going to, changing, as you said, changing the verbiage 
is not going to change the process. Um, so, Mr. Baker, regardless of, of how, if that original motion got voted on up or down, uh, he would still have to pass that along um, for an outside, um, outside counsel uh, to make a decision. So, um, we know we have a problem. Um, this um, uh, original motion doesn't solve the problem. The only um, solving of the problem would be a comprehensive um, uh, look, deep dive, um, and change into our ethics policy. So. Mr. Winston, I just want to make sure that I did not say that changing the verbiage would change, would not make a change. I was saying the criteria would remain the same. The title of the person instead of an investigator outside counsel would change. The criteria would remain the same. So I was not the Criteria to... would remain the same, but I, I, I don't think... Um, well, know. I just wanted you to know what I said. I'm not arguing uh, the point. I think you've got a motion. And I don't know, is there a second? Yes, I second it. And Ms. Watlington has seconded it. So any, is there any debate on the substitute motion? Mr. Newton? Yeah, so I, I, I just feel like, so the, the, uh, what we're talking about here is just changing a word, right? Uh, to eliminate confusion that we all know exists. Uh, I, I get it, uh, there is the need for more comprehensive reform within the ethics policy, but I, I feel like we're gonna be back here with this anyway at some point in time in the future. Uh, it's in front of us now. We know that th that voting in the affirmative on this, it's not going to eliminate any existing complaints against anybody. If someone is engaged in any wrongdoing, uh, they will still be subject to an investigation. It's not going to prevent any future complaints, as far as, as, far as I know, right? So correct me if I'm wrong on that. So I, I just feel like we're gonna be back here. We're going to, uh, to, to do this. Uh, anyway, uh, in the affirmative, I feel like it, it is the right thing to do from the standpoint of due process fairness, like uh, Council Member Graham was mentioning, and so uh, I, I, I feel like I'm compelled to move forward on this. So we have a substitute motion and a second. All in favor of the substitute? Roll call. Roll call. I'm sorry. It roll will call. be a roll call. I know. I know. So I'm going to say all in favor of the substitute motion. The substitute motion is to leave it as is, follow through on the complaints, and redo the policy. So we'll start with Mr. Newton. Uh, no. Ms. Azmira. Oh. Can you come back? I'm, I'm, I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah, I know. We have to do a roll call, so. Well, I'll come back. Can you come back to me after you're done with everyone else? Okay. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? No. Mr. Driggs? No. Mr. Graham? No. Mr. Eggleston? No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Mr. Bakari? No. The substitute motion fails, and we go back Ms. to. Ms. Oh, I'm Ajmira. sorry, Ms. Ajmira. Yes. <laughs> To Mr. Winston's motion. What? Okay. Her vote was yes. To the substitute motion. To the substitute motion. motion. So yes. back to the original motion. To back to the original motion. All right. The original motion is as the Budget and Effective Committee Chair. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Winston. I didn't ask you, but <laughs> what was your vote on your substitute motion? Yes. All right, so we'll start with you. What is your vote on the main motion? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Well, for the record, I would like to be excused. Since I cannot be excused, I'm going to vote no for the perception issue. Ms. Watlington? Ah, <sighs> uh, no. I didn't hear those. She said no. No. All right, Ms. Johnson? And this is retroactively, right? The maker of the, uh, yes, it, no. All right. Yes. 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 The motion passes. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for that. It's difficult times. Madam Mayor, I have a, um, a I'm sorry, one. yes? Before we leave. Uh, We're not this. leaving. We have a lot more work to do. We're no, not I mean, this, this, uh, budget co this committee's uh, report, what? I have one comment about the rest I'm of I'm sorry, what did you say, Mr. Winston? I was just saying before we left this committee's topic, I had a, had a question or comment. 
Oh. All right, so um, we have Mr. Driggs. Is there anything further on the um, committee? Ms. B Mr. Winston has a question. Yes, um, as it regards to the audit, um, I'm sensitive uh, to uh, Mr. Driggs' comment. Um, as we just explored, um, semantics uh, do mean a lot um, when, when we're making policy. Um, as this is relates to the audit of CMPD's budget. Um, I, I think it is quite clear what the community and, and many council members uh, do want. Um, I don't know if the audit is the right term, it might be an accounting. Um, I have asked Mr. Baker to provide a language um, uh, that accurately um, expresses what the desire is. Um, and I think he will be getting that to me um, soon. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a twofold um, a desire to know. Um, as, as with the policy that we uh, passed on June 8th, it is uh, council's uh, um, um, duty uh, uh, to uh, uh, scrutinize and adjust budgetary policy of CMPD. Um, if we don't know um, what the budget, uh, what is being budgeted and what um, is being spent on, we uh, uh, don't have the information uh, to do our job. And it is not in that book. Um, uh, that Mr. Um, um, Driggs uh, uh, displayed earlier um, is, is very simple. Uh, there are two things that we want to know. One, we want to know uh, what assets CMPD has, um, how much those assets cost, and where that funding, those funding sources originated from. So additionally, uh, 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 there is a cost to each municipal service that we provide whenever there is a call to service. Council does not know um, what those services cost. So how much does a murder investigation cost? How much does it cost when uh, a, a police officer shows up to a minor accident um, and writes a report? Um, how much does it cost um, um, when, uh, you know, uh, we're showing up to mental health um, uh, um, crises. We don't know. We don't know that number, and so we want an accounting of of how much it costs to provide those services. Um, so I agree, but like I said, I agree uh, that we need to get uh, that verbiage right um, because, in fact, we do do internal audits. So maybe there's a different um, uh, term that we need to to, to use. Um, that's why I've asked Mr. Baker to help us um, help me um, uh, figure out what that language is, so that can be clearly communicated. Um, and as a, as a function of the budget, um, and, and we deal with the budget um, quite constantly um, in, in business meetings. So as soon as we have that, I think we'll have a, a better ability um, to consider our options um, moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. All right, the next item on um, report from the committee is intergovernmental relations. Mr. Bakari, Mr. Winston. What is that? Oh, it's just it's in the thing. You okay. Can read it. Um, the next item is um, safe communities. I know. Um, I did want to say again, just as a as a reminder, that each committee has been asked to contribute to the um, work that's being done for safe communities, and that we would ask that those all be ready and prepared for the staff to be able to compile them for October the 5th, because that's when we'll have our first draft that would be a complete picture of the plan, and that that plan would then be what we would talk about on that day and then move forward with the community discussion and comments. So with that, I know that many of us have gotten lots of comments about, well, when do I get to do this? We have the community discussion group, but we will have a safe communities draft that we can have public hearings, forums, however we want to design that to be after October the 5th. So with that, Mr. Um, Eggleston, do you have anything that you would like to? Um, I think most people attend your right. meetings. I was going to say, the, the members <laughs> of my committee are all of you now. So uh, if you don't know what's going on, that's surprising. Um, it's all in there. The next meeting's a week from today, and since it's 11 and we have a closed session after this. All right. Um, the next. I do have a quick question, yes. uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, so uh, I have. Uh, I was recently contacted uh, by a constituent, and I, I think that this is something that uh, that has been. Uh, there have been questions asked about this in the community at large, uh, but. Uh, 
we as a council on June the 3rd uh, had made a decision to engage in two community meetings regarding the June 2nd incident. Uh, we were able to engage in the first one. The second one, uh, there was inclement weather and it had to be rescheduled. And I was just wondering, I want to ask, uh, is there uh, a rescheduled date for that or any update uh, moving forward on, on that second community meeting that can be provided? So I, I have received a number of letters from, in emails, I should say letters, a number of emails. And what I would like to suggest is that since we've already gotten a review from the police chief, the police chief has announced that, you know, it was um, the things that we didn't do that um, should have been done. He's announced the suspension that um, we would um, actually respond to folks with those policy changes, but that we would um, be able to do that as a result of having the draft community safety plan, which would be sometime in October. So unless the council would like to do something differently, that would be my proposal to that that public comment, um, because many of those policies are in the safety plan, um, particularly the ones on chemical agents, our RCA, our, what do they call it? RCA something, riot action, something. Riot control. riot control agents is one that is of particular interest to a number of people that those would be coming through the community, Safe Communities Committee and would be included in that document. I just asked, um, I'm drafting a memo that says we've done this and then the date will be this, that we're going to get a draft and there will be opportunities, multiple opportunities to comment on it. Yeah, for the community to, to, to weigh Anybody in. Anybody disagree or want to do it differently? Yes. All yes. right, Mr. Winston, what would you like to do? Well, I, I think uh, the because uh, I did show up that that second day we were supposed to be out there and there were um, people that wanted to speak to us. Um, I, I think uh, this community conversation uh, that we had the first day and, and it was intended to have the second day um, is different than the work that we are doing um, in committee. In fact, um, uh, the work that is doing happening in state communities committee, uh, the public does not have a, a, a real chance to address us. Um, um, out, outside of a few uh, folks that have been honestly personally selected um, by each council member. Um, so um, especially given in, in, in these COVID times, um, the, the, the community has not been able to um, come and face us, which is a very important part of any democracy and any democratic process uh, that, that we should um, um, give our, our, our constituents uh, the, the proper respect and, and hold up our end of the bargain to find a safe um, way uh, for, 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 to give them an audience so they can speak their minds um, um, freely uh, uh, to, to, to these very sensitive um, Mayor. I agree with that. I, I don't know where that's in conflict. It's just a matter of when to do it. And I was saying after October the 5th, when we have the documents that we are going to be responding to the question, many of the questions that they asked that day. I was going to say, I think the mayor's point earlier was the point of bringing forward the recommendations from the committee in kind of a bundle, if you will, is that they can be put out to the public for the public to review and the public to comment on before council would take a full vote on them. So no policy could or would be changed until the public had had a chance to view it, review it, and comment on it. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. When we make those proposals, there will already be, you know, ability for the public to weigh in on that specific thing. Um, but it, leading up to the formation of these policy decisions, that is why we were having uh, that initial audience. And we have taken that away when we have said that we were going to put that out there. And now we're saying that we're not going to give that to them. We're going to do the work and then let you consolidate that into time that you would already have to have public comment. So I think that's, again, limiting uh, a, a democracy. And I don't think that's what we should be doing. Okay. So um, Mr. Winston objects, any other objections? I would like to have the staff put a communications plan together, whether it be workshops around the city, whether or not they be the, on the front lawn of our porch, of our building, whatever, but just give us some ideas, the best way to reach out to the public um, the various interest groups as a part of um, our draft plan. Madam, Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. 
I, and I concur with that. And you know, I when we first gave the manager recommendations, those that was one of my recommendations to the manager to have more um, public input sessions to get comments and, and reviews from the public. I would hope that we would do a better job than we did the first night we did it. I hope so. Because the first night we did it, um, we didn't accomplish much. Um, and, that, and that's being very polite. Uh, and so I just hope that the structure in the way where there is some give and take, some back and forth, but it's done in a way where we can really come together and, and, and build a plan together with the public versus it just being a, a, a screaming session. Um, I understand people are frustrated. I'm frustrated too, um, but there has to be mutual understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. So I hope it's structured in a way, um, Mr. Manager, that allows that to happen. Ms. Johnson? I would just ask that we keep in mind um, the COVID and if we could, if those could be virtual, I mean, that's what I would, prefer because still I think we still need to model the behavior um, for social distancing okay thank you all right um, um, workforce and business development mr. Mitchell mayor council I'm gonna follow the lead of council member Lark so I'm gonna I'm gonna work on brevity you see our, our workforce development initiatives on page six we will be meeting September 14th and 28th of this month and the only thing I will share is the good news. I hope you all uh, saw Laura Smith email. Application has closed on the small access to small business. 4,600 businesses submitted application requesting for a total of $59,760. Foundation will continue to process the grant through the middle of October, making awards every two weeks. So kudos to everyone and to access the capital. Uh, I hope you all saw the New York Times article. They feature one of our recipients in there, and Brookings Institute did a great story on the model we created. So hats off to the city council and the staff. Mr. Mitchell, can I ask you, um, in the report that you have, you have the three bullets on the training program, the rollover for the partner support, and the workforce innovation and the question of whether or not errors have been corrected. Can we get those in detail yes. that would ex outline them as this is how the public will see them and this is what you have to go through. Yes, so we'll have the project, the program detail. When do you think you're going to have that? Uh, uh, can you give us the next week? I don't yeah, want Tracy to scream I'm, at me. So yeah, uh, can you I mean, give me the next? Course. Okay. I just, and then I don't know what the decision has been on the hotel and the restaurant fund. I, I thought it was, is it exactly like the access to capital? Yes. Except so, for the hotels, it's a different yeah, calculation? And, yes, but let me reassure everybody, the application has closed of August 30th. From rest, for restaurants yes. as well? What about the hotels? I, I see Tracy right. saying no. Yeah. Not I, on hotels. That's for access to capital. Access to capital has closed on August 30th. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But not the I'm talking million. about the, the eight, million eight million, the five the million for the restaurants and three for the hotels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, so we need to see that. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, can I have Mr. Baker? Will you please read our closed session? Absolutely. Um, need, uh, we have two closed sessions for you. Need a motion, one motion, uh, to discuss matters relating to the location and expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the city, including agreements on tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by the city in negotiations pursuant to NCGS 143.318.11A4, and to establish uh, or instruct the city staff concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the city in negotiating the price or other material terms of a contract uh, for the acquisition of real property pursuant to NCGS 143.318.11A5. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. We'll now go and roll call. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Do I need a roll call you do, for that? For yes. everything. Mr. Newton? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Mr. Graham. Mr. Eggles. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's unanimously approved. All right. So um, we'll close the doors and.